Before we start the episode, quick announcement. We have some new Free Thinker merch that's available for sale. As you guys know, we don't have any sponsors. We don't do any advertising. We don't have any propagandists telling us what to say. And we don't have any investors. We're completely self-funded. So if you want to support this, you want to see more conversations like this moving forward. Also, we have a new style available right now. Click the link below. Definitely go pick up some. Actually, don't be a brokey. Pick up two or three or four or five or six. Appreciate you guys. Let's start the episode. Let's go. Good morning. Welcome back to the pod. Matt Kim here from a special crazy episode from the middle of Bucharest, Romania, from an undisclosed location with... Guys, you guys know who it is, but we got to mention it now. We have the man... Get off your ass and do something difficult. What color is your Bugatti, Mr. <laughs> Andrew Tate? Good to see you, sir. Hey, awesome. Thank you for having me. This place is amazing. I'm so glad. And I'm going to try to convince you before we start, if we can use the headphones. Why do we need headphones? I can hear you perfectly fine. <laughs> <laughs> I like the idea. People think that you use headphones for hearing each other. Yeah. I like... Th- headphones because for the sensory deprivation that it creates exactly that's exactly what my enemies want <laughs> you know i've actually had a beef with headphones people don't realize that i, I it's kind of funny on the internet they say old tate had an, a beef with everything and they're right i guess i did but i always had a beef with headphones and i know we're in a pretty secure setting mm. but i've made many videos saying that headphones are probably the most stupid thing a man can wear i see people wearing headphones in public yes and they're just asking to die. Yeah. I don't know what you're doing. You can't hear a car. Mm-hmm. You can't hear me. I'm six foot three, a hundred kilo. I can sneak up on you without <laughs> trying and break your neck. So I don't, I don't know. I'm, I'm kind of anti headphone. Maybe it's just because it's a principled thing. I know that I'm pretty safe here, but I'd have to recheck in with the security team. And <laughs> I'm on bail. So I can't carry the strap. And I just feel safer if I can hear the knock at the door, you know? So that's why we intentionally created the most secure location we could possibly find. Um, I like the headphones because really it helps you focus into the conversation. It blocks out the entire world. So I know that you're trying to be aware of the world around you, but the point is to block out the world so that we focus in on the conversation. Nothing else matters. And I think, I think when I record with headphones, you kind of almost forget that the world around you exists and it creates kind of this weird space. I, I believe you. But I don't know. Unmatched perspicacity. <laughs> I'll think about it. Maybe 10 or 20 minutes in, I might put them on for a little while and test it out. But I think I'll be nervous. And it's kind of crazy because I say these things and people think I'm nuts. But my life's pretty extreme now. Yeah. I mean, at the cr- at the back of my mind, there's always who's going to knock on the door. Mm. Is it going to be the police or is it going to be the other guys? That's always on. That's always on my mind all of the time. So it's kind of difficult to fully relax. Uh, so the headphones I'm not sure about I'll think about it I'll do my very best for you because you're a very nice man and you've flown all the way here (laughs) give me a little bit of time to build up the courage and I'll see if I can put the headphones on if you guys are watching maybe leave a comment should Andrew wear the headphones or not I think that'd be an interesting way to start out the conversation bro but I see people in public (laughs) with headphones on and I'm you are so killable for the sake of listening to a song you've heard 300 times I don't understand how people go through life without ever considering that there might be somebody who wants to remove them from earth. It's insane. I had a conversation the other day with a girl. She was talking about swimming with sharks or something. And I said, and she said how fun it would be. And I said, why would swimming with sharks be fun? And she said, Oh, but the adrenaline and you know, it's exciting. I get adrenaline walking to my car. I have enemies who want to get me. Like I, by the time I leave the establishment and my head's on a swivel and I try and see if anyone's going to kill me or not, or any of the police are going to arrest me because the police car over there. And I finally get into the car, the doors closed that I can relax. I have enough adrenaline in my life. I do not need sharks. No. And I kind of want to hear them coming. Cause I think that's my only chance to survive. Do you feel like maybe then you're living kind of paranoid? You're paranoid every day until you're right. Huh? I was called paranoid every day until I was arrested. It's true. I kept saying you have three lives. First, they cancel you. Second, they throw you in jail on some garbage. Third, they kill you. And everyone's like, oh, yeah, you're not going to jail. Jail for what? Well, here we go. Yeah, I went to jail. And then people are stupid enough to say, well, just get a lawyer. As if the law is real. (laughs) As if a lawyer can help. None of it's real. It's all made up. Every single system we live under is corrupted to the core. And if you speak too loud and you get too big, they're going to punish you. Isn't it crazy how well that I got three lives aged? 
Bro. <laughs> you know? I've never been wrong about like, It anything. aged well. It aged really well. My whole brand <laughs> is built on fantastic predictions. Like anyone who's been following me for the last five or six years, some people are new to it, but I was calling pancake swap at 10 cents and I was calling <laughs> like, th there's so many examples. There was actually somebody who did a fantastic edit. I'll have to find it and put it on X where it was about like 25 of my perfect predictions. And I knew, I knew I was going to go to jail because I was sitting with Tristan in Dubai and we're sitting in this mansion that costs a quarter of a million dollars a month to rent. And we, we just bought our own mansion, which we're renovating. And we're sitting there and there's all these girls in the pool and there's a Bugatti on the drive and everything's perfect. And Tristan goes, we made it out. Like, life's good. He just said, look around you. This is great. We're smoking shisha. And I said, no, we're fucked. Because mm. the universe doesn't work that way. You don't get a Bugatti on your drive, 20 women in your pool, a huge mansion, children who love you, money coming. You don't, Something's going to go wrong. And Tristan said, well, what can go wrong? And I said, well, either we're going to die or we're going to go to jail. And I was right. I'm not, I, I, you, you don't want to be right. <laughs> I don't want to be right. But I guess it's better to be paranoid and prepared and incorrect. Mm. I think I'd rather the few times in my life when they finally write my biography, they say Andrew was only wrong a few times in his life when he had over prepared <laughs> and life went better than he expected. That's fine. I'll take those losses. I will not take a loss the other way, sir, where I'm underprepared. Before I go too far, I got to read my legal disclaimer. Yeah, that, that might keep us out of jail. Th go. This got to keep us out of jail. I have my own. I know you have your own. I got to do mine. Cool. Let, let, me, let me just. I'm Matt Kim. I'm here on my free will. I have not been coerced and can leave at any time. Absolutely no exchange of money or profit has been discussed nor agreed to. The Matrix was a movie, actually a trilogy. Joe Biden received 81 million legitimate votes. An entire year with zero flu deaths is normal. And the mainstream news is honest and fair. I like that. That's very good because people often ask me, I don't know if you've seen this. There was a picture when I was first arrested of my mm. case files and there was all these pages and pages of evidence. And everyone's saying, look, he's guilty. Look at all these case files. My case <laughs> files are just translated podcasts. Yeah. So every <laughs> word I say is used against me in a court of law. So I want to say to the camera, I don't have an official disclaimer as professional yeah. as you, but I'll say to the camera that I'm a liar. Everything I say isn't true. This is for entertainment purposes only. I'm completely lying. <laughs> I'm a liar. It's I'm a comedian. Don't comedian. listen. Don't listen to anything I say. Just as you quite rightly pointed out, 81 million legit votes. Legit votes. Today is a discussion of ideas. Sometimes men speak in absolutes or hyperbole or use sarcasm to move along a conversation yep. or get a point across. Yep. Every single idea does not require a discussion of the random exceptions. Uh, bro, that's the perfect one because the random exceptions is how most of these people are living their lives. It's crazy, isn't it? The, the random exceptions is how they manage to justify their insanity and inanity. <laughs> it's, it's endless. You'll talk for two hours, and I do this all the time. We talk for two hours or do a podcast or put up clips, and they'll find like five or ten seconds and be like, look at what you said. Which is crazy, because if you're going to go through life thinking that exceptions disprove the rule, mm. well, then you're a dummy. And I don't know how these people have managed to survive for so long. It kind of shows how soft societies become where these mm. people survive. Because in days of old, the idea was that the lion will eat you if you go near the lion. Now you may go near a lion and he's in a he's tired and he's just eaten and he's nice to you. There's exceptions that disprove the rule. But in general, if you want to survive, you have to take the rules and adapt them. Which is why I say it's something I said which is really controversial and it sent the world on crazy, but I'll say it again, I don't care. I say I don't let women drive me in cars. I don't. <laughs> I don't. That's my personal choice. It's my personal preference. A man will drive me, I will drive, or I will mm. walk. And they'll say, Oh, but some women can drive, I'm sure. Yep. But in my experience, if I want to live, no, women don't drive me in cars. I mean, and I don't think that's that crazy to say because if I'm with my wife and it's raining, she'll be like, you need you to drive. drive. 100%. What, what's wrong with that? 100%. It's exactly the same with me. Any woman I'm with, she's like, oh, please, you drive. I like, okay, I will. Keeps us all alive. You can play the D, you can be DJ, you can play the songs, everything's <laughs> fine. But you can't say this online because there's going to be some idiot mm. who's going to sit there and try and pull up statistics or some garbage or find a girl who was a race car driver in 1981 and say, look, as if that disproves the rule. And you have to live your life by rules because if you don't do that, you're going to get eaten by a tiger one day. Well, they'll throw up the statistic that um, men crash more than women. I'm like, well, because in dangerous situations, men drive more. Of course. They're actually taking the risk. 100%. So, well, we're, well, we can actually 
because all my gendered arguments get me in trouble. <laughs> Another a, disclaimer. <laughs> as, a, as a professional, I was lying. I'm a comedian. As a professional, I'm going to extrapolate it out towards something else. But I think that I don't trust anybody who doesn't have emotional stability in mm. general. I think we could argue in general, men are more emotionally stable than women. Mm. So if you're going to put somebody in a stressful situation, whether it's a, a aquaplaning a car, turbulence on a plane, a physical violence, whatever it is, you're going to want somebody who has emotional stability and emotional control. You're not going to want somebody who panics easily. And I mean, maybe I know particularly feminine women, but the women I know will panic if I say, think fast and throw a starburst at them, let alone an actual, an actual event, which can be life or death. So yeah, emotional stability is extremely important in dangerous situations. Before we get going, I forgot. I wanted to give this to you before. So typically... If you guys don't know, and if you guys travel internationally, typically when you go meet someone, it's custom, I think pretty much all over the world, to bring a gift. Yeah. So I got you something, because I know you like cigars, yeah. and I know you have your um, emergency meetings yeah. that you do, and I don't. And I know you're an Elon fan. Yeah. I don't think you have one of these. I don't think. Let's see. What is it? A starship. I don't have a starship. No, that's true. It's made by SpaceX. Like Christmas. <laughs> what is it? It's a, it's lighter? a lighter. No way. Yeah, dude. Bro, that's <laughs> epic. That's epic. I How think do you, I even do I it? I think you turn the top off. Oh, no, the, twist the top? Yeah, twist the top off. And I, I can't fly with fuel in it, but yeah. And does it like a big flame? I, I don't know. I haven't put fuel in it yet. I'm going to fuel it up, bro. Yeah. I've got my own spaceship. <laughs> the haters are going to be really mad now. That's epic. That's yeah. genuinely an amazing present. Thank you very much. <laughs> oh, of course. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> I thought cool. that'd be a fun one. I thought that's something that you guys could use on your set well, and uh, something that'd be pretty cool. Yeah. I mean, I, people often say you have all these cars, you have these boats and jets, but you have not been to space. You don't have the spaceship, but now you got changed a spaceship. It. Thank you. <laughs> Where, so before we start, I have a question for you. Yeah. Where did you come from, bro? You just blew up out of nowhere. I know. That's crazy, huh? Yeah. It was like, one day it was bang. He talks sense. I was like, who, <laughs> who is he? I, like, I don't know. He's just saying things that make sense. I, at last year, I had, my daughter is a year and a half old. Mm -hmm. So I'll, I'll tell my story from the beginning. 2021 is when I first found you. Yeah. It was the Your Mama's House podcast. Yeah, yeah. And if you guys have never seen it, I think that's the best one you've ever done. Yeah, it was pretty good. Because it was a combination of your ideas with humor and your takes on some women. You can tell that a lot of it was for fun. Yep. You understood it. Yeah, it yeah. wasn't as polarizing then. This is before you kind of took over the whole internet. Please tell the Romanian judge that. It would help. <laughs> because yeah. it's, it's translated in the case file. <laughs> yeah. If you take it word for word and you translate it and you take out the nuance, you're like, all right, this guy hates hate with women. Yeah. You could see it. Yeah. But if you hear it, and even Christine, she was laughing her ass off. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And the funniest part was, well, Cobra Tate, if I'm a dumb bitch, yeah, yeah, <laughs> she says this. Amazing. And that was that was a great episode, I thought. Yeah. That's the first time I ever saw you on the internet. Yeah. And that was maybe August or October of 21. Mm -hmm. Something like that. And I was like, this guy's super interesting. Um, and then you started getting to your takes of get off your ass and do something. Depression isn't real. Yep. You know, um, you know, like be something. The only people that are scared of ghosts are the people that believe in ghosts. 100%. I love that one. Yeah. And I remember it was 2021 and I was home during COVID and my wife was like, we should stay home. And there, there's a whole story of why we had to stay home. Yeah. Uh, but for her, for her health reasons, we had to just, we couldn't risk it. Yeah. But I remember sitting home and I was feeling lax and I don't want to say I was depressed, but I was feeling unmotivated. Mm -hmm. And I ran into you at just the most perfect time in my life. And I was like, I'm going to do something. So I started working on different businesses and then, and I was at home, I think it was a year, a little bit over a year ago, I was at home and I'm yelling at the TV, like most old men do now. Yeah. Yell at TV and you're like, that's bullshit. I don't believe that, yeah. whatever. And my wife, she's like, go, she came downstairs. She's like, seriously, go tell someone that cares because you're going to wake up your kid. Yeah. And I was like, do you know what? I will. And I came in the office. I'm like, I'm going to start a podcast. And like, what are you talking about? Dude. I feel like I'm going to do it. I've been watching Andrew Tate. I feel like I'm going to do this. Dude, nice, <laughs> nice, nice. And I just turned it on one day and I went to my computer, how to start a podcast. Like that's how I started. I'd never been on a podcast before. Yep. I'd never been in a studio before. I had no idea how to do any of this. And I'm just like, I'm just going to figure it out. Yep. Start day one, figure it out. 
And as you kind of experiment and you learn and you fail and you do things, you'll just improve. And I thought, if I start, and maybe in five years, 10,000 people listen to me, yep. that'd be a huge success. That's a lot of damn people. Yeah, it is. And somehow, I think in the last eight months, it went from like, no one's ever heard of me to, I don't know, maybe half a million to a million people per day see oh, my face. It's incredible. It's incredible. And it's, and it's because I ran into you at just the most opportune time. Well, that makes, that, that humbles me a little bit. Thank you, sir. But uh, there was also a video you made, a particular video or something that, that was like a, that blew up. Was mm. there one, was there one video or was it gradual? I remember yeah. seeing just one video one day and then I saw you every day, every day. <laughs> I made my first video. Okay. So Tucker Carlson got kicked off of Fox yeah. in May. Yeah. And I love Tucker. Yeah. I love everything that he does. And I love his approach of kind of informing people. It's like facts with uh, a little bit of mixture of his opinion. Yeah. And he presents facts in a way to get his side of the story. I love that he's able to... Smart. It's smart, right? Because people are like, oh, he's fair. But no, like he's telling his story. I love that. Yeah. Um, and I remember he got kicked off. And then in, I think it was June 18th, Father's Day, I ran into this story of these... Um, it was a, in Seattle, a guy went up to a family in a Tesla and shot him cold dead. And the wife- And you want me to wear headphones? <laughs> Bro, this is exactly what I'm talking about. I guarantee that guy in that Tesla was listening to music, sitting there. Bro, sorry to interrupt you. I don't want to interrupt your story, but that, that's a perfect example. Yes, a couple days ago, I was in my car and we were sitting in traffic. I had a security team behind me and I'm sitting in the car. I've got a security car in front of me. And I'm looking at all the mirrors and the chick goes to me, what are you looking for? I'm like, them. What do you mean? What am I looking for? Them. Like this dude was sitting in his Tesla, listening to Katy Perry, sitting there, do, 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 bang. Bang. That's how it goes, bro. Just like that. But the wife that was in the car with him, she was pregnant. Seven months pregnant. So sad, bro. And I made, and it was Father's Day. So I just started thinking about it. I was like, damn. And I made this video talking. First time I ever did one of these talking head mm -hmm. videos. And I said, on Father's Day, this one just hits hard, yeah. right? Because you have daughters, like it's it's a tough one, and uh, and I ended the the story with how many people died that day because she was seven months pregnant, yeah, and that really messed people up because all the people that are like abortion isn't real or they're not babies, yeah. but she was seven months pregnant. They're like my comment section went crazy, yeah, 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 because they couldn't. People who think that it's okay to abort kids, they're like, damn, but. This is a very difficult situation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that, my first time ever putting a video together like that, it did like three or four million views in like two days. Wow. And ever since then, that video, and then I did one about the submarine with billionaires in a submarine. Oh, bro, yeah. I was like, I don't care about these billionaires submarine and then this idiots going in the middle with PlayStation controllers. Well, and that I, one blew up. I mean, there's, there's, there's interesting points because we just talked about how exceptions don't disprove the rule. Yeah. And that's also uh, abortion's a subject where that happens all the time. Yeah. Where you say, I think abortion is wrong. What if she's raped? Yeah. Well, who gets pregnant from rape uh, in general? Yeah. I mean, okay, yeah, perhaps. What if she's raped and the guy who raped her is, has AIDS? And did, it's like, bro, <laughs> where is this argument going? Yeah. This is just going down a rabbit hole of, of insanity. And as for the, the Ocean Gate thing, the thing that always perplexed me about that and I speak as somebody with a whole bunch of money. Mm. And may I know I'm risk averse, as we've just discussed. <laughs> the podcast has already begun. If you try and make me do extreme things, I'm like, no, walking to my car is extreme. No, thank you. But the fact that people went down on a submarine to the Titanic mm. to look at the Titanic through a TV screen, as opposed to <laughs> sending the submarine on its own and watching it on the TV screen from the yacht is amazing to yeah. me. I, I mean, I guess maybe they could sit and say, oh, but I'm closer to the... Bro, you're watching it through a screen. What's the difference? Yeah. And now you're crushed to death. In a little soda can. Bro. That was so stupid. Yeah, I mean, yeah. It's, it's, it was hard to feel sorry for them. The memes were epic. I mean, obviously, it was a terrifying thing, but the memes were off the chain. I kind of felt bad when I'd laugh at some of them. I'd be like, oh, man, that must be scary. But I don't know. Didn't it cross their mind that this is just pointless? I, 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 they would have said to me, hey, you can go down in this little soda can. You can see the submarine. I was like, through what window? Oh, there's no windows through this screen. I would have said, okay, thank you. Then send the submarine. It takes like six hours to get down there or something. Yeah. You send the submarine. I'm going to spend the next six hours in the gym. And you let me know when we're at the bottom. I've got stuff to do. Yeah, not something I would have done. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, Crazy. so I want us to ask you a kind of a question. I've been reading this book called uh, Start With Why, Simon Sinek. I don't know if okay. you know the book. Uh, basically, it's the idea that 
if you can convince people of your why, then your how and your what are much easier selves. Why do you do what you do now? That's a very good question. I'm not a philanthropist. Mm. I don't do it from a philanthropic point of view. I do it because I think that if you have a large platform and you're a man and you're afraid to tell the truth and you're a coward. So I do it for myself. I help all the people who come to me and say, you've helped all these people or you've helped me or you've done these amazing things for society. That's great. But I don't see it philanthropic. Mm. I think it would be unfair and disingenuous for me to sit here and say, I'm trying to save the world. I know I have a platform and I know what the truth is and I'm not a coward and I'm glad that I am helping people. And I think that's very important. And I think that God's light is truth. And the more you spread the truth, the harder it is for demons to control us all. And I also believe that raw action solves everything. I think that just as you said, I just got up and started working and just started the pod. Raw action solves everything. So I believe if you have an objective, you should attack it. Absolutely. But I do it because I think it. I think these things and people listen to me, so I will say them. Mm. And I know I am punished for that, but I don't see the alternative. I don't, I think I would be a coward to sit and say, well, I think these things, but I shouldn't say it because it's going to upset X, Y, Z, the matrix, as we've seen it does. But could I live with myself as a coward? I don't think so. So if people are going to listen to me and I'm going to talk, then I'm going to tell them exactly what I believe and think and, and exactly what is true. And that's why I do it. And I'm glad I'm helping people. What's interesting is, I guess maybe I am a good person after. <laughs> because if I was saying things that I believed hurt people, I don't think I'd do it. Mm. Now, if you want to get deeper down the rabbit hole, would I believe the things I believe and think the things I think if they were detrimental and they hurt people? Probably not. But if I was saying things that I thought genuinely was damaging society, I'd be a lot more likely to be quiet. It's actually quite an interesting thought experiment for me to understand how I'd have a worldview which I believe propagating would damage society. I can't work that one out exactly. However, I know I'm helping people. I know I'm helping society. I know I'm helping individuals. I'm damaging the matrix, mm. but I'm helping individuals because there's no light without dark. So if you help individualism, you're damaging collectivism. There's no other way about it. If you say to people, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you how I think, and it's going to make your particular life better, and it benefits that one individual, that's bad for the ant farm. You don't want one ant to stand up and say, this is garbage. You don't want one ant to say, I'm tired of carrying dirt. This is stupid. No. So I understand what I'm doing is good for the individual and it's bad for the, for the matrix as a whole. But I'm just telling my story and things I've learned and things I've worked out. And it's very interesting you said about this book. I've never, I haven't read a book since jail. I don't read mm. books ever. Everything I say is just me learning the hard way. And I guess I'd like some people at home to, learn from my lessons and perhaps they can get some of the benefit without such of the hard time, but we'll see how it goes. I think I have the book here. I'm going to give you, I'm going to give it to you. Oh, I and can't wait. When I go back to jail, I promise to read yeah, it. Yeah. And you, maybe you'll have a lot of time to read it. I yeah. don't know. Hopefully not. I don't want to say that actually. We'll see. Yeah. I, this is something that you've talked about before, but we're in this war between good and evil. Yep. I truly believe that. Yep. And what that evil is, I think some people say it's deep state, or it's propaganda or it's establishment or it's, you know, centuries old families. There's no way to know who it is, right? Yep. And that's the hardest part. How do you fight against the enemy when you don't know exactly who the enemy is? Yep. But I feel like in this war of good versus evil, you're a general in the movement. Do my best. And I think when you can understand and realize that there is a movement of people behind you, I think that maybe changes your perspective, your purpose. Well, it gives me, it does make me braver. Mm. Uh, it makes me braver because it makes me feel like my suffering's worthwhile because I am suffering. I want everyone at home to understand that I don't need to do, you're right. I don't need to do any of this. I don't need money. I don't need the views. I'm, it's detrimenting my life. Mm. I've lost millions and millions of dollars and I've gone to jail and all my banks have been frozen and they're trying to put me back and all of this is happening. But I think when you ask who our enemies are, I don't think it's as simple as naming a family or the deep state, et cetera. I think the enemy is deception. Mm. Demons operate from the dark, and we're living in a world which is built on lies. Every single thing is a lie. Everything they tell you is a lie. Every system you're supposed to believe in is corrupted to the core. And I think if you're going to make or build a correct society, a fair and just society, you should at least do it under the guise of truth. If you're looking at a chessboard and you have to decide the move you want to make, well, you want to understand the chessboard first. You have to analyze the chessboard and see where the pieces are. We can't do that now because the entire chessboard's cloaked in darkness. Mm. You don't know how the legal system works. You don't know how the political system works. You don't know how the financial system works. So when they come along and say, we need to do this for the good of society, how can you even make that decision when you haven't even seen how society functions? So I think if you just tell the truth about everything all the time, from there, perhaps it would be chaotic for a while as the matrix breaks, it's very likely. 
But at least if you tell the truth all the time, you have a fair starting block. You have a clear chessboard from where you can decide what moves should be made for how society should function. And we're all humans and humans are, are fallible. None of us are perfect. We're making mistakes and we've built these systems to keep some semblance of peace and serenity amongst society. And we've done an okay job for a while. But I think now we're entering a stage where the highly politicized judicial systems, mm. along with the highly politicized medical system, along with the highly politicized financial system, along with the highly politicized, <laughs> we're getting to a point now where everything's about to crumble. And yeah. I think it's very important that everyone understands the truth of how the world operates before that happens. And the hope, my hope is that we can build a new system or there's a new age and a new world where things are genuinely fair and just. I don't want to go on and on, but just for everyone at home, if you think the law is fair and just, you're going to learn the hard way that it's not. You're going to learn the very hard way. You can go into any jail in any country in the world, and you'll find people who got screwed by their lawyer or screwed by the system. Black, white, rich, poor, everybody. And of course, everyone thinks of the police and the judicial system as somebody kills someone, police catches them, goes to jail. And they do that well, and they're supposed to. But there's also the innocent guy who forgot a number on a piece of paper once in in 2001 and his life's over. Mm. So, and especially if that person's a conservative, then he's really in trouble. Yeah. So it, it's difficult. And I'm kind of scared because I say all these things about how the matrix is cracking. We need to build a new system, but it's happening in direct correlation at exact the same time as AI is taking over. And yes. I'm kind of scared the AI is going to enslave us all now. I'm kind of <laughs> sitting there going, well, if all the current systems break and they rebuild them, they're going to rebuild them with the new technology. Of course, they always would. Is this new technology going to be used for our benefit or to perma enslave us? It's kind of scary. I got so many places to go with this. Uh, we can go into government. We can go into... Uh, Let's go into Minority society. Report. Minority <laughs> we go into Report. We're all going to jail <laughs> before you even do anything. The AI bot is going to scan your entire personality profile, everything you've ever said, the way you drive mm. your car, the things you say in private, and they're going to come together with this report, and they're going to say, look, this person drives our car too fast. They're reckless. They got too many girlfriends. They're out here spreading testosterone all over the place. I don't like the things he's saying. He's physically large. He could be considered a danger. Arrest him anyway. Minority reports coming for all of us. We're all going to jail, especially if you're a man. If you're a man, you're only this far from jail anyway. <laughs> At all times. At all times, bro. Yeah. If you've got, if you have a, if you've got a dick. You're going to jail. <laughs> any, you could be in any state in America. It doesn't matter how conservative the state or how red, uh, red the state or how right wing the state. You could be in any state in America. If a girl walks into a police station and says, six years ago, this man abused me or raped me and with no evidence, she can't even remember when you're getting arrested. And if you have a job, you're going to lose it. And if you're famous, it's in the papers and your life is over. You're this close to jail anyway, sir. You're no, you're, you're this close your entire life. You're skating this close to jail anyway. You think when they get AI, we're not all perma de perma fucked. I think we are because prevention is better than cure. Mm. And they're now learning as they're trying to cure this cultural revolution because the cultural, the, the prevention was keeping us all banned. Now we start to get a bit of freedom of speech. They're now trying to cure this cultural revolution with disinformation committees and internet safety bills, et cetera. But they don't want to cure it. They want to prevent it. And I'm guarantee whatever systems come next, especially if AI is involved, they're not going to allow us to ever have any semblance of, <laughs> bro, why would they? Any semblance of freedom. So when I think about AI, I think about the, the social issue of the next generation yeah. will be human rights for artificial robots. Oh, bro, we're so toast. I, right? don't even, I don't even have solution, Bro, we're so toast. Because if you think about right now, if you ask anyone that's maybe in their 60s, 70s, and you said, hey, the social issue of our time in 2024 will be men can be women, women can be men. People are like, that's crazy. That doesn't make any sense. If you ask the previous generation, if you ask people now uh, what the next human rights for robots, they're like, that's crazy. But if you think about it, eventually one of your children may have a robot. You'll have a robot if they will do your dishes and do all this. I have one of them. Else. You got what well, does the dishes? <laughs> Eventually, we're all going to have one, yeah. right? And as technology gets better, they're going to look more human-like, right? Because that's what everyone in technology does. They try to make the voice better, the look better, because you don't want them to be so weird looking. They don't want yeah. looking. Eventually, there's going to be a generation of kids that grow up being taught, raised, basic function of society from their nanny robot. You're right. 
And when they become 18, 19, 20 years old, and they're going to say, oh, we got to take your robot offline. But I love him. That's true. You can't, you can't take R2-D2. I love <laughs> R2-D2. <laughs> no, that's true. <laughs> he and read you, to me. You know, no, you're completely right. And what's even scarier is I find, you know, I talk often about how masculinity is under attack mm. and how they're damaging our innate masculine instincts. And one of the largest innate masculine instincts is protectiveness and also to a degree disagreeableness. Mm. If you're truly masculine, you're protective. And I think as an extension of that, you're disagreeable. I, I, I'll, I'll talk about me as a person. If somebody comes into me with a brand new idea, which conflicts with mine, they can explain it to me and perhaps over time I'll adapt to it. But my instant reaction is no. I no. Who are you? Why are you here? That's my instant reaction. And I think that's the masculine instinct. That's why men are protective. It's why we're tribal, right? If a different tribe member arrived at your tribe, you'd be like, who are you? Bro, don't come near my chicks. Get away from my tent. That's how we were. That's how we evolved for the longest period of human history. And I look at now how masculinity is in decline. And when you have no innate physical capability to defend yourself, you're much more likely to subdue and effectively cucked power structures. And when you talk about things like this with the robot, I see a generation of future men with basically no testosterone mm. level who just fall in love with these robot machines and they don't see the danger in it because they're ostriches. They don't want to see the danger because if they see the danger, they have to fight and they don't want to fight because they can't. So instead they're going to pretend there's no danger and they're going to worship instead. You see this now with liberals. Liberals worship government. They, they worship government like it's God because, oh, government, please protect us. Please save us because they're cowards and they're weak. So they worship government and think it's a good thing. And that's certainly coming for the AI machine. The worst thing about the destruction of the human race at the hands of AI is that there's going to be a huge percentage of the population begging for it, yeah. begging for it. The same men now who beg girls on OnlyFans to, to ignore them, who will send a girl money and say, please don't reply, ignore me and enjoy it. The same people now who beg for the government to take their money off of them to stop the sun from being hot. These are the same people who are going to be begging the AI machines to control every aspect of their life. You're going to see future fetishes where a man is going to be the robot for the robot. <laughs> I'll, I'll do the dishes. Please, R2-D2. I'll do your dishes. I love you. That's what's going to come because the human race is so fucked. The only solution to this is innate masculinity because God created us with it to protect... <laughs> That's why God created masculinity to protect ourselves and others, but it's disappearing. So I'm telling you, the, the future of AI is more scary than most realize. You could sit down in 50 years from now with people. You could get the whole world in the concert hall and say, AI is going to destroy all of us. We have to get rid of it. And there's going to be someone at the back who goes, but she strokes my pee pee anytime I want. And he's going to just selfishly accept the annihilation of the human race for his sexual gratification or because she's his friend, like you said, or because she raised him because he's not man enough to say, no, we have to protect first. And all of that's disappeared from society. Now protect first has kind of vanished. And we're left in this insane quagmire of different ideals, constantly competing. You can, you can apply this to something else. We just talked about AI. Let's apply it to something far more simple. The border crisis. Mm. A man thinks, I don't know who these people are. I'm sure some of them are good, but one of them might be bad. Yeah. And if one of them is bad, none of them should come. Because if you gave me a box of Cheerios and told me one <laughs> Cheerio was poisoned, I wouldn't eat from the box of Cheerios because I'm not an idiot. Women will use an emotional argument. Well, most of them need help. Most of them need to be saved and we can save them all, which is asinine and incorrect anyway, but that's the emotional argument. And weak men even worse, will pretend there's no danger at all. Because if they accept there's danger, they now need to be brave. And what's the one thing a coward never wants to be? Brave. So a weak man will sit there and say, oh, you they're not criminals. How do you know they're criminals? There's already criminals here. You're a criminal. You're homophobic. You're racist. They just want a better life. And they'll ignore the problem so they don't have to ever look in the mirror and realize they're a pussy. They'll do anything to cope their way out of having to be brave and be protective. And then we end up in a situation we're in. If men were still raised with the innate masculine responsibility to protect and provide, we'd be a lot more careful about everything, not just the border, but AI, mm. because it's very obvious where it's all going to go. Yeah. And it's not just robots as you imagine robots walking around. I'm sure that'll actually be the cool part of AI. There's actually a far more dystopian, less interesting and more scary version of AI, which is where we're almost at. 
facial recognition cameras on yeah. every single corner, 15 minute CEs, electric cars, which can turn off if you try and drive into the wrong area. That's why they want everyone to go electric. Nothing to do with the environment. That's bullshit. So they can turn your car off. That's why they want you to have an electric car. If I get in my Ferrari, you can't turn it off. You got to chase me down, sir. <laughs> good luck, police. You got to catch me. I'm good. But if you're in an electric car, they just say, what's his serial number? Boop. Turn off the car. Keep the doors locked. He had a wrong, he was wrong thinking. Facial recognition on every corner, like I said. 15-minute cities, like I said. They'll control your money. They'll control where you go. They'll control if you can fly or not. They'll control your food. The AI is going to be a little camera in the corner mm. linked to your mobile phone and your national ID from the digital system. And you're not even going to see a cool robot. And AI is already going to wreck your life. You don't even get a hand job from a robot. You don't get anything. It's bullshit. That's where AI is going before the cool robots come. Bro, there are no AI hand jobs coming. It's just well, dystopian. Yet. <laughs> yet. Yet. It's just dystopian insanity. That's where we're going to end up. And as the matrix cracks and they try and rebuild this new system, unless we're very clear to people about the truth of things, we're going to end up far worse than we ever were before. Far worse. I'm still thinking about this idea. AI hand of, jobs? <laughs> no, of a man walking next to a robot carrying the robot's purse. Bro, 100%. <laughs> you know Bro, these dudes are going to be fully cocked for these fucking things. I've seen dudes fully cocked for chicks, which really ain't worth that much. So if you're telling me you're going to give him an obedient. <laughs> virgin effectively yeah. which he buys out the box <laughs> bro he's gonna be on his knees every night begging <laughs> please don't leave me you're gonna have robots programmed to be one step out the door so mm. the man can spend his life begging to keep her there because he's gonna love it the future is so fucked i don't think people <laughs> realize and it can all be fixed if men were men but they're deliberately attacking that mm. and they're attacking it for the reason i said earlier men are protective and if you want to damage a society you have to remove the protectors of society we used to walk in, the Romans would turn up to the Greeks and kill all the military age males. So now what do they do? They can't kill us all. So they try and neuter our minds and neuter our innate masculine tendencies. If you're a man, you're toxic. You're toxically masculine. If you're a man in any regard, you're toxic. If you say to your wife, don't go out drinking with all those other men who I don't know. You're my wife. Stay home. You don't go drinking with men because we're in love and we're married. You're controlling and you're toxically masculine. You're a bad person. How, how does that even, how can society even function under that premise? How do you even have a wife? How do you have a marriage? How do you have, how do you have anything? Nothing mm. even makes sense anymore. The ideals that they're purporting and the way they want men to live literally doesn't even make sense. It's impossible to live as a man that way. So you have two options. You either become a wrong thinker, like I am, like you are, like a lot of people are. And if you get too big that you pay the price because they chop off the head of the snake. Or you absolve, absorb all the garbage they put out there and, and try and poison your mind with, and you end up miserable. Do you think that they are deliberately taking away masculinity from men? Or do you think that there is a role that men themselves play and they're just willingly giving it up? Well, we have personal accountability in all things. Mm. But I think it's a long and deliberate psyop. And most people don't realize that psyops are built on a very long time scale. People imagine PSYOP as you watch a 30-minute movie and then your brain's been changed and you've been brainwashed. That's not how PSYOPs work. Brainwashing works over the passage of time and it works with the slow and gradual normalization of ideas. I'll give you an example. You just talked about how 60 years ago, if you told somebody that a man could be a woman and a woman could be a man, that would be insane. Now we will sit here and still say it's insane, but there's a large subsect of the population mm -hmm. who would sit here and argue with us. Our grandchildren will not think it's insane at all. They'll think it's yeah. perfectly normal. Yeah. And as much as we try our best to fight against it, and as much as we try our best to resist the tide of darkness, it's going to come and they are going to win. Yeah. So when they put these psyops in order, they think generationally. As you said earlier, because I like to reference back, you talked about these families that been control for a very long time. Well, they're thinking about the world their grandchildren are going to inherit. And if they want to purport an idea which is negative for the society because it benefits them, they're going to think, I may not see the benefits of it, but Rothschild number 89, he will. So we'll just put the psyop over a long enough period of time. That's what they do. And you're saying men are giving it up. Yeah, slowly and gradually, we are giving it up. All of us do it. Mm. Even me, who is very conscious of these things, catches myself do it. I'll give you a perfect example. COVID was the great example. They took 100% of your rights away. Then they gave 80% of them back. Oh, you can go out now. Just wear a mask sometimes. But you can go out and you're free again. Well, wait. A year ago, I was 100% free. Now I'm 80% mm -hmm. free. But most people feel free because they were constrained. So they take everything. They give you most of it back. And they keep that little bit. They take everything and they give you most of it back and they keep that little bit. Before you know it, 
You're fucking begging for a, a robot to give you a hand job as she's one <laughs> as she's one this foot damn out the door. robot. <laughs> yeah, bro. But that's where it's gonna come. Because also the innate masculine desire to reproduce is also a very important, mm. right? Men want to have children. And it's hard for a man to find a, a wife. It's hard for a man to find a woman to have his kids. A woman can find somebody to get her pregnant any day of the week. But for a man to do that is actually difficult. In days of old, you had to be an important man or a man of stature or a man of honor. Why did men join the army? Because they got to come home with that medal so they could get a wife. They'd go risk their lives for this. You had to be a man who did the right things, a man who was strong, a man who was capable, a man who was competent, et cetera, et cetera. Now we have a huge subsect of the population of men who can't get partners, and they've been outsourced to pornography and insanity and only fans and prostitution and all this other garbage, which is one conversation that's going to be replaced by AI and robots coming soon as well, which subdues the men. If the men don't have to become strong to find a mate, then they're not going to become strong, which once again, makes it easier for the population to be controlled. If you had a population where all the men had to be honorable, virtuous men of capability for them to be able to reproduce, you would have an honorable, virtuous, capable society. But if you say to men, you can be a lazy idiot, this robot's can give you a hand job, or you can watch porn or OnlyFans or whatever it is, and you can just sit at home and you'll be semi-satisfied and you don't even have to work. You can get food stamps or you can work a bullshit minimum wage job and we'll take most of it in taxes, but you'll, ba you'll barely survive and scrape some living off at the bottom. And then when their life is miserable and they feel depressed, you can convince them it's someone else's fault because that's what they do. They come along to these people and say, yeah, your life's shit. It's not because you didn't try. It's because of the white people, the black people, the yellow people, the Republicans, the Democrats, whoever and make them hate-filled. Now you have a whole bunch of hate-filled, useless humans who do nothing to benefit society as a whole, subdued with garbage, and they are basically agents of the matrix because their mind can be programmed to hate anyone they're told to hate. And that changes in time as we've learned. If Trump's in power, there's a big racial divide. If he's not in power, the riots stop. And they just change it around. Who do we need the agents of the matrix to hate this week? And they just, boom, turn them all on because they're sitting there with nothing else in their life and no honor and no dignity. And they're used to continue the degradation of society. It's insane. There's something that we talk about a lot, which is normalization of some of the things that we happen around us. Right? So for example, why is there, why do they allow so much crime in the cities? Yep. There's crime everywhere. They can stop it. If they really wanted to, all they would have to do is just start arresting people yep. and say enough is enough. And crime would essentially not go away, but be manageable. Yep. Right now, they let it run rampant in most U.S. American cities. Why is that? And I think it's because they want people that live in the cities to be like, all right, there's so much crime and we don't feel safe. Please, government, can you give us more control? 100%. Please, government, can you surveil us more? Please, government, can you put cameras here? And can you do facial recognition? And can you do digital IDs? Because if they force it on you, people will push back. Of course. If you ask, if you create a situation where you ask for it, they're like, oh, we're here to help. Well, absolutely. And that's the only thing that people will give up freedom for is safety. Mm, yeah. That's the only, the, the human mind will only accept a loss in freedom for safety. So you're completely right. They could stop it and they decide not to. And they're also normalizing it. Yeah. I speak to people. I spoke to someone who lives in Chicago yesterday. And I was saying, why do you live in Chicago on purpose? Like you have money and you're there on purpose. Like you're waking up in Chicago on like leave. Like what's wrong? He goes, it's not that bad. It's really not that bad if you avoid this part, that part, that part. And it's not that bad if you don't go out at night. And I'm like, I live in Bucharest, Romania, the capital of one of the poorest countries in Europe. And I can walk around at night and I drive a $5 million Bugatti and I have a half a million dollar watch and I have no problems here. You've been so normalized to crime that you yeah. say it's not that bad if you only see crime once a week and avoid most of the city. It's crazy how quickly people become normalized to these things. And you're right. Eventually, it's going to get to a crisis point, a tipping point. Like I said earlier, when the matrix finally cracks, they're going to come along with a new solution. The new solution is going to be draconian control because it's all governments have ever done. It's all they know how to do. And unless we get enough people understanding the truth and the light, unless we get enough people understanding the reality of the chessboard, we're in trouble. Because when they come along and say, we're going to have a new judicial system with AI and this, 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 we need people to sit and say, wait, the old judicial system was corrupt. How do we ensure the new one isn't? But if people are sitting there going, oh, the justice system's good. And now we have this new super justice system. <laughs> no, you have a super corrupt system and you're screwed. And you're completely right. They're normalizing these things because they're trying to remove the freedom of people and replace it with safety because all governments have ever wanted since the dawn of human time is control of their populace. Yeah. It's what allows them to be most effective. I'm not going to even be mad at the government. If you're an ant, let's look at it from a business perspective. Mm. You have a business, I have a business, mm. right? If I, I have a business, I have 110 people who work for me. 
If one of them didn't listen to me, I'd fire him. Yeah. Why would I keep him? My business is not effective if I have somebody inside of my company who has wrong think, right? They think wrong. I believe certain ideas. This is my company. And we have this one person here who disagrees with everything I say. That's annoying. I want him to go. That's fair. And everybody would agree with me. Well, now you have to understand why the government hates us. The government wants everyone to comply and obey and do as it says and as it wants so we can rub the government how it sees fit. I disagree with that. I am the bad employee. Yeah. I am the person who is annoying to them, especially someone like us, because we have a voice. Not only are we bad employees, we inspire other employees to be bad. Now everyone's listening to us going, wait, he has a point. I don't like this company anymore. I don't like how it runs. That's unfair. That's unjust. Then they want to fire us, but you can't fire us. So you have to put us in jail or mm -hmm. teach us a lesson or sue us or take our money or slander us with the media machine. They have to punish us somehow. It's as simple as that. Because a government is sitting there as a as a business, which is how it should be run. They're corrupt to the core. But a, business, a government sitting there saying, how do we run our government as effectively as possible? Well, we want robots. We don't want humans with too much individual liberty and too much individual ideas and too much freedom. No, we want robots who comply so we can be effective. And that's why they're going to come along and any new system they, they build is going to have that in mind. They want draconian control over all of us. And if you don't understand that, then you're an idiot. They make new laws every day. I've never seen them take one away. Yeah. What do we say about them slowly incrementing and damaging your freedom? They make a new law every day. That's law, let alone regulations. When's the last time you've checked IRS regulations? Mm -hmm. They change daily. You don't even know if you're in trouble or not. Never. You're in trouble if they want you to be. Everyone at home is in trouble if they want you to be. You can't even keep up with how fast this garbage changes. So they're constantly stealing your freedom from you little by little incrementally because they're trying to make robots of us all. And it's scary. I've heard that uh, in the United States, uh, any given day, a regular person will break 20 federal laws yep. without even thinking about 100%. it. 100%. It's crazy because there's no way to know. Exactly. And then you understand that your ability to freak, your ability to speak freely is directly correlated with your insignificance. Because mm. if you get too loud as the bad employee, and because living a normal life means you break laws, they come along and they screw you. That's what they do. They come along and go, ah, let's get him. And everyone's guilty. That's what's so amazing to me. The people with the slave mind at home watch this or people who say, Andrew, the human trafficker, or he did this, <laughs> or he did that. Don't you understand that you're just insignificant and stupid? Because if you had a voice that was large, that people listened to, that was saying things different than what the government want you to say, you would be guilty of mm. something. Everyone's guilty. And especially most of these laws are so insane yeah. and subjective. I don't want to go into my case because I'm bored of talking about it. But my case is that Human trafficking is forcing somebody to do something for financial gain. I was supposedly doing it via the lover boy method by being nice. So I nicely helped girls get big on TikTok because they asked for my advice and I told them what times to post. I didn't even make any money from it. The mm. girls made money and they called that human trafficking. Do you have any idea what stretch of the imagination that is? But all the law is subjective. They just make, they can just subjectively go, mm, maybe. And then they don't care if I get found innocent. They don't give a shit. They've dragged my name through the mud. Two years, I went to jail, took all my money. Now I have to go to court, endless millions on legal bills. They don't care. It damages my influence. Why did this case even pop up in the first type place? Because someone called the Romanian government and said, who's this guy talking so much in your country? Mm. Who is he? Look at him. Find something. And, and they're like, mm, well, he's pretty innocent. Ah, TikTok. <laughs> Go. Got him. Got him. <laughs> got and, him. Uh, and, and that's in Romania. It's worse in America. Like you said, mm. 20 federal laws. Yeah. They got Roger Ver, the, the Bitcoin guy. I don't even yeah. know about this. They got, he was big on Bitcoin. He was annoying them. They got him, they raided his house or something to do with Bitcoin, ended up busting him ATF for moving fireworks across state lines because he bought fireworks for his kids <laughs> in another state. He did four years in jail or something ridiculous. If they want to get you, they're going to get you. So you're living under this system, the judicial system, fair justice for all. But as soon as you annoy anyone and they say your name to a prosecutor, you're going to jail. And now they're going to make a new justice system for your safety. Don't worry. Mm -hmm. We're going to take our freedom away for your safety. And we're going to involve digital IDs and face ID and all these things like we talked about. But you'll be fine as long as you do exactly as we say. We're from and that's the government the, and we're here to help. And that's, <laughs> and that's where the slavery comes. Yeah. As long as you do exactly as we say. Because if you're a bad employee, you'll pay the price. It's crazy. I think I've, I've been thinking about this, right? So you've said before m multiple times that you think you've been canceled because you were influencing the youth yeah. and you were helping them become more masculine. Yeah. And I've, I've married and I thought about that a while. Like why did, because as you grow and I'm like watching your trajectory and what happened to you and all of a sudden my content just went big out of nowhere. I'm like, damn, 
I kind of have to be con- con- considerate to that, right? Yeah. What be happened ca- to be you? Careful, sir. Happen- <laughs> be careful. It could happen to me. And every day I post something, I'm like, this could literally be my last day. I think it every day. Yeah. And I was like, why did Andrew get canceled so hard? And I've been thinking about it. And I don't think it's because you were influencing the youth. I don't think so. I think it's because you you have the largest internet army in the world. And I think because the the movement of people behind you, I don't think it mattered if they were ma- masculine or not. You were also teaching them to understand how to use the internet. And I think in the training of an army, they're like, all right, this is over the line. Because right before you got canceled was the, um, what was it? The GME, GameStop. Yep. And Wall Street bets. That's true. And they saw people gather around a movement. Yep. And they almost crushed Wall Street. Yep. And at the end of the day, spoiler alert, they all got crushed because yep. you can't beat them. Yep. But they saw that happening. And that was organic. And that was with a guy that's a leader that really doesn't have the characteristics yep. of leader. Yep. Right after him, you came along and it seems organized and people are gathering behind you and behind your movement of damn the man, damn the system, system is broken and they're coming for you. And they look into you and they're like, he's also teaching them how to use the internet. I agree with you. They, they, they fear the power. Yeah. They fear the power structure. I'm the bad employee who got a bunch. I started a union now. Yeah. And You're the union rep. I'm the union <laughs> rep and they don't like me. I completely, I, I think in life, if you're going to be non-emotional about things, which I try my best to be, I enjoy being emotional on purpose. I will decide to be emotional in certain situations if it makes them more pleasurable. Mm. If I'm with my kids, I decide to be emotional, but I can turn it off. And I look at things hyper logically. As a hyper logical man, I will sit here and say that as unfair as the Matrix has been to me, in many ways, they could have been miles worse. Yeah. I'm not going to lie. I'm going to sit here and say, considering I became the most Googled man on the planet, telling the truth and fighting against their narratives that they've been trying to enforce for a very long time. We said psyops are slow. They've been trying for a very long time to get men to a position where they're apathetic and don't want to be masculine anymore. I've come along and derailed to a degree a lot of their plans in a very short period of time. I've undone years of work in a few short months. I'm surprised I'm alive. Mm. I'm not going to lie to you. Right now, they could have got rid of me much easier. So they've actually been... No headphones. <laughs> check they've, it. Actually been very, they've actually been pretty soft on me considering mm. what they could have done to me. But certainly they fear centralized power structures. And when I was in jail, I got a letter from somebody saying he was organizing a huge protest. I think it was in uh, America. And he said he wants to put a huge protest together. And he's already got 25,000 people who signed up, etc. And I said, no, don't do that. Because I feel like I'm already on the verge of becoming a national security threat. Mm. Once people start getting in together in huge groups and rioting in my name, I'm yeah. toast. Oh, that's it. It's over, bro. Yeah. Once you're a national security threat, I mean, I'll, to give you an example, my host nation, UK, hates me the most. Members of parliament stand up in parliament complaining about how the fact I'm still on the internet and they can't get rid of me and they pass the internet safety bill and I'm still there. And these are members of parliament, the most important people in the country and the most important building in the country talking about how I have to go. Once you're a national security threat, all bets are off. That's when you can get drone striked. That's when you can get assassinated. That's when you can get arrested without trial. That's when you get thrown in Belmarsh for 14 years or whatever, like some other guy. You just disappear when you're an NSA. So, uh, NST. So, I don't want that to happen to me. So, I just sit here and say, look, guys, agency, individualism, work hard, be yourself. I'll teach you the things I know. Yes, sure. But I even I know the limits of my movement and I yeah. know why they attacked me. And, and, and I think we talk about how it's not because I was influencing the youth to be masculine. It's masculinity they fear the most. I think that is a huge element of it. I would say that if I was teaching people how to make money and I was saying certain things, but I wasn't so strict and so large on the masculine contingent of the personality in regards to the fact you have to stand up and die for what you believe in. I don't think they would have seen me as such a threat, but I think they looked at me and thought, this guy is going to be hard to control. Mm -hmm. And I'll say it right here on this podcast. I've been offered to, to shut up. Yeah, we've talked about that before. Which I've is been crazy. offered to shut up. Yeah, and many people don't understand that this is how selling your soul works. Because I've I've tweeted before if I if they ever kill me, the details on exactly how they ask me to sell my soul will be re- released, and that's true. But what they effectively do, I'll give you the very sanitized version. They come along with a sponsorship contract. Mm. And they come and say, "Look, we're going to pay you fifty million dollars. Your official opinions are X, Y, and Z. You don't talk about this, this, this. You're going to wear these clothes, and you're going to act this way, and you're going to laugh when they make certain jokes about mm. this certain haram crap." And you're going to be this kind of little fruity idiot, like all the liberals are, and you're going to get paid all this money. And if anyone asks you about these things, you're going to say this, this, and this, and we're going to protect you. 
And they don't say we're going to protect you. What they say is, don't worry, we have huge partners in the media, so we'll make sure that any story before it comes out, we can see it in advance and we can give our own reply. Basically saying, we'll make sure the media says good things about you. We'll pay you money and you're going to have this opinion. And that's how you sell your soul. And then you join the machine. And now I'm, I'm guessing, because I said no, I'm guessing that's the beginning of it because then you get invited to the industry parties, right? If I would have sold my soul, I'd be at the Grammys. Yeah. I would have never got arrested. I'd be at the Grammys. I would have gone to an after party at the Grammys. Fucking Trevor Noah or whoever else would be doing something fucking haram in the corner with fuck knows who. I'd be in the same room. It'd be on camera. Boom. Then they got me blackmail. I'm just paranoid. I don't trust this stuff. I don't want to go near these people. I don't want to hang around with them. I don't do any of the weird shit they do. Every five minutes, a sex tape's coming out about some celebrity. Some dude, some fucking guy has his dick out every five minutes. Why would you do that if you're a celebrity? Unless it's all purposeful or it's set up or they want something on you. It's all a scam. So when I instantly refused, and I think that's what upset them the most was my instant refusal. When I was offered this contract and I'm not going to say who it's from because I don't want to die yet. And I said, no. And they're like, oh, uh, well, your lawyer, do you want to send it to your lawyer? No, no. I've, I've just read that I need to have official opinions. The answer mm. is no. It was only a few months after that. I ended up in a jail cell. I knew it was going to happen. They, 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 they looked at me and go, this is a big guy with a lot of influence. There's a lot of people who listen to him. Let's use him as a tool to purport the ideas we want the people to believe. He refused. All right, teach him a lesson. We gave the bad employee a written warning and he refused. Well, then what happens next? Something has to happen. And if you're at home thinking that you can become massively influential and not have the attention of these people or offers like that, then you're not very smart on how the world works. If you get big enough, they're going to come to you, sir. I'm warning you. If you get big enough, they're going to come to you and they're going to offer you a whole bunch of money and you can take it and you'll be okay. Or you can stick to your principles and your morals and you'll suffer. Yeah. They've, um, I mean, they've asked me to, can you talk about this? Can you talk about this? We'll pay you this much. Talk about this issue or talk about this issue. And even if it's something I agree with, I just, I can't say yes to any of it because I know if you say yes one time, it's never going to end. You know, you can't say yes and then all of a sudden say no. So it's just not possible. Well, let, let's tie this back into what I was saying about how they were threatened by my masculinity and the fact I teach masculinity. What type of person will reject money and reject his own personal financial gain for his morals? Hmm. A man. Hmm. Only a man will do that. I will argue now that weak men and women would be far more likely to take the cash for their own selfish interests. Only a man stands up and says, no, this is wrong, so I disagree. Because men have been like this since the dawn of time. M women and children first on the lifeboats. I'm a man, I will suffer, it is my job. So I sat there and said, no, my sanity is not for sale, sir. I reject your $50 million. I don't need it anyway because I'm not a peasant and I'm not going to listen to you. And they couldn't believe it because most people in my position, if I was a girl or, and of course... Don't, I'm not being misogynistic. I'm just talking in <laughs> generals. If I was a chick and they came along and some makeup brand offered me a bunch of money and like, oh yeah, and you have to, for this episode, you have to do a pro transgender episode or mm. a pro LGBT episode because it's pride week and here's all your money and you're part of our makeup brand. She'd be like, okay. She wouldn't even realize how far down the psyop she is. She wouldn't even realize what she's doing. Only me as a man sat there and saw exactly what it was. This is a bribe. You are attempting to bribe me. And the fact that I said no and then went on an emergency meeting afterwards and started screaming that my sanity is not for sale. Mm. There was a room somewhere. I don't know where it was. I don't know if it was in Washington, D.C. I don't know if it was in London. I don't know if it was on the moon. I don't know where. There was a room of people who sat around and watched my emergency yeah. meeting a few hours after I rejected their contract and thought, he's a problem. Yeah. He's a problem. Yeah. How dare he? How dare he? How dare he deny our offer? It was a fair offer. It was a, it was a very good offer. <laughs> and this arrogant idiot thinks yeah. he, this arrogant guy doesn't understand how the world works. The thing is, I did understand. Yeah. That's what they don't get. I did know how the world works, which is why I started saying they're going to put me in jail, mm. which is probably frustrates them even more that I'm not scared of them. I understand where this ends and I'm going to do it anyway. And I'm hoping, at least, when you said I'm a general, I'm hoping I'm at least inspiring bravery in, in enough other people because they can't put us all in jail. No. They can't put us all. They can put me in jail if I'm alone. But if there's thousands of us, yeah. then it becomes harder. Then the matrix cracks. Then the new system is built. Perhaps we can save the world. And it's something I say all the time. Like, if more people stood up and said, no, enough is enough, they can't cancel everybody. Correct. Who's going to consume all their content? Who's going to buy all their technology? Who's going to scroll their apps if everyone is canceled? Correct. It's power of the numbers. Correct. So you have, if everyone has to say something, otherwise, 
you know, they're just going to keep on making examples of people. And that's what it is. You take the most famous guy you can, you make an example of him. They try to do it to you. They try to do it to like Russell Brand. Yep. They try to do a lot of people out there. The guys who just get out of line yep. and you can either, you know, be scared and not speak up or you can join the community of people like enough is enough. This is bullshit. We don't want to live like this any longer. Absolutely. And we understand that there are people out there playing God and we're just the ants. I understand our role in society. However, doesn't mean we don't try. A hundred percent, bro. And I think then you go back into, you can look at that at a deeper level. The reason you try is because if you try, you feel happy in your heart. I, I can't explain the satisfaction I feel in my soul knowing that I am a problem to the enemy. Mm. It's not about, okay, I can't even compare the joy of a Ferrari or money or a yacht or girls or private jets to me knowing the enemy is mad because of me. <laughs> maybe I'm petty. Maybe I'm petty. Maybe I'm immature. But you know, like when you're a kid and you know you've annoyed someone and you yeah. get that smile. That's, it's like deep in my heart. Even when I was in jail, there was times I was in jail, they would take me to the decal office and ask me a bunch of questions. And I would just sit there and say, no comment, no comment, mm. no comment. And they'd say, well, if we can get through this interview, you can go home. And I go, I get to go home. They're like, yeah, you can go home if we can just answer these few questions. And I'm like, oh, okay. No comment. Mm. And when they sent me back to jail, I was like, yes. Like, I, I've annoyed <laughs> them. Maybe I'm petty. But I feel that joy of knowing I'm a thorn in their side. Mm. And that's what we need more of. Because if you don't own your soul, if you don't own your integrity, you don't really own anything anyway. People are obsessed with trying to get hold of money and get hold of all these material assets. They haven't been through the matrix system yet. You don't own that stuff. If you think the money in your bank is yours, piss the government off. Mm. You think the house you live in is yours, piss the government off. You think the land you live on is yours, don't pay your property taxes. You don't own a thing. And you can build some complicated legal structure and you can have a trust fund which owns a company which owns a trust fund and you can try your very best to Aikido it and hide it. But if you become public enemy number one, if you become large enough, they'll find it and yeah. they'll take it. You own nothing but your soul. That's all you have. So that's the number one thing you should be concerned with. I've learned now from my matrix attack, I don't own anything. All my houses were taken. They found every single piece of money they could find that I owned and they could prove they took. Now, I'm okay. I'm smart. I prepared. But if you're sitting there going, oh, I'm going to shut up and I'm going to sell my soul for money in the bank. That's the biggest scam on the planet because you don't even own that money in the mm. bank. You don't own anything. It's kind of amazing people, especially in the West. There are certain countries where they don't have property tax, for example. But the idea you think you own your house and you have to pay property taxes to take it off you. You just rent it from the government. You don't even own it. And then you paid a bunch of interest on a mortgage so that you can own a house that you now rent from the government. It's all a scam. It's all a lie. And if you don't do as you're told, they're going to take it off you anyway. So what do you have besides your integrity? And I think we need to instill that in more men. That's what they had to wake up and say, I'm doing the right thing, even if I suffer for it. I just had a thought. If you took the money, you'd probably be Taylor Swift's boyfriend right now. Bro, <laughs> full of vaccine. <laughs> yeah, well, you, no, you'd be that guy. I, well, you could have been the booster guy. I'll, if I took the money, our channel would be 10 times bigger. Our reach would be 100 times wider. But we refuse to give in to the Matrix. If you guys want to support the pod, definitely pick up some merch. It's really the only way that we're able to self-sustain. It's not cheap to go to Romania and get these interviews. It's not cheap to go to Iowa to get these interviews and coverage. So if you want to see more of it, definitely pick up some merch. Let's talk about Taylor. Yeah, I 100% could have been Taylor Swift's boyfriend. <laughs> I could have taken the saline injections because uh -huh. famous people, they can't be dying, right? So they don't take the real no. vaccine. I could have taken the saline injections. I could have been Taylor Swift's boyfriend. I could have had Dua Lipa and Katy Perry in the corner cucked. I could have been sitting around being king of it all. I could have taken Britney Spears for a wild ride. She's crazy. That would have been <laughs> an interesting night. But yeah, I could have sold my soul and I would have been at the Grammys, at the Oscars, hanging around with all these people and I'd be Andrew Tate and I could have just shut up about certain things and I probably could have kept a semblance of my message and said a few things and like skirted on the edge of trying to motivate people but not saying too much and just sat there and took the fame and took the money and not go to jail and I could have done all of that. But I would have sold my soul, Matt. Mm. Don't you understand? <laughs> Maybe I'm stupid. I Sometimes I look in the mirror and think, am I dumb? Mm. Like, am I just so petty and principled. Am I, am I an idiot? Couldn't I have just taken the money and spent time with my children and had a fantastic life? Did I make a mistake? And then every once in a while, something happens 
And it reminds me that I didn't make a mistake. And mm-hmm. I'll give you a very simple example of it. Last time I felt like I really did the right thing is when I did Piers Morgan. And he started asking me about Israel Palestine. Yeah. And he started telling, trying to get me to say what he wanted me to say. And I was like, no, it's a genocide. Mm. And I don't care what you say. That is wrong. And that is what I believe. We don't have to even argue whether what I believe is true, even though it is. The point is, if I had signed that contract, I would have been told what to say. And when I put his stupid ass in his place about the vaccine and about Israel and Palestine, I felt good again. I was like, no, I've made the right decision. And sorry, Taylor, you're not going to get the top G. You're stuck with Mr. Vaccine. You're not allowed me because you've sold your soul and I refused. So I've now changed the dynamic. It's not that I don't get access to their life. They don't get the benefit of me being part of their stupid club. Mm. I win. They need me more than I need them. I would argue right now, nobody gives a solitary fuck about most of those people. Get the Grammy awards and line them all up and say, name them. And I guarantee you can name three or four and the rest of them, you don't have a clue who they are. People who have sold their souls for money, destroyed their own integrity, and we don't even know who they are. They don't even get fame off the back of it. So I don't want to be part of their club. Taylor Swift's going to have to dream of me the rest of her life. She's going to have to settle with second place. She's not allowed the top G because my soul is not for sale. Isn't it funny that uh, Pierce Morgan's show is called Uncensored, but yet it's very censored? I mean... (laughs) And you know, Pierce, Pierce and I have an interesting relationship. Yeah. Because you know what he's going to do. Mm. So to a degree, I respect him because he sits down and gives you a hard time and yeah. you know what he's going to do. So I respect that he's very open about who he is. I mean, he's incorrect a lot of the time. Sure. But I don't dislike Pierce. I mean, yeah. he's full of shit and he's sponsored by the MSM and he's owned and he gets paid a lot of money to say the right things. But at least you know the deal you're going to get with Pierce. Has Pierce been told in his earpiece what his official opinion is a few times? I'd argue a few times a day Mm. because he gets a lot of money because he's part of the system. And that's how this all works. What's interesting, though, is that there's nowhere on earth which is truly free because we say these things as if they're a West-specific problem, and they're not. Everywhere in the world is the same. In China, there's certain things you cannot say. In Russia, you better not insult Putin. In Dubai, you better not insult the leaders or God. There's Every single country has its taboo subjects. However, the problem we have in the West is that the subjects we're not allowed to attack, the ones that are taboo, are the ones which I believe are genuinely detrimental to society. I feel like I have freedom of speech in Saudi Arabia, mm. which is a very controlled country. But I feel like I have freedom of speech because I don't want to say the things I'm not allowed to say. I don't want to insult God and I don't want to promote transgenderism. So I feel like everything I say is allowed to be said. So I feel free. Whereas in America, the things I do want to say are taboo. They're not allowed. So I feel like I'm very constrained, which is where you get these ideological differences when people say, but America is a free country. You can say whatever you want. Well, you're saying what they want you to say. That's why you feel like it's free. But if you start saying the things they don't want you to say, you start to realize it's not free at all. And it's kind of interesting that America is built on this idea of freedom. The Western world's built on this idea of freedom where most other nations are. Other nations are built on the idea of God or the idea of patriotism. We've lost that. And we're saying, you don't have to believe in God or any type of God. You don't have to even be patriotic. You can hate this place, but you're free to do whatever. And that's a very interesting scam because to try and hold a scam like that up, how do you make people feel free when they're not allowed to say the things that you don't want them to say? Mm. The only way you can do that is by allowing them to be free to do stupid shit. Hmm. So you say, we're based on freedom. We don't want them to realize they can't say anything important. So to keep the lie of freedom alive, let's tell them they can change genders. (laughs) Because you can't do that in most other places. So what they do is they push insanity and say, you're free to be an idiot. And they push that so they can keep the freedom scam alive. Because you're free to be an idiot. But you're not free to be smart. You're not free to understand how it works. You're not free to tell the truth. You're not free to try and protect your family. You're not free to try and have your own land and your own family and do the right thing. You're not free to do any of that. You're only free to do the dumb shit that they don't see as a threat so they can keep their freedom scam alive. And truthfully, if you look at the West, I think America has the highest incarceration rate in the world, the most laws in the world. As more is a higher percentage of its population currently in jail than Stalin had, than Stalin in the gulags. You don't talk about freedom. Now, If I was telling, if I got this big telling everyone to chop their dick off and I wore a wig, I never would have gone to jail. Yeah. Never. You'd be really famous. I'd be very famous. (laughs) I'd be, I'd be Taylor Swift's girlfriend. Yeah. But here I am saying, no, you're a man and you want to be respected in your household and you want your wife to listen to you and you want to raise your kids. 
<coughs> and they're your kids, they're not the government's, and you don't want the government to come along and force them to get transgender surgery because they got psyoped in school, and you want to have a say over the children you pay and raise? No, 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 no. Mr. Tate, human trafficker. I mean, it's one of those things where um, recently, I, over the last six months, they've been doing this a lot. Joe Biden will come out and tweet, um, we're doing this to protect our children. And every time I read that, I'm like, no, they're not our children. They're not your children. They're my children. 100%. If anyone's going to indoctrinate my kids, it's going to be me. 100%. It's my responsibility. And you have no say in it whatsoever. And I think that's the line for a lot of people. I'm hoping it is. Yeah. I'm hoping it is because once they believe, I mean, I'll give you an example of the COVID vaccine. I know we keep going back to COVID. I know it's boring. We've all talked about it a million times, but I think, well, I think COVID talking about COVID constantly is really important. Because that's the moment that a lot of people really woke up yeah. to see all the irregularities in the world, to see the lies through the mainstream media. And it's almost like you have to keep on reminding people because they forgot. It was only four years ago. I know. But it seems like another lifetime ago. Yeah. You need to remind people that because four years now leading into the next election cycle, if you forget what they did during COVID and how they used it and weaponized it against you. Like, you're not going to see it coming, which they're going to do again, maybe not through a pandemic, but they're going to do something similar this year also. 100%. Constantly have to remind people. 100%. If you're a farmer and you have farm animals, you choose what vaccines and what injections go into that farm animal because you believe it benefits you. And that's what they did with the COVID vaccine. They saw us as nothing more than farm animals. And that's why I refused to get it. Uh, there's a lot of reasons I refused to get it. But I remember specifically saying, the government doesn't own my blood. Mm. It's my blood. The government can have my passport and my ID number or whatever. It is my blood. And if I get cut, I bleed it and I need it so I can stay alive. It doesn't belong to them. It belongs to me. And I decide what's in it. By extension, not only do they think of you as a farm animal because they get to decide what's in your bloodstream. If you have a farm animal and that farm animal has calves, they see that as their property also. The government sees you as property. You're just one of the ants in the ant farm, one of the cows on the farm, one of the robots in their big corporate machine. And your children belong to them too in their mind. And they want their, your children to be good, productive members of the matrix, which means they want to psyop our kids. And that's why exa that's exactly why they don't want a strong man and a loving wife and a good nuclear family, because you're now competition to their psyop machine. Their psyop machine is the internet and YouTube and all the people who tell the truth are censored. All the garbage is allowed under the guise of freedom. And if you have the largest YouTube channel in the world, one of them has to become transgender for some reason. And then they go to school and they're all told all this other garbage. And you're fighting a very difficult fight. You only have a few hours a day with your kid. They have 12 hours a day of endless propaganda, garbage, and sanity. And that's done on purpose. And if you have a strong household, a strong family household... They see that as competition. They don't sit and say, we want America to be built on the back of strong families. They sit and say, strong families are t stopping the children absorbing the slave programming. Mm. So how do we do this? How do we make sure the family is not as strong as it should be? Well, let's demasculinize the male and let's use feminism to make the female intolerable and let's make them both broke via inflation so they're busy working. And then let's take the kid away during amidst the chaos as the man argues with the woman and the woman keeps talking about some garbage feminist crap she saw on The View and neither of them can pay their bills. We'll just slowly take the little child away and we'll put them in school and we'll start pumping garbage in their ear. And before you know it, the kid will come home and say it wants to change genders. And the man will say, I want to stop that. The woman, because she listens to a bunch of feminist shit, thinks that anything a man says is instantly wrong, so she'll support the kid's insanity. The father will lose control of his own child. The child will start taking pills and mutilate itself, end up suicidal and kill itself at 23. Like, this is all happening. I'm not making this up. This is all happening right now. In any other country in the world, that would be unthinkable. But in the West, they've got their psyop so, so well orchestrated so well oiled they're beginning to pull it off and what do we say about incremental and slow right now you hear examples of court cases where the man loses control of his own son and his son changes gender and it's kind of a news story in 50 years from now no one's even going to care mm. it's going to happen non-stop because it's incremental and slow just like somebody be being transgender was very rare 20 years ago and now it's normal i'd argue now in 50 years from now the number of fathers who are going to lose their son to becoming Ugh. a girl is going to be off the charts and no one's even going to talk about it how do you resist these things well it's difficult but this is the truth right so this is the truth that we have to show when i'm talking about telling people about the chessboard this is the truth the legal system will see your kid as nothing more but a tool to cock you with, just to teach you a lesson. And they're going to build a new legal system. 
with AI, a new one, a stronger one, a fairer one. You have to be very careful of these people because they don't care about you. I like the word you said. It was a very good word you used. You said you want to indoctrinate your kid. Yeah. Correct. As do I. My kid will think like me. Why am I paying for my kid? Why am I raising my child? Why am I dealing with its mother and all her headache if I don't get to decide how my son's going to be? What's the point then? If we're all just one big goo of genetic mess and we're all just generic humans, which are programmed by the matrix, why even have kids? I'm having a child. So it has my name and acts like me. Yeah. And even that as baseline understood as that's been throughout all of human history is under attack. If you can't, if you can't tell your children to think like you, if you can't be a man and protect your household and protect your relationship and protect your woman, like they are attacking the baseline nucleus of, of the masculine psyche in days of old. It was, I am Andrew son of yeah. that's what it was all about. <laughs> that's what it was all Family about. Family name meant Family. everything. Oh, completely. Yeah. Can we talk about the biggest YouTuber in the world and his normalization of a thing? Or is that something that you're not even allowed to talk about? Like how off limits is that topic? Yeah. Because you know what I'm saying? And it's one of those things where if you put it out there and if we were to say his name and associate it, it's like insta hate. And I enjoy his content. I think he makes fun videos. However, what he's doing is normalizing transgenderism amongst children. Yes. It's not amongst adults. The target audience is children. Yes. And it's normalization. But if you talk about it. Well, see, so here's the thing that's interesting. Like, we haven't even said his name. Everyone knows who we're talking about. We can't. Yeah. And I don't, and I don't know the guy. And I'll also be honest. Yeah. I'm ne- I, I know the kind of videos he makes. I yeah. know he makes like these prank or like these show game show videos. I've never watched them. But I do know this. I know mm. enough about the world and how it works to understand. And you have to base your worldview on probabilities. Yeah. Right? Like we said earlier, if I go stroke the lion, mm. I'm probably going to get eaten. Yeah. <laughs> there may be examples where the lion doesn't eat me, but I think it's a good, a good worldview for me to hold for the preservation of my bloodline that I avoid the lions. So when you look at scenarios where you don't have all the information, you have to come up with the probability. So what is the probability that of the four or five or six people who ever make this show, which is the largest and most famous show amongst children in the world, which has a whole bunch of corporate sponsorships, a whole bunch of money behind it, taking into consideration the things I've said about how they try to get me to sell my soul, that one of them decides to very publicly do something which adheres with an agenda they are trying very Mm. hard to psyop the youth with. And then the leader of this channel, Mr. Whatever, he very calmly and very cucked, says, yeah, it's good. I support them. And did it because he knows he's going to get in a lot of trouble if he doesn't. Mm. And you're going to sit here and say that that's all a coincidence. And there was no corporate powers involved and no money involved. And no one said to him, listen, you better support this trans, this transition, because if you don't, you're going to lose your channel. Okay. And you're telling me that this all just happened organically and there was no plan at all. If you believe that, then you're an idiot. <laughs> then you're an idiot. And, and it's a psyop. And psyops are slow and incremental. And that's why a five-year-old who's watching it now, who doesn't even truly understand what's going on, by the time he's 15, 16, 17, when he's arguing, saying, well, no, because, you know, I know people who trained to change gender and they were happier than ever before. Mm. And I saw them before and then I saw them after and they were so happy and all their friends supported them. And that the psyop, they are after your kids. They are coming for your children everybody at home because it is your children that are the future which they want to control when you have kids and you love them and you love your wife and you look into your beautiful smiling daughter or son's face please understand that they are nothing but a tool for the matrix and they are coming for them they are coming for them and if that doesn't panic you and you don't worry about that and you sit and say oh well we'll just let them watch youtube oh it's just one of them became transgender oops shit just happens oops oops well then you're a dummy waiting to die it's funny how there are certain topics and certain things that if you were to have a stance on, it's like instant, instant cancellation, right? Could you take it from both sides, this topic specifically, or even they, people always say, how come you don't speak about Israel, Palestine? Yeah. I mean, yeah, Israel, Palestine. I'm like, from my perspective of my history of my background, I really don't have much skin in the game. Yeah, I'm not either i don't relate to either um i don't feel like i have to take a side here and if you don't take a side both sides come at you and said how come you don't take our side well this (laughs) no you're right and and just to quickly touch back on that i just had a thought regarding the the situation we were discussing previously Mm. we're not allowed to say mr beast's name so i won't say it but you can't say you can't (laughs) say mr beast you can't say mr beast Beast. no but here's the thing it's interesting 
if there was any honor amongst that group, and mm. I don't have a problem with this guy. I don't know this guy. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm more famous than him anyway. So we're going to probably meeting someday. I don't have a problem with him, but here's the thing that I find interesting. Let's remove the argument about transgenderism because mm. they're going to sit and say that it's not his fault. He's born in the wrong body, blah, blah. And that's a, that's a, that's a dumb shit hole. I don't even want to go down, but let's remove it. Me as a man of honor. I believe that now because of my amp massive influence, I have a responsibility and I'll admit this. Now there are clips of me that I made 10 years ago, which I don't think would be appropriate for 14 and 15 year olds to see mm. because I made them when I had no followers and no subscribers. And I was joking with my friends. And we were filming everything and it didn't matter. And now I understand with massive power comes massive responsibility. And I've had to create my message and be slightly more careful knowing that every single word I say is watched. That's, that's sensible for you to become more famous and then be more careful about certain things you say or how you say them is the sensible thing to do. So if I was a member of this group of people and I decided to do something which was obviously sexually related. It was regarding sex in general, and it was obvious for everyone to see. And it was something that was going to raise a lot of questions and it was going to involve sexuality amongst the lives of a bunch of people who shouldn't be thinking about sex yet. I would have enough honor to say, you know what? I've made enough money and I really need to do this. I resign mm. and I do it in private. Why would I do that publicly? Irregardless, please understand because they're going to argue this, not understanding I'm smarter than all of them irregardless of how important it is to do, irregardless of the fact that you believe it's essential, even if I agree with you that it's essential, even if I agree with you that you need to do this because you were born in the wrong body, even if I agree with all that, don't we all agree that doing something so obviously sexual for children to observe and question is something that shouldn't be happening? Yeah. So even if you do want to do that, and even if I agree you should do that, you should still resign unless it's a PSYOP. Unless you're going to sit here and argue the fact that you're trying to psyop the kids, which is what they'll do. Oh, but kids need to get used to the idea psyop. So you are psyoping. Oh, but kids need to get used to the idea and they don't need to be threatened by psyop. So you're admitting it's a psyop because if it wasn't a psyop, you would have resigned and done it privately. Why didn't you want to do it privately? You have enough money. You've been making these stupid videos for long enough. You can pay your rent, sir. Or sorry, not sir, ma'am. <laughs> But no, you want to sigh up the kids. If you actually discuss this whole topic, you'll see it's very obvious that they want to sigh up the kids and that's the end goal of it. And they'll sit there and then they'll try and do, because I'm a professional and I know exactly how these people think, they'll argue the psyop is okay. But why should I hide? I'm proud. So they'll argue. Then they'll start arguing for their psyop, not understanding that they're just admitting I'm right. I'm right. You're psyoping kids. I don't want any child under the age of 10 thinking about sex in any way. Changing sex, sex, dick, vagina. They have enough time for that as they grow old. They shouldn't be sitting there watching this and start going, what's going on? Why does he do that? And looking into it in general. The whole thing is haram, regardless of the fact whether you accept that he should become transgender or not. And that's the thing they don't understand. That's why they can't argue with me. I would love to sit down with these people. Bro. I would rip them <laughs> apart, which is why they're trying to keep me out of the club unless I shut up for their 50M. I mean, it's one of those things where I don't care what you do as well. I may not agree with it. Actually, I probably do disagree with it. But if you want to do whatever you want as an adult, it's your prerogative. Yeah. Do whatever you want. Yeah. Again, I don't agree, but I'm not in a position to tell you how to live your life. Don't indoctrinate my kids. 100%. Don't push it on my kids. That's 100%. not your place. These are conversations I should be having, yeah. not some random guy on the internet. 100%. You know, and I think that's the line for a lot of people. I feel like there's a lot of people where this is the line. I feel like a lot of people are waking up to this. Even people that may be considered extremely liberal. You know, a lot of even people within the city, single moms. They're like, look, I've been working my entire life trying to teach my son how to be a, a man. Yep. And now you're coming here and showing up and saying they don't have to be men anymore. And like, this is bullshit. Yeah. This is not your place to tell my kid how to grow up. And I think that's the line for a lot of people right now. So what happens when the line is crossed? That's the interesting conversation because even I don't know. Yeah. And, and another thing that people don't understand when I say that the matrix needs to crack, you do need some form of society. I mean, you yeah. do need some form of order. The order we have is corrupted. The order we have is wrong. It's not built on truth, but to a degree, it is a degree of order. It's not, it's not war outside in most places yet. So what happens when that line is finally crossed? And I feel like we are getting there, but I don't know if anyone's prepared for it. I prepare for it personally, but collectively, I don't, not sure what happens. And this is why I teach the things I teach. And I say so much how important it is to be geographically free and, and make money 
and be strong and be brave and be adaptable. And people think I'm saying all these things so they can get girls and buy Lambos. No, I'm saying all these things. So you can be the first one out of Saigon mm. because you don't want to try and be the last one. You don't want to be trying to get out when everyone else is trying to get out. You want to get out first and you need to think ahead. That takes money. It takes connections. It takes, you need a visa. You need another passport. You need a house to, you need things and all, and I've come up with the answers for me, of course, but then you end up, it's kind of interesting. We talk, I, I talk about globalists all the time and the yeah. elites and how they have all this money and how they'll watch nations burn and disappear to another nation, et cetera. And then I catch myself looking and going, what? That's you too. <laughs> Is that me <laughs> on my private jet with all my kids of, on my way to Switzerland to hide in the mountains in the bunker? Am I one of the, but you just get to a certain level of influence and money and power where you, you have the adaptability the common man doesn't have. The common man is stuck and tied to his land in one particular location, which is why the common man should be even more interested, mm. more interested in defending the ideals of his nation, more interested in defending the ideals of his town, his city, and his land, because you're stuck there. I'm sticking up for all this stuff. And I'm not even stuck anywhere. I can insult the West all day long and bounce. I can go live somewhere else. Most people can't. So it finds amazing to me that they'll just sit there and allow themselves to just be decimated. They'll just sit on the ship while it's on fire, waiting for it to sink. And it's because they're a coward and they'll get distracted by the Super Bowl and they'll watch Taylor Swift chug a beer and they'll get distracted by porn and distracted by garbage. And they'll just sit there. Yay, sports team waiting to die. Mm. And when I say die, I don't even mean it. Maybe you won't get assassinated. No, but your bloodline will be annihilated because your son will become a girl. That's what's going to happen. Or your son will get married to a woman who won't take his last name. What's the point in that? You are done. And it's because you sat there on your ass watching the Super Bowl like a dummy. Bro, the Super Bowl was on and I was on Twitter. I don't watch the Super Bowl. I don't watch that shit. And I was on Twitter and I was watching all the bombings in Gaza. Mm. I was like, bro, they're literally killing kids. And this isn't about Palestine, Israel, 1947. Cool. That's a long and detailed argument. They are killing children with bombs. I have a kid that age. Yeah. I see a kid missing her arm, a little girl, the same age as my daughter. And I, and I look on Twitter and it's just Super Bowl. It's like these people deserve the slavery they have. Is, I guess one of the things that happens when you when you sacrifice your own life, which to a degree I have, to try and wake people up, you get a huge degree of satisfaction for the people who understand and see the truth. And you're going to see, as big as you are now, as you get bigger, all the people who come up to you and say, you've helped me, it makes you feel amazing. But there's also a huge degree of resentment for the people who ignore you. I, I can't, you, part of you is like, are you out of your mind? Mm. I'm here trying to warn you that the ship is on fire and you're obsessed with the Super Bowl. You're just going to perish. And it's not because you are arrogant and want to be listened to. It's not because you're philanthropic and you really want to save their lives. It's not that. It's because these people who ignore you, who buy into the Matrix programming, are the ones they use to attack you with. What do they say in the Matrix? Anyone who's not unplugged can become an agent at any time. Mm. It's exactly that. The people who are not unplugged, the people who are still sitting there watching the Super Bowl and absorbing all the garbage are the exact ones who, when the MSM says something bad about you, repeat it. They're literally your enemies. They're agents of the matrix. And it's kind of annoying when you're sitting there going, well, they're blowing up children and you're still not aware. You still don't care. You're still watching the Super Bowl. When they say Matt did whatever or Andrew did whatever, you're going to start repeating it and defending it. It's kind of amazing to me that people will defend ideas. Andrew Tate's a human trafficker. Cool. They put it in the news. Some person says, I know Andrew Tate personally. He's not a human trafficker. I lived with him for years. Someone else says, he's a human trafficker. Why? Because the news told you? How do you even know? <laughs> Why are you defending this idea? Have you seen the case file? Did you ever live with me? Do you know me? No. The BBC printed it, and now you're defending it to the death. Like you know something. You don't know a fucking thing. And they're going to sit there and go, oh, but the BBC said, the BBC said, take the vaccine, dummy. Wake up. Why are you defending this idea? You don't even have any skin in the game. That's why when I see people who ignore the things we say, I'm not like, oh, I really want to help him. I don't give a shit. If you're an idiot, stay an idiot. It's, ah, you're on their team. You're genuinely the enemy of free thought and sovereignty and individualism. You're the kind of people who are going to march us into the concentration camp thinking you're doing the right thing because you can't think for yourself. Bro, I would love if I had power of God, let's say I was God for a day mm. or I was a ghost, I would go up into the sky and I would find all of the people who screamed to others to wear masks and I'd put them all in a room <laughs> and I'd say, two years ago, you were walking around screaming at your fellow man to wear a mask. You're no longer wearing a mask. Neither is anyone else. 
Have you even for a fraction of a second felt shame? Have you even looked in the mirror and goes, I was yelling at people to wear a mask and that was clearly unnecessary. I was psyoped. Do you have enough personal responsibility to understand that they fooled you and you were an agent of the matrix and helped them propagate their false worldview? You detrimented the lives of the people around you who you have in common. You have more in common with the people around you than you do the elites who gave you this idea. You damaged their lives running around like a banshee being an idiot. Have any of these people even looked in the mirror and felt guilty? No, none of them even feel shame. They're just walking around now, normal, do, 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 waiting for the next thing. They haven't even sat there and goes, I was a fool and I helped the matrix get everyone locked in their houses. They don't even have any personal responsibility, no shame, no guilt, no honor, nothing. These are the people who would take the 50M. They don't give a fuck. They'll say whatever they're told. Give me the 50M. Yeah, transgenderism's great. Yeah, I'll put a wig on. Da-da. Honorless, empty people. And the devil loves, what they say? Devil loves idle hands. Mm -hmm. I would argue the devil loves idle souls, empty souls, empty minds. If I could find all of the people, I'm not a violent man. I'm capable, but I'm a nice man. If I could find the three or four people who tried to yell at me to wear a mask right now in the world, I might slap them in the face. I might go up to them and say, you don't remember me, but two and a half years ago in the gas station, you told me to put a mask on. Bam. Because you're an idiot. They're idiots. And it's scary that this many people are walking through the earth just waiting for the next program to be injected into their mind so they can come and attack you and me and their fellow man. They're not going to attack the elites. They're going to be told something by the elites and attack us. One day, Matt, I guarantee there's going to be a protest outside your podcast studio or whatever. And you see a bunch of matrix-minded slaves nice. scre yeah, not, yeah, <laughs> screaming whatever they were told to scream. Yeah. And they're going to be like, <laughs> what the fuck is going on? I'm going to call my mom. Mom, I yeah. made it. Yeah. <laughs> you know? I'll be arrested soon. <laughs> They're here. It happened. Oh, crazy. <laughs> I feel like there's a populace of people that are waking up, though. I do. I think there are people out there that may be the uh, mask uh, pushers that are now going, hey, because the PSYOP at that year, at that time, it was maybe the most well-orchestrated PSYOP ever. Yep. They said, if you don't do this, you're going to kill grandma. Yeah, bro. And if you have, even if it wasn't real, even if you didn't believe it, for that 1% chance that could be true, yep. some people were willing to make a little bit of sacrifice. Yep. And I can almost understand those people because maybe they didn't believe it themselves. But what if you're wrong? Yep. And I am responsible for killing grandma or not even my grandma, your grandma. Yep. And for that, I think that's why what they did during COVID was maybe the most evil thing I've ever done. Because they literally said, comply or you're killing grandma. And that makes me hate the people that enforced it on us much more than the people that complied. Because in that situation, the people that complied, it's a really tough balance. I understand. You, you know what I mean? Like, yes, some of them were over crazy. And yes, the people that were sitting at the restaurants forcing you to wear it between the door and the... It was stupid. I think most people agree it was ridiculous. But I think for a lot of them, it, it's a tough sell. Again, when they wave grandma in your face and said, this is going to save your grandma. Yeah. How, how do you say no to that sometimes? You I, know? I understand. And I know what you're saying. And it's also, you made a good point about the people who enforce it, come up with the most evil agenda, the most evil possible justification yeah. they can. But they always have. Mm. I mean, every single thing they've done, if you look at anything that has resulted in the death of millions of lives, any war, name a war that wasn't built on a lie, mm. name one, millions of lives lost, millions of lives affected by extension, fathers lost, brothers lost, sons lost, for what? For a lie. And what was the point of the lie? Money. I don't think many people understand truly how evil the agenda is. I wouldn't, if I had a button right here, I have a lot of money, right? If I had a button right here and I could press the button and someone random on earth would die and I'd get money, I wouldn't press it because I'd feel bad because I don't yeah. want the money. But there are people out there who will not just press that button. They'll, 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 they'll sleep on the button for the rest of their lives. <sighs> they'll just sleep on it permanently as arm manufacturers make weapons and destroy random farmers in some random country under the guise of freedom. And they'll make up a lie and they'll just justify it somehow and they'll sleep easy at night. It's truly evil. And... If you don't understand how evil and how dark the world can be and how dark and evil some of these people are, then you're going to have a rude awakening because they don't give a shit about anything but size themselves. They don't care about you and they don't care about your kids and they don't care about the people they kill and they don't care about the people lives they affect. They never feel guilt. They never look in the mirror and feel bad. 
This is why we need God more than ever. Because mm. if you don't have God, you don't have a soul and you don't feel guilty. If I had started a war in Libya, for example, or a for example, a revolution, <laughs> I would look in the mirror now and say, I sh- why did I, all those, all that death, all that destruction, a destabilized nation, slavery, all this I've done. Why did I do it? Votes, money. What did I do that for? I shouldn't have done that. I'd feel bad. Yeah. But they don't. Isn't that, that's remarkable to me. So I can't imagine living with a soul that dark or that black. And when I try to, because as a professional, you need to understand your enemy. I try to think with a soul that dark and that black. And it's difficult for me to do, but the conclusions I come to are scary even to me. That's why I believe they're going to kill me sooner or later. Like, what, what's the other option? They'll kill everyone else. It's true. They'll kill everyone else. And I'm here telling the truth. They're not going to get rid of me. I, I don't, that's why I won't put the headphones on. <laughs> See how I, I keto my way out of that. But, but it's just like, it's a scary conclusion to come to. And I... And for the common man, there's one set of solutions and one set of answers. But if you're truly public enemy number one, I don't know what the true answer is besides shutting up and selling your soul. I guess maybe I should have fucked Taylor Swift. But <laughs> I refuse to do it. It's scary. It's scary the world we live in. I mean, it is because, again, if people with money and influence can barely escape or maybe not escape, yep. what does a regular guy at home do? That's and right. they said, We're gonna, you're going to lose your job. You're going to lose your pension. Yep. You're going to lose your ability to possibly see your kids. Mm-hmm. That's right. I'm struggling. And you're right. You're completely right. You can have the highest levels of influence. Let, let me give an example. Let's look, let's look at a few easy examples. Who's getting wrecked with the legal system currently? Oh. Elon and Trump. Yeah. They can't escape this garbage. So you're right. What, what hope does the common man have? Well, there's only two options. There's God and there's numbers. You need enough people to understand the truth and you need God, which is why when you talk about how you need everybody to understand the truth, why the people who don't understand the truth and watch the Super Bowl, I find so repulsive. Because I understand they are the ones who are impeding our progress because they're the ones who are refusing to listen to anything. For President Trump right now, he just got a fine from the in New York, $433 million. I think that happened yesterday. And then $83.3 million for his um, E. Jean Carroll case. And then 91 other indictments going on. And let's be real. If he was not running for president right now, none of this would be happening. Correct. And I don't think anyone can argue that. I don't think anyone thinks that if he was, if he wasn't running, all these legal troubles would happen. If you think that and if you believe it, then obviously as is trying to keep people from running. Do you feel like, because you haven't lived in America in a long time, yep. but you speak and you think about American politics often. Yep. Do you think like you're connected enough to American society being so separated for so long? I think American culture is world culture to a degree. It's all mm. Western culture. I was born there. So yeah, I do feel connected. I think what happens in America affects the world. Personally, my view on Trump is I'm, I'm massively in favor of him. Do I believe he can dismantle and fix the bureaucracy of the system? No. No. Do I believe he can save the West? No, he can slow it down. However, it would be a culture win for him to win. Yeah. It would inspire the culture and it would inspire patriotism and it would inspire masculinity because he's a masculine man. And as a whole, I believe those are the number one weapons against the matrix. I believe innate, natural, God-given masculinity is how we defend ourselves against the matrix. If you were to say to me, how do you beat them? I'd say, be a man. Mm. If all the men were men, this would be a lot harder. Psyops wouldn't work. And making us scared wouldn't work. Making us cowards wouldn't work. It would all be a much harder thing to do. So I'm praying for Trump. Do I believe they're going to let him win? Well, they're clearly trying to stop it. In this democracy, that you know, democracy, num- number one democracy of the world. <laughs> and then there's two scary scenarios, right? There's scary scenario number one where they don't let him win. Yeah. And all of the repercussions of that and all of the cope you'll see in the Senate from the Republicans who go, this is unacceptable. And then do nothing. Do nothing. Of course. So it's just going to be word salad. And then there's the ones where they, the one where they let him win and he tries his very best. And then eventually he's out of office and who comes next? Who knows? And especially if he he makes things better a little bit for a little while and then he's out and another idiot comes in and it's all wrecked. I feel like it's the last hope. And I don't know how, I don't know what his plans are if he gets in, but unless they're enormous, I don't know if he can, if he can stop the decline of the West and empires come and empires fall. The West is a declining empire. It's on its way out. And then the scary thought of that is who replaces America as the world leader Mm. and will the world even be better or will it be worse? You know, or we can enter this new, like we discussed earlier, this technological age where AI is the ruler and there's some server somewhere in Angola in a bunker that controls everything. Who knows? 
Because usually when an empire falls, usually when a king falls, a new king takes hold. But I think we might be entering a stage of technology where it's not going to be a human that takes control of anything. There'll be a humans who perhaps use machines to control everything. And it's only a matter of time to the machines control the humans. And that's what's going to happen. Skynet's coming <laughs> and we're toast. And how do you defend yourself against all of these things? Well, I think Darwin said in, in his book, it's not the strongest of the species that survives. It's the most adaptable. Mm. How do you adapt to these changes that are happening in the world? And I like to consider myself a person with solutions. I don't want to be one of the people who just complains and points out what's going to happen without a solution. And the solutions I come to are pretty boring when I say you need to have a bunch of money and important friends and a bunch of visas and a bunch of passports. But it is the primary solution in regards to adaptability. Not many people can go live on Fiji. I could if I wasn't in this matrix attack. Mm. But that's the point. You get too big, you get in a matrix attack. But let's say I had my money and I'd shut up and there's a nuclear war. I can live in Fiji. How? Well, I can get a private plane instantly and I can go and live there because I have a residence in Fiji. How do you have a residence? In Fiji? Like there's things you can do. Yeah. You have to prepare for the worst, which goes back into the question you asked me earlier. Am I paranoid? Probably. And there'll be a day when everyone's like, thank God you're paranoid. Mm. It's like, I'm the most paranoid guy. Yeah, perhaps. But that's what preparedness is. But for the common man and the average person, what are the solutions to these problems? I'm open to hearing yours because unless we talk about people and collectivism and people waking up and to some degree revolution and people understanding that everything's a scam, that's great. But I'm I'm really scared of the new system they build off the back of this broken one. That's what I'm most afraid of. I mean, I think people want to, especially in America, people want to revert back to kind of how it was yeah. where people felt like they had freedom. Even if it wasn't true or not, at least you felt yeah. like you had freedom. And right now, somehow, Trump went from the guy that um, that well, ex that seemed to be the extreme guy. Yeah. He's now the man of the people. Yeah. He's what the people want, and you can feel it in the vibe and the energy in pretty much everywhere you go. It's he's become the cool person to support. Yeah. He's changed the culture, the the society, and it's if Trump wins then people will feel like the people have won. I loved how you said it. it's a societal win. It's a cultural win. Yeah. It's a cultural win. Yeah. Because finally, for the first time in many years, it feels like the people have a win. Because we're like yearning for a win. Isn't we it, just keep on getting stomped on over it, and over again. 100%. Isn't it amazing that in a democracy that the people can feel so disconnected to the leaders? Mm. Like, how is this a democratic society? Nobody agrees with any of these leaders. No. Who are they? How did they get there? Why do they do the things they do? Who's telling them to do it? Why do they vote how they vote? Nobody's happy with them at all in any Western nation, not just America, in any Western nation, every democratic nation, everyone's pissed off. Yeah. And somehow they have all the control and all the power. And then you sit and you start to look into, well, how does a democracy work? Ah, money. Ah, I get it now. Money. Well, who has all the money? The elites who are above the government. Okay, well, then it's all a fucking scam from the beginning. It's it's kind of interesting. I was in um, Belarus like five or six years ago. And I couldn't believe that Minsk was cleaner mm. and more beautiful than Bucharest. Because I expected it to be kind of like Bucharest, rough around the edges a bit, you know? And it was very clean, very nice, very well organized, perfect pavements, very beautiful city. I was talking to a Belarusian girl and she was like, well, yeah, you have democracy in, in Romania. So if they want to fix a road, they have to go to the, the parliament and discuss fixing the road. And then a contract goes to a company and then X amount of money gets stolen. And then that, he goes, if Lukashenko drives on the road and there's a hole and he says, fix that hole, it's fixed. Mm. <laughs> That's it. Now, I'm not advocating for kingdoms. I'm not advocating for a complete lack of democracy. I'm not because that is a 50-50 coin flip. You might have a good leader. Yeah. You might have a bad leader. Of course. But there are certainly certain countries in the world now which are benefiting from the fact that you know who's in charge. In the West, I ask myself often, who, who's in charge of me? Mm. Who is my leader? Do you think Joe Biden's your leader? I don't think anyone thinks that. Yeah, th that's, that's a crazy thing too, right? So who's in charge? Mm. Like, don't you think the first thing you would do if you walked onto a boat or you, where's the captain? Yeah. We need to fix this boat. Who's the captain? Don't know. Don't know. Don't know. Maybe him. They say it's him. But someone's calling him on the phone all day. Who calls him? Don't know. Is that person on the boat? Don't know. Well, they're on another boat. Well, they're on land. Like, what's going on? We don't even know who's in charge of us. And if you try and find out, you end up in jail. Mm. So it's kind of scary and very interesting because I think for responsibility, you need to have accountability. For some, for, to sit and say, okay, who's responsible for this mess? That person needs to be accountable for the mess. There is a mess here. 
it's this person's fault. But we somehow have this weird system where no matter what bad happens, they Aikido the accountability to someone else. No matter what good happens, they try and take accountability for it, even though they didn't even do it. Who's responsible for everyone, everything? Nobody knows. But who's in charge and who gets to decide? The people. Yeah. I sense scam. Something strange is going on. I mean, when I, I last week we had the Tucker Carlson Vladimir Putin interview. Yeah. And I, I found that whole process fascinating. More than the interview, I found that week fascinating. Yeah. Because leading up to it, everyone said, Tucker, Russian spy, Russian spy, Putin's lapdog, blah, 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 blah. And then they went nuts. Hillary Clinton was on the news. Yeah. Um, they just lost their shit about Tucker potentially interviewing Vladimir Putin. And then the interview happened and it was not as bombastic as people expected. Yeah. Actually, Putin put himself as I'm a Russia first guy. Yeah. I'm going to force you to learn Russian history. And this is how I think. And on behalf of the Russian people, I'm going to speak. And we as Americans were waiting for Putin to tell us our system is broken. Yep. We were waiting for, for Putin to tell us, look at your policies. They're broken. Yeah. We were looking for that validation from the opposing leader. Yep. And I'm like, two things. One, we are so lacking of leadership and we are so sick of losing that we are we're waiting for the enemy to, to tell, tell us we're winning. Yep. And two, there is no way Joe Biden could sit there for two hours <laughs> and do an interview. Yeah. <laughs> no, but that's the thing that's interesting because Putin is idolized mm. by many conservatives in the West not because they love Russia, but because he is competent and he's nationalistic. Yes. Two simple things. He's competent. He knows what he's doing and he loves his country. Isn't it amazing that in the West, you have to idolize the enemy leader for the basic tenets of competence and nationalism. As America, you should have a competent nationalistic leader and you shouldn't have any interest in Putin. But you're right. The conservatives and many people who understand how the world works was looking for Putin to tell the truth about how broken the West mm -hmm. is. And he didn't do that. And they were very disappointed in the interview because they thought that he was interested in coming along and educating the American public on the on the insanity of the American yeah. system. But he made it also very clear that America is going to treat him like a forever enemy. And he's happy with how the system currently works in America. Now. Yeah. He just said after the interview, he said a few days ago, I want Joe Biden to be president. He's a good, he's a, he's a very, he's a very, uh, he's a very seasoned statesman and mm. he's been in politics for a long time. What he's saying is I want America to fail. Yeah. Everything he's, he refused to tell Americans the truth because he doesn't want to interrupt his enemy when they're making a mistake. Mm. And he wants Biden to be president because he loves a Biden presidency because he's not afraid of America anymore. So if your enemy and you could argue about whether America and Russia should even be enemies in the first place. But if your enemy is advocating for you to continue down the path you're going, doesn't that say a lot in regards to the path you're currently undertaking? And yeah, you're right. It's kind of crazy that Americans were sitting there looking for the leader of a foreign nation to highlight the insanity of America because there's not a single American leader who will do it or you go deeper down the rabbit hole, can do it. Mm. I've always wondered, like me as stubborn as I am, if I wanted to run for politics, would I be able to say the things I want to say? Because there's many barriers on the way, right? Could, first things first, could I even get in? Mm. Because they know I'm a wild card. So they do everything they can to stop me getting in. They'd hit me with the MSM and there'd be some scandal and I'm a human trafficker. I go to jail. They'd investigate my money and they'd say I'm a tax evader and they'd take all my money off me and they'd take my house and they'd fuck me every way along the way so that I can't even get that seat. They'd make sure I don't. And all of the big money would be behind my opponent. My opponent would have favorable media, a, a tour bus, a private jet, because that's how it works. It's all about money. So there's no way I could win. But let's imagine I had huge popular support and I somehow won. And then I get into Congress or the Senate or whatever. And I sit there and I know the truth about this insanity. And I try and tell the truth. What happens? You get the call or someone comes to you and says, you can't say that. Or they just don't turn your microphone on or you lose your seat on the next run and you don't even get a chance. It's very interesting to me because I, I, maybe I'm optimistic. I like to believe there's some semblance of humanity left in these leaders, but every time they vote, they're just, they just, they cuck. And I'm like, what's going on here? I'd love to try myself and find out, but I'm, I probably wouldn't like what happens. I probably find out like, ah, I get it, but it's, it's the whole system's fucking broken. It's scary. 
And then, like I said, because I want to be solution oriented, how do you, how do you tell people to prepare for this besides telling them to be adaptable and to a degree run away? Because that's what it is. And like, I speak to many Americans and they say, you need to get some land and get a farm and learn to grow your own food. Mm. Bro, you think the feds can't raid a farm? Yeah. Are you, are you stupid enough to think that if you get a farm and you grow strawberries, you're going to be okay? Then you're an idiot. The feds can raid a farm just the same. If you think you own that farm, don't pay your property tax. They'll take it off. You, you don't own anything and they'll come get you anyway. So you have God and you can believe in God and pray for him to save you. You have adaptability where you can run away from the biggest problems. But besides that, where's the world going? I don't, I don't have an answer. It's scary. I'm trying to work it out. Well, I think number one, I think an Andrew Tate for Congress would be an extremely interesting time. I think that'd be a lot of fun. Trump, VP, <laughs> let's go. <laughs> let's go. I'll go to court. Look at them. I'm taking all my money. Let's go again. Because the longer, the more I get close to politics and be around politicians and kind of see behind the veil of politics. Number one, it's all narrative control. Yep. All politics is how can you control the messaging and the narrative at that moment? And the longer you can control the narrative, the higher probability that you have to win. You know, it's interesting you said about narrative control. We talk about the fact that we're in a war and we say we're in a culture war. Mm. War has always ever only been narrative control. Mm. War, the primary objective of war is to demoralize your enemy so they will accept your narrative. So in a traditional hot war, you'll turn up with tanks, they'll turn up with tanks. If you win, you're going to get the enemy. They're going to be afraid of you. They're going to be demoralized and they will accept your narrative regarding your culture, your views, your currency, your religion, whatever it is. If two religions go to war, the objective is to destroy the enemy so they are, ab absorb your religion. They accept your religion because they're demoralized. So it's demoralization and control of the narrative. And even in hot wars, the primary objective is to get control over a certain geographical area to control the populace so you can tell that populace what to think and force them to adhere to certain ideals. We're in a war right now. You just talked about narrative control. That's exactly what it is. They're yeah. trying to demoralize us so they can give us narratives that we're forced to accept. They're trying to control, we say about controlling a geographical area with a hot war. Okay, it's not a hot war, but they're trying to control the internet and control information because it's an information war. Alex Jones, Infowars, he's nailed it. They're trying to control intellectual property and control property online to be able to purport certain narratives to a demoralized populace. We're in a very active war right now. Yeah. And just because there's no guns firing, well, there are, but just because you don't see guns firing, you think you're not in a war. You are the subject of a war ongoing. There are two teams fighting right now above your head. And depending on which team wins depends on the narratives you're going to end up holding and your children are going to end up holding. So this is what's so interesting to me when we talk about masculinity and cowardice. If you understand that a war is going on, surely if you're half a man, you're going to look at the two teams and you're going to choose one and you're going to go join the team you believe in. Only a true coward would sit down and be quiet and say, let the two teams fight it out. And whichever team wins, I'll just agree with them, mm. which is what a lot of people are doing. But surely you should sit and see that this war can't be avoided. Yes, I'm suffering because I ran my mouth too much. Yes, they're going to try and put me back in jail. Probably going to succeed. I'll be back with the cockroaches. Fine. I decided to make that decision. I'll smile knowing that I lived true to my heart. So I, I'm not a coward. But if you're sitting there being a coward thinking, oh, maybe I can avoid the, avoid the fight. You're really a fool. Because if you say, I refuse to fight, you don't end the war. You just end your control over the outcome of the war. And all you're doing is handing your entire fate to other people. And perhaps the good guys will win. And then you can sit there and be happy. But you'll know you were a bitch. Or perhaps the bad guys win. And you're going to wish you fought while you had a chance. But you can't avoid this fight. Mm. I run my mouth and I'm in a lot of trouble. Cool. But you're, it, the war is coming for all of us. I don't know why anyone's sitting there saying, oh, maybe I shouldn't talk. You can't escape it. If you don't want to tell the truth, you're just going to end up a casualty of war. You're going to get there anyway. So and I'll ask you, if we lose this culture war, won't you feel better you tried? Well, and I don't even think it's a culture war. I think we are actively in war. Uh, I don't think, back in the day, we used to be in analog war where people sit around and they shoot each other. Yep. That is now the show part of the war. Yep. If, you, if you become Instagram famous, and you have to show people that you made a lot of money. You got to go rent a Lamborghini yeah, yeah. and stand and flex in front of it. Otherwise, no one's going to think that you're famous. Yeah. That's what the physical war is. 
we're in a digital age where analog doesn't mean anything anymore. It's messy, it's dirty, it takes a lot of time, and it's, it's hard to clean up. Everything about our life is digital. To think that war is analog is ridiculous. We are actively in a digital war, and we're fighting over propaganda, over information, over influence. Yeah. And that's why people that are against the narrative, like you, like me, like guys like Tucker Carlson, yeah. um, Alex Jones, yeah. even if you don't agree with everything that everyone says, they are actively fighting against the mainstream propaganda. Yep. And that's why I say you're a general. That's why Tucker is a general. That's why Alex Jones is a general. Because even amongst one side of the war, all the generals aren't the same. They all have their nuances, their of way of communicating, the way they have to build their, their armies behind them. Not all generals are the same, but they're all fighting the same side. It's good and it's evil. And, 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 but this is my question to all the, and I guess this is a question to the men at home. If you accept the war is ongoing and you accept that it's for the fate of your bloodline, mm. how do you live with yourself as a man if you're not trying to make the good team win? Perhaps we're all going to die. Perhaps we're all going to lose. Perhaps you'll all end up in jail alongside me. But don't you feel like you'd be happier as a man if you stood there and said, I fought my hardest against them. And I tried to save the children and my bloodline and my society and my land and the people I cared about. I tried my best and they got me, but I tried. How are you going to live if you just don't try? And I find it amazing that these people out there who think that, okay, if I avoid the fight and I take the money or if I avoid the fight and I have the peace and quiet, if I avoid the fight, I have the Super Bowl. How broken are you in your soul to think those things matter more than doing what you know is right? Look at humanity. It's always been men sacrificing their lives for what they know is right. I say I sacrificed my life. I did a little bit of jail and I've lost my money or some of my money. Boo-hoo. I haven't had to charge at gunfire yet. Mm. <laughs> yet. Yet. But there are men who were braver than I fighting for ideas they understood less than I understand the current idea. And perhaps their fight wasn't even as important as this mm. one. I would argue there's been times where men put, took up arms to resist the invading horde. And if they let that horde come in and control their society, they would have been less oppressed than we're about to be. And they sacrificed their life. And we have men here at home going, oh, yeah, well, maybe, I don't know. This, this mass pandemic of cowardice is how they're getting away with this, which is why I believe I've said this a bunch of times. I also believe it's the reason they attacked me. They find masculinity so threatening because masculinity protects. I won't sell my soul because I'm a man. That's it. I am the man. And I don't care if I go destitute. I'll knock on your door and ask for a meal and I'll continue to walk on my way towards wherever I'm headed as a man. I'm not going to sell my soul for money ever. And anybody who's sitting here trying to avoid this battle, all I'll say to you is that there's going to come a time perhaps when the battle's over and we've lost, that you're going to wish you you started saying the right thing. Because I feel like that time's running out. Yeah. I feel like we have a certain, a few years left where there's any semblance of freedom and also any semblance of social mobility. It's soon going to be so polarized. I've said this on a podcast a long time ago. There's going to be have-nots and have-yachts. It mm. really is going to get there. You have a certain amount of years to get money or get a network or tell the truth before they finally put the schism in the world and you have the AI serfs who are controlled by their facial recognition and you have the elites who, who don't have to listen anymore and time is running out. I feel like, I feel like this year is maybe the most important year. I really do. Yeah. Because if the whole world is watching to see what happens with President Trump, yeah. whole world is because guys, the populist leaders of places like Pakistan, who were waking up and they were making a difference and they were improving their condition of life and national was, was rising with Imran Khan yeah. crushed. Yeah. Guys like in Brazil with Bolsonaro, who they were feeling nationalist again. They, they were defying the establishment. And they were pushing against the COVID agenda and then crushed. And then now everyone's like, all right, two of the bigger populations on opposite sides of the world, they didn't survive it. Even in Poland, and what's going on over there? Oh, Poland has fallen to the left. That That's is mind bending. They were they were making it. They were surviving. People were happy, and they just crumbled so fast. Bro. It, it what, what was it like four years and boom? It's just like that, bro. I'm selling everything I own in Warsaw. 
I believed in Poland. I put yeah. a lot of money in Poland. A lot of people thought they were the ones in Europe that were going to make the stand. Yep. And if they survive it, there's hope for the rest of Europe. Done. And they didn't, they, it happened so fast. It, it, and that's, and that's what's scary because Patrick bet David, he made a video explaining that. I think, I don't know the exact numbers. 42% of the world population has mm. an election this year. Yeah. Or something like that. There's, yes. there's the largest Muslim country has an election. America has an election. Mm. The entire world has elections in the same year. I think it's unprecedented with the number of Isn't that people who get to vote. And some people see that as a massive opportunity. And I guess it is. But I see that, I'll be honest with you, as a power grab. Yeah. I see that as a power grab. I think there's a global power grab that's going to take place this year. I think that everyone who should win isn't going to win. I think that it's going to be the final nail in the coffin for freedom and individual liberty. I think they're going to throw me in a jail cell for a long time for talking too much. I think that anyone else who speaks up is going to start getting thrown in a jail cell. I think the people who understand what's happening are going to be too scared to speak because they're cowards. And I think that once they have absolute control, they're going to implement AI and CBDCs. And I think we're all fucked. That's, that's what I think. And, and, and I th the only answer to that that I have found, I want to make this clear as well, because a lot of people ask about my reversion to Islam. The only kind of nations i see which worship anything above money are the muslim nations mm. i think they're the only nations who sit and say there's something more important than money no we will not teach lgbt to children we don't care about what money you offer us or what sanctions you put on us that is haram they seem to be the last people with anything that they worship above money because if you only worship money eventually you're going to end up controlled and corrupted and that's why i think islam is one of the last resistances to this insanity and perhaps you can move to Qatar and you can worship God and you can pray five times a day like you're supposed to and you can have a very happy life. But outside of that, I'm struggling to find answers. You can go to Fiji and hide on a tropical island and eat coconuts perhaps, but not everybody can do that. It's a very small island. It's scary. And I think a, a, a huge power grab is coming. And once they cement that power, anybody who tries to talk against it is in a lot of trouble. It's really scary. And we don't want to fear porn people, but that's the reality of the world we live in right now is that if they can take down Donald Trump, then, and they've taken down Imran Khan and they've taken out Bolsonaro. Again, these guys were ridiculously popular yeah. in their own countries and they were all taken down for corruption, for taking bribes, for taking a painting. And because they called out and they said it in Bolsonaro that he led an insurrection or a violent revolt. And then you see what's happening here in the country, not here because we're in Romania. <laughs> When you see things what's happening happen here, bro, States, trust me, they things happen here. Because I was in the cab coming to this hotel, and we were told him that we were from America, and he was like, oh, "What do you think about Joe Biden?" He asked me. Yeah. I was like, "Oh man, I don't think he's awake." And he's like, "Yeah, do you think Trump can win?" Because even people here, yeah. they know that if Trump loses, it's over for everybody. Yep. He's kind of this last man standing type of deal. Absolutely. And now you see five hundred, six hundred million dollars in lawsuits against him so do we survive this well this is the thing that's interesting so then you have to find answers so the solutions i've i've come up with in my mind of course are money because money is power mm. i want people to understand that when i talk about we talk about how money is the root of all evil money is also the root of all good money is money is the vested time and interest of other humans mm. if you have a bunch of money you have the stored energy of other people and i'll give you a very simple example i have money so i can get somebody to sweep my floor I have their stored time and energy in a note or, or on a bank balance where I can make them sweep a floor for as many hours as I so choose because I can afford to pay them. It's the stored time and energy of other people. So for evil to be done, it requires the time and energy of humans. And for good to be done, it requires the time and energy of humans. So money is like gunpowder. It can be used for good. It can be used for bad. It's like germ theory. You can save people's lives or you can create a pathogen that decimates a populace. So it, it can go both ways. Money is certainly an answer because if you're completely broke, it's hard for you to influence other people and influence the world by extension. So money is super important. And the other thing I think is important is fraternity and brotherhood and living for something larger than just money itself. That's why I said about the Islamic nations live for God. And I think if you look at any period of human history, one of the things that gives me solace in this insanity is that I feel like men have always believed that the world is ending because mm. we're looking at it right now saying, society's over it's finished and i feel nervous about that and i genuinely lose sleep about that sometimes i don't know how people sleep so easily at night watching the super bowl there's times i wake up in the middle of the night and i'm like we're fucked mm. and i can't sleep but i feel like 
During the 60s, there were men who felt that way about the hippie revolution. And during World War II, of course, they felt like the world was ending. And I'm sure Vienna felt like the world was ending when the Mongol horde arrived. And I feel like people have always felt like the world is ending. I think if you're a man and you're masculine and you're protective, you're always going to feel like danger is coming. And the world always forms and we continue and humanity does manage to survive and, and progress. But it's always been a band of brothers. It's always been masculinity and fraternity, which has resisted evil. It's always been the enemies here. Who's on my team? Here's my gang. Here's my army. Here's my guys. Let's get our swords and let's go fight for it. And I feel like it's also more important than ever that people who are on the right side work together. And Patrick Bet David said this. He said, the leaders are finding the other leaders. And that's true. I think it's more important than ever that we do podcasts together, that mm-hmm. other people who agree with us, we do podcasts and we amplify our voices. I think there has to be some degree of unity in the mission. And besides making a bunch of money because money is power and besides fraternity for people who are like-minded, I think those are our last chances. Those are the only chances we have. And I do believe we can slow the spread COVID, mm. COVID talk. Yeah. We can resist the insanity long enough, at least. The for new them, norm. The, the, yeah. yeah. <laughs> we can resist the insanity long enough, at least, for them to build a new system on the back of this revolution, if there is one, or adjust the current system enough for life to still be livable. One of the things that's kind of interesting is, I find, as like being a cultural leader, one of the things that's most interesting about it is, whenever I get any hate, which is actually very rare for me, people yeah. talk about like the fact that I'm a hated person, but... 98% of the internet loves me. I really believe that. I yeah. very rarely see hate comments. Very rarely. And I've never met anyone in person who dislikes me. But man or woman. Women love me too. Mm. They're like, yeah, you're right. Da, 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 da. But when I do see some idiot posting something stupid, I sit and say, it's kind of crazy that I'm trying to help him. He's so ignorant and so stupid. He doesn't realize I'm fighting for his freedom. You know, it's kind of like you're trying to drag him, yeah. drag the horse to water. And they're like, no, you're stupid. It's like, no, you're going to die. I'm trying to, you're trying to help the people who dislike you. It's kind of weird. I don't know if you've ever had that yet. No, it happens part. all the time. And I tell people, look, whether you agree with my ideas or not, the reality is I'm fright. I'm fighting for your right to have your shit idea. 100%. I don't agree with your idea. I think you're stupid. I think you're, doesn't make any logical sense. But I'm still fighting for your right to have that idea to say those things that I completely disagree with. Yeah. I'm still fighting for your right. Yeah. And the people on the other side, they're fighting for their right only. Yeah. I'm fighting for your ability to have those bad ideas. I don't agree with you. You don't agree with me. That's fine. But I'm trying to preserve this idea that we can have competing opinions. Yeah. Because only through debate, through discussion, through varying as various of ideas can the great ideas really form. Absolutely. And I don't pretend to be right on everything. I don't want you to agree with everything I say. If anything, please disagree with me. Absolutely. Because it shows to me that I'm not living in an echo chamber. Completely. I, and, you, and you need both sides. You're right. Mm-hmm. Because equilibrium is always going to be the, the, the middle of both sides, right? So like if you have a seesaw, if you want it balanced, you need X amount on this side and X amount on that side. So you shouldn't be afraid of any idea as long as it's open and possible to dis- mm. discuss. It gets scary when you remove one side of the weight and it's not allowed to be discussed. Well, then it gets skewed, right? If, if we're allowed to openly discuss and openly talk and I'm allowed to say the things I truly believe and I won't be canceled for it, then I don't fear feminism yeah. and I don't fear LGBT and I don't fear transgenderism. I don't fear any of these people. Sit them down at a table with me and I will decimate them in real time. And I will do it so that everybody understands I am right because I know I am right and God knows I'm right. And there's no way they can beat me in an argument because it's pretty fucking simple. I have a dick and you have a vagina. It's done. Mm. And I'll I'll say it, done. But if I'm not allowed to talk, well, that's how they get control. And that's why they censor. And that's why it's so scary. So you're right. We're not afraid of their ideas. We just want to be able to talk openly. Yes. They don't want us to talk because they know they're going to lose, which proves they're wrong. Yeah. And they're not even smart enough to look in the mirror and go, why am I so afraid of him talking? Well, it's because I'm incorrect. Hmm. That's the truth of it. Yeah. I mean, especially in the school systems, when I think about um, LGBTQ+, TI plus QA. And when you think about all these ideas and they're talking about it in school, the teachers are allowed to promote these ideas to their kids, but they can't, the teachers aren't allowed to pray in school. Yep. And I think that's the biggest knock for me. If you're going to allow one, you got to allow the other. Well, because absolutely. there's balance. Of completely. But God is always going to be the final resistance to insanity, mm. which is what I said about the Islamic countries, because there's always has to be a line. Money, can, money. If money can corrupt, you'll agree with anything because money can be printed 
And if the, if the idea is on the side of money or if money is on the side of idea, you'll agree with anything. The only thing that's ever going to stop you is if you get to a religious conviction. Mm. Only God is going to get to a point where he says, it doesn't matter how much you pay me. It doesn't matter what you make me believe. It doesn't matter what the AI machine does. It doesn't matter how you've psyoped me and indoctrinated me. It doesn't matter how long you've been trying to convince me this is true. I know that my holy book and the God I believe in says this is wrong, so I refuse to believe. Only God is the final barrier to the absolute slave mind insanity which is why they fear God, which is why they don't want to teach children about religion. Children are the most susceptible and the most vulnerable and the most programmable people in a populace. So you have to be very careful when you analyze the ideas they're trying to purport to children because they know children are the most susceptible to believing things. They're also the most susceptible to believing fallacy. Mm. It's kind of interesting. We don't teach children things that life will ensure they understand is true. You don't teach them about taxes or things that they're going to learn the reality of. Money they're, management, yeah, they're fiscal a hard, responsibility. Yeah, because they're a hard reality that they're no. going to have to experience. So we let life teach them that. Mm. So we don't care. But we don't let life teach them these other crazy ideas because if we did, they'd reject the crazy ideas. No, we indoctrinate mm. the young children with the ideas that they'd naturally reject otherwise. If we, if we deleted the idea of LGBT garbage from school... And we let a child grow up to the age of 18 in a normal functioning society, in a normal functioning educational system and said, is that a man or a woman? It'd be very clear. And everybody knows life will teach them. We're only trying to indoctrinate them against their own eyes, mm. against their own innate understandings of how society works for these insane ideals. But anything important that life's going to teach them anyway, we refuse to teach them. So you should look very carefully at any idea they keep pushing on children, because what they're actually doing is taking an idea which they know is garbage and finding the people who are most likely to believe it, mm. finding the suckers and the gullible, effectively. Who's the most gullible people? Because this is bullshit. So who's gullible? Well, even the most stupid adults reject this because it's so ridiculous. Well, the children are gullible. And then they'll sit there and go, yeah, but the children don't run the world yet. Mm. Yet. And the psyop takes time. So it's fine. We're going to purport it on these kids only 10% will believe, 90% will reject, next generation, 20% believe, 80% reject, next generation, and eventually they get what they want. And these people and these families and those who are in charge have been in charge for a very long time because they think generationally. It's a different mindset that most people at home don't understand. You're at home trying to pay your rent. You're not thinking, how do I make sure my grandchildren don't have to pay rent? You're not. And if you are, you're still doing it wrong because you've got inheritance tax and they're going to fuck you and they're going to take it all off you anyway. You're not doing it the way they're doing it. They're ensuring that there's a country somewhere that you don't, can't even point to on a map that has a water supply. In 2072, the rights to that water supply expire and it's now going to be owned by a private corporation that his great grandson is going to own so people can drink water. That's how they think. So if they want a particular ideal instilled inside of a nation, even if it, even if it doesn't happen while they're alive, they don't care. And it's that degree of thinking that's hard to combat. And that's also why you have to be to a degree unreasonable because if you give them an inch, they're going to take a mile Yeah. because they take an inch, they take an inch, an inch a year and it adds up. So you have to draw a hard line and say, no, I won't give you an inch. I'm not, you can call me racist and homophobic and bigoted and you can put me in jail and call me a misogynist. No, I won't give you an inch because I know where it ends up. So you have to draw that hard line and God makes it easier to draw the hard line because it's haram. Oh, but he's gay and da-da. Haram. Yeah, but da-da, but haram. Hard line. <laughs> That's why they don't like God because there's a hard line. They don't want you to have a hard line. What they want you to have is what most conservatives have because mm. conservatives are rational, reasonable people. Yeah. And what they do is they give you a line and conservatives are like, oh, maybe it's nuanced and it's a bendy line and, and slowly... Bro, the conservatives of today were the liberals of 20 years ago. They just get keep on pushed back a little bit by a little bit by a little bit by a little bit. That's right. Quick bathroom break. Sure. And then we'll be right back. Another quick merch plug. Definitely go pick up the free thinker hoodie. We have it in a hoodie and a t-shirt. Brand new, new for this episode. This only works because you guys support our efforts, are part of the free thinker army. And if you don't want some merch, hit the donation link. Appreciate you guys. Let's get back to the episode. So I want to get into religion because you talked about your conversion to Islam just a little bit. Yeah. And I think for a while I've been really jaded with Christianity in America, yeah. mostly because I see the shift in the church, right? The church has been so weak yeah. and so much scandal happens within church. 
And being a part of it, you're like, all right, like this something doesn't seem right here. Yeah. And that's when I lived maybe closer to the cities. I used to live in New York City. Um, I used to live much closer to Atlanta. Recently, I moved into part of Georgia that's considered more conservative. Mm -hmm. And moving into the conservative part of the country, I realized that the failing and the falling of the church isn't like a whole American thing. That actually there's a huge section of America that still adheres to the traditional values that we thought and we agreed with early on. Yep. I thought the church as a whole was failing. But then moving into the conservative areas, I realized, no, it's just these liberal areas that are failing. Yep. And the people that are out there, they still hold their values. They don't put up with this bullshit. They are adamantly against what's going on. And it restored my faith back in Christianity. It restored my faith back into the church just a little bit, realizing it's not everybody. Yep. And it restored my faith in humanity to see that there are people there that still believe some of the traditional values that you talk about, that I talk about. Well, that's beautiful because if you tolerate everything, you stand for nothing. Mm. And the problem with Christianity, it's it's based on this endless idea of forgiveness and tolerance. And that's been corrupted and polluted, like you said, by some bad actors. Yeah. And I feel like Christianity has lost a lot of its presence in recent times. And that breaks my heart. Mm. I'm a Muslim now, but that breaks my heart because people of the book are people of the book and we need more God, not less God. And I don't care what God you worship if you worship God and you're a good person. And it's a shame, really, that Christianity's reached a point where it's mocked so openly and yeah. so publicly in Christian nations. That breaks my heart. And I think the attraction of Islam for me personally, and also for a lot of other people now, is there's a lot of people who are just tired of being mocked mm. and they want a religion which they respect and other people respect. And you can disagree with Islam all you want. And whether you're an atheist or you're a Christian, you can disagree with it all you want. And I'm not an Islamic scholar to argue that point. However, I will argue the point that it is the most respected religion on the planet. Nobody openly mocks it without fear. If they do, they at least make sure they're very careful about hiding their face or hiding behind a police barricade. Mm. Whereas people will mock Christianity openly and think it's a joke. And I feel like it's time for the Christians to take power back by ensuring that their religion is respected. I have some good friends in England who are particularly conservative and they're upset by the changing demographics of the nation. And as a, well, I'm a mixed race American living in Romania who's reverted to mm -hmm. Islam. So I'm a complete mongrel. Yeah. However, I grew up in England and I do understand the innate culture of England. And I do understand why they feel threatened by all these outside people coming in. And I do understand how that's negatively affecting the crime rate. And I do agree with them that they want England to be British why shouldn't they? It's yeah. their nation. I completely respect it. And a lot of them are very anti-Islam. And I try and explain to them, I agree with you completely in your points of view. That may be confusing to you of why I can be a Muslim, but I can agree with the fact that you want to preserve the UK. But you're mad at Islam like it's Islam's fault. And it's not. It's a universal law. It's a law of the universe that power vacuums get filled. You can't, as Muslims, turn up to a strongly, truly Christian nation and just conquer the religious landscape if Christianity is being absolutely respected. Perhaps in America, it's not so bad, but in Europe, people keep complaining about the spread of Islam. Well, where's Christianity? If you leave a complete power vacuum, what do you expect to happen? Yeah. In America, you just name the certain parts of it which are still Christian. You'll struggle to find very many Christian parts of Europe. Mm. We're here in Romania, which is one of the most Christian countries in the world, and Eastern Europe does have a degree of Christianity left. But in the West, there's no God at all besides Islam. You're either an atheist or you're, or you're a Muslim. And if I had to choose between the two, or if I had to choose which one I'd want my son to be, I'd choose for them to be Islamic. I often say this to people. I say, would you rather your son come home and say he's transgender or say he's a Muslim? Hmm. Because we're getting to that point. Yeah. If Christianity keeps failing, you're going to end up with a son that's either going to come home and be a liberal or come home and be a Muslim. Which one would you choose? I'd actually like to ask this to all the conservative Christians in America. And they'll say, Jesus is king. And I'll say, good. I respect that. But let's pretend first a thought experiment that I'm right and that Christianity is little by little, like we talked about, inch by inch, mm. giving up power and being decimated in real time. And at some point in the future, you have two choices, liberal insanity and transgenderism or Islam. Which one would you choose? And I think most Christians would actually sit if they answered honestly and say, I'd rather than worship God. I'd rather Islam. So it's, I love the fact that there's some religious conviction left in America. Yeah. But I'm concerned about the fact that 
one of the primary goals of religion shouldn't only be the salvation of souls. It should be the sanctimonious, sanctimoniousness, if that's a word, or the sanctimony of the society it presides over. It should be responsible for preserving the culture. Christianity should be responsible for preserving the culture of the USA. And in certain areas, it seems to be successful, but in many areas, it is failing. Whereas Islam, I feel like it's better at preserving the culture of the nations it subsides over. So if you measure the success of a religion, it's hard to say Islam's not a successful religion. Islamic nations are Islamic mm. and they feel Islamic. And it's hard to go against the Islamic norms and the Islamic thoughts in Islamic nations. Whereas in Christian nations now, I just feel like they're so publicly attacked. And that truly breaks my heart. My brother's a Christian. Him and I have very long debates about Islam versus Christianity. And we don't do it publicly because I don't want to start a fire because mm. I see Christians as my brothers. We're in the same team. Yeah. But it's kind of, it's kind of, it really breaks my heart. It's upsetting. When I see these gay preachers and the Pope talking about same-sex marriage and how important transgenderism, that breaks my heart. And I'm not even Christian. I just think it's so sad that it's happening. Yeah, it's weird when they, um, they embrace ideas that they're supposed to be so avidly against, yeah. right? That really throws a lot of people off. Do you ever consider that, because if, if we're in a war of good and evil, and that's really the force behind the world, right? There's good and there's evil. Yeah. Do you ever wonder that maybe everyone's worshiping the same God, we just call them different ways? It's super interesting you said that, because yes, I do think, like, especially Christianity and Islam, I've read the Bible and I've read the Quran, mm. and they're so much closer than people realize. People yeah. think that, especially traditional American Christians, as you just named, if you were to get the average Christian from mm. Georgia in the countryside, he will see Islam as this far-off Arabic religion. Yeah. It's for Middle Eastern people. Well, so is Christianity. It's from the same place. So they're from the same place. Only 20% of Muslims are Arabic anyway. There's huge Islamic nations, which are Asian. There's mm. Indonesia, Malaysia, mm. there's huge Islamic nations. So they work hand in hand. And I feel like perhaps Christianity and Islam are humans are fallible and perhaps we don't completely understand what God is or the idea of God. And we're trying to find it in different ways. It's like saying a sentence in English or a sentence in German. You're saying the same thing, but you're saying them in different ways. I think the evil people, are they worshiping God? I'm not sure because I think they're very openly Satanist. I actually believe they're worshiping Satan and they're against the idea of I mean, God. there is a huge growing segment of actual vocal open Satanists now. Yeah. And that's really concerning. I've, I've every every like month or so you go on X and you see what's trending and it's like Satan. Like why is Satan trending so damn often? I know. It's it's scary. And and these Satanists, I I don't truly know what a Satanist worships, but I guess the idea is absolute free will and absolute hedonism and no respect or no obligation to my bloodline or my society or my duty to the people who I care about. I guess it's just a degree of innate selfishness. Mm. If you were to boil Satanism down, it's just about me, 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 me. And I think there's a whole bunch of ideas as well, which promote this selfishness. I talk at length about depression and, uh, well, let's take depression. I talk at length about depression and people get upset with my views on it. But I said, depression is depression involves a huge degree of narcissism and absolute selfishness mm. to sit there and go, I'm sad and I don't feel good. And I, I don't feel happy. Like you just sound me, 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 me. I'm so important. I should be happy. What about me? How do you be depressed without narcissism? And how do you be dep depressed without absolute selfishness? Bad things happen to you. Bad things happen to everyone. I'm not saying you don't have a hard life. I'm not saying you shouldn't be sad. I'm not saying that. I'm saying your obsession with how you feel and no obligation or no concern for the people around you or your duties or the things you need to do is why you feel the way you feel. I find it remarkable that some of these famous people kill themselves when they have kids. Yeah. Like, I don't, I'm going to say this now. I don't care how much trouble I get in. If you're a man and you have children and you kill yourself, you're a piece of shit. Yeah. You're a piece of shit. Don't care how sad you feel. You're going to abandon your children because you feel sad because you, oh, you got a thought in your head, a feeling in your brain. You're going to abandon your kids and leave them fatherless. You're a piece of shit. Cowardice. And you're a coward. And the fact that you will even do that shows the absolute narcissism these people operate under that they feel like their feelings matter more than the upbringing of the children they birthed. It's insane to me. And if you actually have a sense of duty and a sense of purpose beyond yourself, it's very difficult to get depressed. 
It's very hard for an individual ant or an individual bee to be depressed if the beehive is functioning. I can't be depressed when I'm, I'm in a matrix attack and they're trying to destroy my life and they want me to be sad. I can't be because I have children to pay for and I have a business to run and I have employees to pay and I have things to do. I don't have time for it because I have to think about something other than myself. So I don't think depression and in fact, we'll go back to the original point I was going to make. Depression, along with Satanism, along with a lot of these ideas, along with even the LGBTQ crap, it's all about how I feel. Yeah. It's not about how does this affect other people? We talked about Mr. Beast earlier. None of these people sit there and go, I feel like changing gender. How will this affect all the children who watch me? How will this affect society? They're so selfish. They only care about themselves. So the matrix is trying to push selfishness. It doesn't like, it doesn't like us to look at the fellow human and see them as something akin to ourselves because then we're going to be harder to psyop. They only want you to care about you and only you, which is why they push the divisions, right? It's why they push racism on purpose. It's why they push the division, the political parties on purpose. They push the divisions because if we unite and start to sit and say, wait, I care about what happens to other people because of my actions, not just what happens to me. That would be a far different society. So Satanism, I think it's being pushed for the same reasons a lot of things are being pushed. I think if we can, if I was in charge of the matrix and I had to try my very best to control everybody, the first thing I'd want to do is split them up. Mm. I'd want everybody to be selfish and self-obsessed and have their little robot at home and their little pod and obsessed with their Apple TV thing on their <laughs> eyes. Bro, I see that and it scares me. I see people in public with, what are the Apple Vision Pro? Yeah. That thing is scary. Bro, world's over. I was talking to um, a young guy who had just bought it. He had it for three days. And he said that the longest session he did was something like nine or 10 hours. And the longest he's not been on it was our conversation outside of sleeping. And he said, when he wakes up in the morning, he has a migraine. And about 30 minutes to 45 minutes later, the migraine goes away and he goes back in. It's only been three days. He's already addicted because for him, reality is better with the augment augmentation around him. Yeah. And he's aware that that's actually happening. But yet, he's like, I need to stop recording soon because I need to go back in. Wow. And that's at the first generation of it. Yeah. Can you just imagine where we're going to be in five years when that technology gets even better? Bro, every time I see technological advancements now, I get scared. Yeah. You've seen that, that what's, it, what's it called? Sora. Sora. You've seen that? That's crazy. Bro. And, and that's, the, it's, it's still in beta testing. Imagine we're going to be 10 years from now. Yeah. And I think personally, what I try and do is get ahead of these things. So I'm not a geek. I'm not technologically super advanced. I have a lot of people who work for me who are. So even inside the war room or inside the real world, I have people inside of my platforms who specific job, who I pay hundreds of thousands of dollars to a month. So they're on top of these things. So we can teach it to other people. And I see something like Sora and think, okay, that can make me a lot of money if I'm ahead of the curve. So I need to get my team involved in it. We need to make a whole bunch of money. But if you're the average person at home and you're watching AI continually take over the world and you're not at least learning how to implement it yeah. so you can benefit, you're toast. You're toast. Most people are going to be replaced so quickly. I don't think the average person at home realizes how replaceable they are. I'd argue now that 80% of the normies I talk to, chat GPT would be far more interesting than them. They're that boring. The average person at home, if they were trying to get a girl, would be better off putting chat GPT in the combo than themselves. Mm. That's how bad they are. And they're arrogant and they're narcissistic and they think, no, I'm special. Most of you are not special. You're not. And because you're not special, you're going to be replaced by machines. And once you're replaced by machines, you're going to become useless. And you're still going to have expectations. You're still going to want to eat. And you're still going to want a, a wage. And you're still going to want a good house and a nice car. What are the elites going to do with the populace once they become completely useless and remain, the, remain to be entitled? You're useless eaters. Useless eaters always end up decimated. In any period of human history, in any civilization, if you had a large subsect of the populace that had no purpose, they got decimated. So if you're at home sitting there thinking, well, I can become useless and the government will just feed me, I'd argue they'll starve you to death instead because they don't need you around. And most people are going to be replaced very quickly by these machines. Sora, I said to my camera guys when I saw Sora, I was like, you're out of a job. <laughs> you're fired. You're fired. We started laughing about it. But it's true. And think of how fast technology advances. Where are we going to be in 20 years from now? Yeah, it's going to be crazy. It's, it's, it's insane. You need to get ahead of these things. Yeah, I think um, AI... We've talked about the negative effects of AI. We know that it's bad for you. The reality of life is that once that technology is invented, 
you're never going to uninvent it. Oh, of course. Like we know social media is bad for you, yeah. but you're never going to uninvent social right. media. It's here forever. But it could be used for good and bad. Exactly. And AI is here forever. And it's going to get worse and more advanced. It's going to take over parts of our lives. We know this as much as you want to hate it and fight it, as much as I think it's going to be a, so much evil that comes from it. Yeah. You have to almost understand it. Well, I'll give you a very quick example. It can be used for good or bad. Social media can be negative if mm. you sit there and digest bad information, but it's also one of the reasons we managed to get to such large, uh, Correct. such large sub subsects of the population. So it can be a good thing and a bad thing. Inside the real world, inside my online university, we push AI very heavily. And mm. I was having a conversation with someone the other day who said, oh yeah, I don't use AI because I'm a club promoter. And I said, if you're in any business in the world today, it doesn't matter if you're a plumber, it doesn't matter if you're a club promoter, it doesn't matter what business you're in. You should be learning how to implement AI because it's going to be the people who use AI and the people who fail. Yep. Those are the only two options, which is why we teach it so heavily inside of my university. And I said to the club promoter, what do you do? He said, well, I get guys to book expensive tables at the club because mm. I bring pretty girls to the table. And I said, okay, well, if you had an AI machine, let's say you use Sora to put together a video of the best club night ever. And let's say you use chat GPT to speak to lots of girls and explain what's going to happen and why they're going to have a great time at the club and also get chat GPT to speak to rich men and explain to them what a great time they're going to have. And you could mass speak to people at a much larger rate than you can do by yourself sitting there typing. You're going to make more money. Yeah. You can implement AI in club promotion. You can get the most fancy video and you can get a chat GPT learning bot to realize exactly. This is actually a point I want to make to realize exactly what trigger words get the girls to want to party and what trigger words get the guy to want to spend money. And you can put together some data and you can stop talking to people completely and you can focus on the AI learning mechanisms to do all the work for you, which is why we're teaching it inside of my university. There's not a job on earth where you shouldn't be using AI mechanisms to do it for you because that's what they're doing to us already. Yeah. We live in this surveillance capitalism world where a lot of the tech companies, a lot of the largest companies in the world are making money purely based on prediction of our behavior. They build digital versions of us online. They build digital. There's a digital map. There's a digital mm. Andrew based on all of our spending habits, how long we spend on each website, which part of the website we click on first, which websites we visit, how long we spend in our email, which email topics make us reply. They're constantly gathering data on us and putting together digital versions of us so they can predict our behavior to make as much money from us as possible. And once they can do that, they then try and alter our behavior so that we become more profitable. And they do this on purpose so that we become a person who's worth $12.59 to be a person who's worth $14.03 by altering mm. how we react to certain things. So they're already building algorithms and trying to adjust how our mind works. And if you have a company or you are interested in making money in the world today and you're not considering doing exactly that, you're going to permanently fail. Yeah, I agree completely. I think a lot of people say, hey, um, I'm, I'm working two jobs and I feel like I need a way to make some extra income. Yes, I agree. You need more money. Everyone needs more money. If you want to learn something, if you're 15 or you're 55, it's not too late to get into AI. 100%. And yes, is it evil? Yes, I think so. However, you're not going to uninvent it. Yep. You might as well learn it because this is a way where you can add some extra income to your life. And it's it's not overly difficult yep. if you just spend a little bit of time to figure it out. And this is what's interesting because the current educational systems of earth, none of them are teaching AI. Yeah. I mean, perhaps maybe you go to MIT and you learn about robotics or something fine. And at but, a very advanced level, which you don't need. Absolutely. The average school isn't teaching you about AI. Mm. The average MBA you will do won't teach you about AI. I'm going to sit here and make it very clear and obvious. The only school on the planet I can find that will teach you about artificial intelligence is my one, the real world. And it's $49. Mm. For $49, we'll teach you exactly how to use AI to make a whole bunch of money. Which goes back into a point I was saying earlier about certain people are just tied into the matrix and don't want to be freed. If we will sit here and have a long conversation about how artificial intelligence is going to replace most people, and if you don't implement it, you're going to become useless, and your entire bloodline is going to be exterminated because you don't serve any purpose to society, and I'm going to teach you how to use artificial intelligence for $49, and you're still not going to do it, well, then I guess you just deserve eternal slavery for your bloodline. Some people are just born to lose, I assume. But it's extremely important we implement these things. So when I watch Sora, the conversations I've had, it was only two days ago. I was on the phone for six or seven hours with my team inside the real world saying, okay, how can we use this? What mm. can we do with this? And there's two different ways to look at it. There is how can we use artificial intelligence now when no one else is really using it? How do we get ahead of the curve and continue to make millions of dollars? That's easy. 
The real question is, how do we use AI when everyone else is using it? Mm. Once it becomes mainstream and everyone else can do it, when everyone else can produce adverts at the drop of a hat, when everyone else can make their product look fantastic when it isn't, when everybody else can use chat GPT to be extremely funny and charming and interesting, when there's neuro links in their brain and everybody can talk like Andrew Tate, because right now only <laughs> Andrew Tate can talk like that. When I lose my ability to speak more concisely and compendiously than everybody else, how do I compete then? That's going to be the hard one. But right now we're in a transitional period where it's easy because if you join the real world or you pay attention or you learn these things, you're so ahead of everyone else. It's like the first person to turn up to the gold mine mm. and you could just dig and pick up all the gold, but there'll become a time where the gold mine's flooded. And that's where you really have to think ahead. So we had a long conversation about how to make a bunch of money now. And that was easy. But the real question is how do we all make a bunch of money in 20 years when AI is standardized? Mm. That's what's going to be the interesting conversation. I mean, the future is digital. Everything's going to be AI. Everything's going to be digital. We know this for sure. If you think it's not, you are got your head in the sand, it's happening no matter what. 100%. If you are one of the few rare people that are able to clarify and put your ideas out in the world, then the people with analog reasoning and logic and thought and original thought will be the most valuable because of scarcity, yep. right? If you are not one of those people, but you need a way to supplement your current income, I think you have to get into AI. You have to. 100%. You either feel like you can make it on your own through originality. So people, even if you're a photographer, people who take the most epic analog pictures will be more valuable yep. because there's less of you. Yep. If you can make movies and you can be original and you are, I don't know, who's a fav mo famous movie producer? Uh, I don't even know nowadays. <laughs> oh, I can't say George Lucas. I'll get uh, too much Star Wars heat. No, you can't say that anymore. <sighs> if you can do that on your own, then you'll be more valuable because of scarcity. If you don't feel like you're the upper echelon of your industry, you have to embrace AI. That's 100%. what I think. Yep, 100%, because it allows you to work at mass at a much more effective rate, yeah. much more effectively. I mean, the amount of websites which, I mean, copywriting used to, is a thing, right? And it still is a thing. But the amount of websites which could benefit from a complete copy change with, with chat GPT would make their copy better than it currently is. Yeah. The amount of average electricians have a little terrible website somewhere in Texas, and you could literally chat GPT their entire website, and you could charge them money for that, and they don't even realize that you use chat GPT because they don't have a clue what, what it is because they're behind the times, and you could literally make money for 10 seconds worth. Mm. Now, if you could get an AI bot to reach out to them all, if you get an AI bot to speak to them all, if you could produce them a movie using Sora showing the coolest electrician on earth, like there's so much potential that could be done. <laughs> it's it's so ridiculously easy to make money if you actually try. Mm. But implementing AI is something you need to do because it's the future. It's yeah. like it's like ignoring gunpowder. If you ignore gunpowder, you'll lose the war. You could have looked at gunpowder at some point and said, ah, we got bows and arrows, it'll be fine. No, it won't. As it advances, it's going to get to the point where they soon have Gatling guns and you're all toast. And it's exactly the same in the business environment, which is why we're implementing AI. Inside the real world, we don't just have an AI campus. We implement AI into every other campus. Mm. So we have a specific campus on artificial intelligence, and then we implement AI in our copywriting campus and our crypto campus and all of our other campuses. We have 18 of them. But it's super important that it's done. And I'm kind of also, we talk about fraternity. I'm not going to lie. I'm very glad I have such a good network of people because- I have so many people who work for me and people around me who know things I don't know. And it's amazing. And I'll tell you another thing that's kind of scary. There are so many kids nowadays that are smart, bro. Mm. I have 18, 19 year olds who work for me doing this AI stuff. And I'm like, bro, <laughs> I'm, I'm, a, I'm a dinosaur now. I'm like, I don't know. I can talk. And you can't talk like me. Yeah. You're socially awkward and sure. weird and you can't get laid. I can do all that, but you're doing this, bro. It's, it's they, they just figured it out. Bro, it's crazy. The world's changing so fast mm. and you need to have a team of people. It's kind of like the chessboard, right? I think uh, uh, one of the problems we have in the West, especially I've noticed, I feel like families in the East are a little bit better. Certainly Islamic families are better, but in the West, everyone wants to be the king on the chessboard. Yeah. But truthfully, to have a good team, you need a king and you need a bishop and you need a rook and you need a knight and you need pawns and everyone needs to know their job. And if everyone does their job well, you win the game, especially the queen. She's another piece on the chessboard, one mm. of the most powerful pieces. If everyone does their job right, then you're fine. But when you have a bunch of people trying to be the king, then it all falls apart. So I think one of the powers of my fraternity, especially, is that I have my role and people have their roles and we work together and we forever win. We never lose. But if you're a ruler of the world and one of the globalist elite, and the world is your chessboard. Isn't that why they think what they think? Of course Everyone needs to have their role. 100%. And I'm the king. 100%. And everyone else 
You guys are paws, rooks, and we'll place you. Uh, 100%. And that's the thing that I find so amazing when I say these things to people. All I'm doing is describing human nature. Mm. If you're born into the bloodline of, let's say you're born into a banking bloodline. And let's say you're doing going to all these weird sex parties and you've never worked a day in your life and you live on a yaw and you're just some weirdo banker, right? They're going to believe they're genetically superior to you. Are they? No. Are they physically stronger than an NFL athlete? Fuck no. Are they genetically superior? Are they smarter than the average person? Probably not. But they're going to believe they are because they're born into that lineage. Mm. So they're going to believe that they're somehow special and better than you. They're going to believe that they can make you do things that they don't have to do because they're better than you. That's human nature. They're the king on the chessboard and they have a lot of power and they're going to put you in a position that, of serfdom because they want to do it. The question is, are you going to accept it? That's, that's the final line now. Are you going to accept that position of serfdom or are you going to sit in there and say, no, I resist. I don't want to do that. And I'm going to get rich and important myself so I can live my own version of reality that I want to exist in. I don't want to exist in your version of reality. You're either a player on someone else's board or you can try and make a genuine impact. And it's kind of like when we were talking about the war earlier and how it's coming for all of us and every single battle that's ever happened in history. It doesn't matter if it was war or Lou. It doesn't matter if it was one of the battles in ancient Rome or ancient Greece. It doesn't matter if it was the Spartans. It doesn't matter what it was. There's a death toll. There's a number and there's a few notable names. Mm. Everybody died. Yeah. Everyone died. <laughs> so when they finally kill us, at least they remember our name, sir. Yeah. But all these other people at home who are afraid to talk and tell the things that we tell are going to die just the same, but they're going to be one of 13,044 deaths. It's going to be 13,044 deaths. Matt, Andrew, at least we get that bit. And, <laughs> and, and if you're going to die anyway, you may as well grab the last bits you can get. At least have your name ingrained in history. Then I got eventually. Someone's going to make a movie about you. Not like you a so? small movie, but like a real Hollywood big production eventually. Because they made a movie about the kid from uh, GameStop. It's true, yeah. They're going to make a movie about you one day. Who's going to play me? Who's going to play you? Yeah. AI, probably. No, like seriously, who do you think, um, if someone were to play you, who would play you? Because you know, eventually they will. I, For sure they'll they make will, a movie. But you know what? That scares me because I recently watched the Napoleon movie. Mm. And they just made him some pussy hungry little weirdo <laughs> cock. That wasn't, I mean, I didn't know Napoleon, mm. but why did they make him that way? Like that had to be an attack on him. Okay. Maybe he loved his wife. Maybe he was a bit obsessed with his wife, Shirley, but he was also Napoleon. Can't yeah. you give him any credit? Mm. Can't you make him a gangster or a G in any part of the movie? Does he have to be a bitch the whole way through? Like, can't you at least make him cool when he's fighting? Like anything? I don't know. It's such a psyop. Everything's a psyop now. Everything's a psyop. They're going to make a movie about me and I'm going to be the worst person ever. <laughs> gonna... He's a misogynist. <laughs> he hates women. The, you know no, what? That would do you credit. They're going to make a movie and they're like, oh, he's such a simp. Bro, <laughs> That's his worst. Yeah, bro. <laughs> but it's, it's amazing how you, it's amazing how the Matrix says you're misogynistic for trying to protect and provide for women. For mm. me saying, I don't believe a woman can do the things that I can do because I'm born a man and I have capabilities she doesn't have and vice versa. Mm. That makes me a misogynist. I don't believe I can get pregnant. I believe she can. I don't believe she can fight. I believe I can. Why does that make me misogynistic? Why does that make me misogynistic to say that I can protect and provide for my woman better than she could do for herself? How does that make me a misogynist? And every single woman I meet is like, I wish I met a man like you who would protect from protect me and provide for me. I'm like, I know. So why is, what, where is this misogyny garbage coming from? Well, it's coming from a, a small vocal minority of psychopathic feminists who truly hate men. The only hate is coming from them. I don't hate women. I, if I hated women, I wouldn't want to protect and provide for them. If I hated women, I would endorse feminism. If mm. I hated women, I'd say, <laughs> go get a job. Protect yourself. Stick up for yourself. If a man breaks into your house, you fight them. We're equal. That's what you do when you hate women. You don't protect and provide for them. The whole thing's a psyop. But I, I think the misogyny f feminism garbage is actually collapsing much faster than a lot of other narratives. It's very hard to find anybody who still believes in that crap now. Yeah. Some of the narratives are, you know that they weren't going to last. And they're, some narratives are trendy. Some cultural things are trendy. And the misogynist feminism thing is one of those things that's kind of going away. Do you know why feminism's collapsing? I'll tell you. Because the world's getting harder. Mm. And the good days are over. And we're about to enter a period of chaos and war and difficulty. And inflation is here to destroy all of our currencies. And it's getting harder and harder to even make a living or travel anywhere or live a good life. And you often find that 
as soon as things get difficult, even the feminists want to make you sandwiches. Mm. You soon learn that even they are the first ones to say, ah, this, this whole working thing, this is hard. How about you do all the work and I'll look after the home. Feminists will instantly abandon their ideals as soon as it gets difficult. And we're there. And we're there. So as the, as the world gets more difficult, all the feminists are putting on aprons and begging for me, mm. trying to get to make me a sandwich and they're all rejected, unfortunately. But it's it's amazing how the reality of life can destroy these ideals. And as the world gets harder and harder, I mean, let's let's put it this way. If you were to if if World War Three were to come to America, heaven forbid, all this transgenderism crap will go out the window. Yeah. Because now it's time to do something real. And feminism might be the first one to fall. And unfortunately, it, it's a shame it takes such hardship for the holes in these ideals to be pointed out. But the reason feminism isn't being purported and the reason it can't be sustained anymore and the whole idea of misogyny and all this crap is falling apart is because life is hard. And men are good at doing hard things. Men are better at a hard life than women. The women I know, I don't want them to be good at hard life. I would hate a woman to be as resilient as me. If, if I met a woman who could go through the things I went through and survive... I'd be very concerned. I wouldn't find it attractive either. I like a woman who would cry when bad things happen mm. to her because I like her emotionality. I like her femininity. But as the world gets more and more difficult, men are better at that. And that's why all the feminists are throwing their ideas out the window. You can notice now, bro, 20, 2020, 2019, feminists were all over social media. Yeah. Now it's all these girls saying, I never wanted a job. <laughs> I never wanted to work. Who tricked me? <laughs> well, you tricked yourself by falling for the PSYOP. And now no man wants to take care of your ass because we've seen your old social media when you're talking about being a boss bitch, traveling the world, fucking partying on boats with your tits out. Now no one wants to look after you. You should have been a feminist. From the, you should have thrown that shit away from the beginning. So yeah, feminism's collapsed and harsh reality has made it collapse because it's not a sustainable idea because it's not real. And the truth reality is that men and women are different. We're better at different things. And we work as a team. And when we work as a team and understand our roles, we do better. If you're a tailor and you're an accountant and you want to open a tailor business, well, then the tailor makes the clothes and the accountant does the books. Mm. If you reverse the jobs or if you sit there and say, I can be an accountant as good as you can and you can make clothes as good as I can, we're the same. And half the clothes are made by the tailor and half the clothes are made by a random accountant. You're going to have a crap business and it's going to fail. You have roles and you work together and you're a perfect team. Everybody knows this. Everybody knows this. But feminism is kind of funny. Feminists were everywhere three or four years ago. Where have all the feminists gone? This is my question to the world. Where have they all gone? Now the inflation's here. Now that the world's <laughs> difficult, why can't I find a feminist to debate with anymore? For a while, they were everywhere. And now they're all trying to hide behind a man somewhere and live for free. Where'd all the boss bitches go? Oh, they've all gone. <laughs> all, it's funny, yeah. Now that everyone's bored of paying for OnlyFans account mm. and crypto ain't going up like it used to be, mm. all these boss bitches have vanished. All the feminists are out the window now that life is difficult because the whole idea was bullshit from the beginning. What do you think about this burgeoning group of these red pill women? Because after you, now there's a whole community of red pill girls online. Yeah. And they're basically taking a lot of your ideas and they're repurposing it from a female voice. It's, Girls like Pearl, I think that's her name. Pearl, yeah, I know Pearl. I mean... What do you think about that? It's it's a new thing. It, it didn't is, exist five years ago. It's true. It's a new thing. And I, I know Pearl, and I, I've been mm. on her podcast. I know her well. And I know there's a bunch of other ones that are doing this Tradcon stuff. I don't really watch any of it. I'm, I have to be honest. I'm kind of... It's hard for me to comment on a lot of content because I am mm. the worst content... What I don't consume content mm. ever. I just make my own and I don't watch any of it. I do see some very pretty girls now, though. There's a couple of pretty ones who are talking about Tradcon values and all this kind of stuff. I always wonder how true they are yeah. to it. It's trendy right now. It's trendy. And it was trendy to be a feminist before. So yeah. this is what I mean. So how true are they to it? Because I would, I, I don't know. I don't know these people. I guess if you're, if you're true to it, I believe that you find a man and you love that man and you stick with him forever, no matter what. And that's the kind of man you want to be with. And a real woman doesn't leave her man. And that's what I believe in. I don't know who these women are. I don't know what they're saying, but if they're 30 something and they're not married, mm. I mean, I don't know what you've been doing all that time sleeping with who, I don't know. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know. I don't know. It's, 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 it's a new trend. It's like, uh, it didn't exist before. And now okay, let me, let me be, okay. Let me be misogynistic now. I'll be misogynist. Comedy. Let's do it. Comedy. Hey, comedy, real. comedy, comedy. Real. <laughs> women follow trends mm. because women are susceptible 
to societal trends because they're malleable because they do not have physical capability to defend themselves. E.g., if a new tribe conquers the current tribe, the women will quickly adapt to the ideals of the new tribe to survive. So when the Nazis conquered France, the French women slept with the Nazis. I mean, for a while, they were upset that their husband were ki- was killed. I don't know, maybe three days. And after that, they're like, cool, I need a man to pay the bills. So they got with the Nazi soldiers. That's how women are. They're selfish. They're self-absorbed. And they just adhere to the power structures and follow the power structures because they can't resist them because they can't fight. So, and I'm not insulting women. This is a fact. If a new, more powerful force takes over, e.g. the Nazis taking over France, they'll adhere to that ideal for survival. Now that feminism's collapsing and traditional masculinity and traditional roles is popular again, they're adhering to this mind, this worldview because it allows them to survive. They can't argue feminism anymore because it's failed in real time. They don't have an innate ability to argue against the general consensus of Earth. Again, exceptions don't disprove the rule, but in general, because they don't have physical capability, they know what's cool and what's popular and they love attention. So now they're all trad con. Do they really mean it? I don't know. Now it's the cool thing to say. If when feminism was cool, I said the same things. Mm. Now that masculinity is cool, I'm saying the same things. If feminism becomes cool again, I will the same the, say the same things. But I'm Andrew Tate. I'm the top G. I fear <laughs> nobody. Put me in jail. I don't care. By myself, sitting there with the cockroaches, just me and Tristan smoking cigarettes. I'm fearless. It doesn't matter to me. The chick, these chicks who are trad con now, will they flip when the game flips? We'll see, because a lot of women do that. But if the idea is that a lot of these influencers are following the trend, that means being masculine, have traditional values is now the trend. It is. Isn't that actually positive for society that these women are doing these things because they weren't doing it five years ago? A hundred percent. It's amazing that they're saying these things. Mm-hmm. It's amazing that we've changed the culture. I believe I was part of that. Trump was part of mm-hmm. that. You saying the right things part of that. What is cool now wasn't cool three years ago. Things are changing. I'm not complaining that they're making this content. I'm yeah. glad they are. My question is, how true are their core beliefs? And then you go deeper down the rabbit hole into the semi-misogyny area where Mm. people are going to have a panic attack. How true is any woman's core belief Mm. when she can't defend the belief? You go deeper down the rabbit hole, you understand. If you're not prepared to defend an idea, you don't hold an idea. If you're not prepared to stand up to people who disagree with you and defend it vigorously, then you've never held it in the first place. If you can't defend it, it's not yours. So a lot of women, when they're challenged openly because they fear societal pressure, they feel all being ostracized, they feel being criticized, they, they, they don't want to be insecure, they fear these things, and because they're not brave enough to deal with the consequences of holding a controversial idea, no woman's going to jail for her idea. Mm. I did. Name a chick who's going to go sit with the cockroaches for 93 days in a Romanian dungeon for her idea on YouTube. Hmm. Name one. Not a single one. They're pussies. As they should be. They're women. I don't want women to be as brave as me. Mm. So they're scared. So if you're a woman and you can be scared out of saying certain things and you're scared of being criticized for certain things and you're scared of physical confrontation and you're scared of being ostracized, do you even believe anything? Do you really believe it? This is, this is a, this is a philosophical question. Yeah. Do you truly believe it? You may believe it when you say it. But there's a difference between believing something when it's convenient and it's soft and it's easy and believing something when it's hard. They're very different things. I know my beliefs are core to my heart. I know that I believe them because I will suffer for them. If you don't suffer for your idea, do you believe it? And do you really want women to stand up for their ideas? Anyway. Misogynist. Because, for example, I remember in 2020, we were going to vote. In 2016 and 2020, it was, my wife is originally from Korea, so she became an American citizen after we got married. Yep. It was the first time that she had the ability to vote. Yep. And we were going to vote, and she was really excited because she finally got her right to vote. And she says to me, who are you voting for? And I said, you can vote for whoever you want. This is your decision. She's like, no, like I get that, and I'm really excited to do it, but why would I vote against you? Yep. Because then I'm canceling your vote. Correct. Whatever you do, I want to vote what you're voting because I want to amplify your vote. Absolutely. And she, it's not that she doesn't think for herself. It's that she realized that she can fight me and oppose me or she can amplify me. Absolutely. And her gut instinct was, I'd rather amplify my husband rather than choose something else. Absolutely. And that's what a good woman does. I, I can even tell you from my current battle. The current battle Mm. I'm in, I don't think most people understand or would ever be capable of understanding what a matrix attack does to you. I've had no banks. 
I'm banned from everything from Skype to Uber to Gmail to Instagram to YouTube. I No app on my phone works. I've had no access to money for two years. I was in jail for 93 days. I was locked in my house for five months. I wasn't allowed to leave my house. Okay, I live in a very nice mansion, but imagine mm. I didn't. How do you make money when you're locked in your house? You're financially decimated. All my cars are taken off me. $900,000 in cash was taken off me. All my gold was taken off me. My diamond watch collection was taken off me. My children were harassed. The mothers of my children were arrested. Uh, it, the, the, the crap I've been through is monumental. Most women couldn't handle that. Most men couldn't handle yeah. that. And the women near me say the same thing. They say, you're a hero. And I think a woman's job to a man is to power him up with love and let him go. It's like, be, feed the bear and let the bear go fight. You give the bear some food and then you say, go kill. And that's a woman's job. She loves her man and she and she gives her man power to go out there and face the world. It's not her job to face the world. It's yeah. our job to face the world. And she powers us with love. And what your what your wife said is perfectly correct. She's there to help you and amplify you and power you up and make you as powerful a force as possible in the world, whether it's your vote or anything else. That is a woman's job. And a woman who is good at being a woman will do exactly that. She isn't going to come along and try and oppose her man or be as good at her as her man at anything. My girl will, op will open say to me, I can't, I'm not as organized as you. I'm not as smart as you. I'm not as quick as you. I'm not as fast as you. I'm not as brave as you. All the things you do, I don't know how you do it, but I'll make you, I'll try and love you and make you happy. So mm. you're good at doing them. And that's why we're such a powerful force. And that's why we work so fantastically together, which goes into another point earlier uh, that we were saying earlier about women defending ideas. It's kind of interesting because we can apply this to feminism. Also, women don't hold ideas without men because women can't defend ideas. Mm. Feminists, feminism's a male movement because feminists need men as much as they demonize men. Because if you have a, a open conversation with a feminist and you really disagree with her and you oppose it and she gets offended or upset, she's going to call the police and she's going to call men. <laughs> she is. Like if you look at a society where women can't call the police, how many are feminists? Mm. None. Feminism is supported by men and masculine capability and masculine threat of violence like, like the rest of society. Every idea on the planet, I don't think many people understand this, Every idea on the planet is backed by the threat of violence. We say we live in a peaceful society. That's a scam. Any idea any of us hold is backed by the threat of violence. The government says you need to pay your parking ticket. If you don't pay it, they'll add more money. And if you don't pay it, they'll send you a court summons. And if you don't go, they'll send a bailiff to take things from your house. And if you refuse to let them in, police will come. And if you refuse to comply with the police, they get violent. It all comes down to violence in the end. Mm. So if you have any idea anywhere, even feminism, a woman will sit there and say, men are trash. And a man will sit there and be insulted by it. And let's say that man is low IQ and he's an idiot. And he says, don't call me trash again. I find that offensive. If a man calls me trash, I'll punch him in the face. And you said we're equal. So don't call me trash again because I see us as equal now. Don't do it. And she goes, I still think you're trash. She's doing that because she knows she can call the police. And the police are men with guns, masculine men, violent men. The exact men she said were toxically masculine and she didn't like, she now relies on to insult. So it's insane that all ideas in society are backed by violence, which means all ideas in society are backed by men and our innate capability for violence, meaning feminism is supported because men allow it to exist. And feminism requires male violence and toxically masculine males more than nearly any other idea, which shows how false the whole thing is. So we're talking about do women even have any ideas and can they support any ideas because they can't handle the ostracized, uh, being ostracized? Do women have any ideas at all without men? Or do women always, have they always, since the dawn of human time, found a man they respect and adopt his ideas like your wife did? Maybe they've always done that. Has there ever been a society of, of women where the women held vastly different ideas to the men ever? I don't, has there ever been? Well, then, cause I have a daughter, you have a daughter. Correct. And people are watching and be like, you can't say that cause you guys have daughters. I hear it all the time. Right. R regardless. My daughter has my ideas. Mm. I'll, I'll just say it right now. My daughter's going to listen to me. And I think of women and I want my daughter to be able to work because she chooses to work, yep. not because she has to work. Agreed. If she wants to pursue a career of something of passion, of embetterment of the world, amazing. Yep. If you want to make a decision to better society and you have the ability to learn and think and you want to create change, amazing. If you have to grow up and you have to work a job that you absolutely hate just for the sake of working, I'm adamantly against that.
Yeah. I, that's the guy's rule. A hundred percent. And I think, I think everyone often comes at me with that as well. They're like, well, you have daughters. Why mm. do you think what you think? What did I just say? That's bad. Mm. I said that men protect ideas in the world. We protect masculine ideas and we protect the ideas of women. Women adhere to male ideas because women can't defend an idea. That's what I've said. And it's nothing bad about that. And I'll make it clear how my daughter's life is going to work. I'm in charge because I'm responsible. You are going to listen to your father. I'm going to pay for you and take care of you. Those two things go hand in hand. If you stop listening to me, I will not take care of you. If you find another man, he better take care of you, which means you have to be very careful who you choose mm. because you're a millionaire living a princess life. You're flying on private jets at two years old and you're taken care of by your father who will die to protect you. The second you get a boyfriend, that ends hmm. and he is in charge. So if he can't put you on jets and he can't die to protect you, you better choose better. And I strongly recommend you wait a very long time and make sure your first boyfriend's your only boyfriend and you better not mess it up and you better get a good one. And I believe that if I give her a good enough life in her early years and she understands that as soon as she finds a man, she loses me, she's going to be very selective of the man she chooses because I'm a hard man to match. That's my job. And that's my goal. And I'm not going to have a daughter who disobeys me. Mm. I'm not going to have a daughter who disregards what I say and is still rewarded by my monumental competence and enormous finance. She's going to obey me and she's going to have a very good life until she finds another rich man who can do as she says, who, do, do, who, can, who can take care of her. It's as simple as that. And I don't think it's that complicated a premise. I actually think it's far more difficult to raise a son mm. than a daughter. The problem with raising a son is that, and I don't, I'm very careful about how many kids I say I have, et cetera. But when you're raising your son, the biggest problem is, is the mother. Mm. Because most mothers don't understand how difficult a boy's life needs to be for him to be truly competitive. If you're raising a daughter, it's very easy. She's a princess. She sometimes cries. You can play games with her. You make her laugh. She's best friends with the mom. It's all a big happy scenario. Ha ha ha. It's all happy. If my three-year-old daughter cries, don't care. If my three-year-old boy cries, I'm enraged. Mm. What are you crying over? Welcome to the real world, boy. What are you crying for? And, and, and when I was young, my father would walk past me and just push me over. Mm. Just push me over at random. And I'd get up. And my mom would say, why are you doing that? And he'd say, because that's, that's life. That's life as a man. You get pushed over and you just got to get up. If you're raising a son and you do that, the son may cry a bit, but he'll get over it. He'll learn the game. He'll understand the game. Your son will actually get good at the game. You'll see him start to learn to backpedal and laugh and say, ha ha ha, you didn't get me, dad. It'll all become fun. The only problem is the wife, the, the woman. Leave him alone. Hey, hey, hey. The woman makes him soft. Most women don't understand how hard life is as a man because they've never experienced it and how hard you need to be on a boy. And I said to Tristan all the time, I said, if it was just you and me raising our sons, they would be killers, bruv. Killers. Imagine that, men raising boys. Spartans. Bro, it'd be, it'd be, but the wife is all like, you know, da, da, da. so I think raising a woman, a, a boy is harder because you have the, the wife sometimes in the way of what they mm. truly need to become killers. Raising a girl is easy. I, I, I don't know what, I, I don't know what boyfriend's going to come along because my daughter's going to understand. She's going to say to her boyfriend, if, if we sleep together, all my life ends <laughs> and I'm in a Lambo and I'm in a mansion and I'm flying on jets and everything. Can you pay for this? Like, I he can't pay for it. It's over. And I, I'm on, I'm unforgiving and stubborn and she'll know that you yeah. get one shot. You get one chance. Don't mess it up. I feel like when she goes into that situation in life where she has to make a decision and you don't agree, you're going to realize raising a daughter is the hardest thing in the world because we'll now you're going to be put into a choice because she defied you at something you were adamantly against, but she's still your daughter. And then now you're really going to have to make a hard decision. I know what you're saying. Because you say, that's it. These are my rules. But when it happens, you're like, but I love her. You know what? You're totally right. But the thing is, I'm a feminist. <laughs> so as a feminist, I believe that women are adults and mm. they're sovereign individuals and they come to their own conclusions and make their own choices. Mm. And I believe just as I'd explain to a man very calmly, mm. fairly, and rationally that if there is cause and effect in this universe and that all of their actions will have an equal and opposite reaction. And I believe that women are just as capable. So when I explain to her that her life ends the second she chooses a man, and if that man cannot replicate the life I currently provide for her, she's going to have to do with that substandard version of reality. Mm her choice to make and i will tell you one thing matt i am as stubborn as they come i am as if if i won't listen to the matrix and i'll go <laughs> to a jail cell with the cockroaches nobody tells me what to do and i am that guy and yeah i'll love her with all my heart but you know what 
I'll love her and she'll be crying her eyes out. I made a mistake. I'm going to sit there and say, I told you Mm. I was right. Wasn't I? You were right. You were right. I know. Okay. So how about this? You can remember that I was right. And you remember you made a bad decision and you can continue with your life knowing that for the rest of human time. Cause I don't make, I'm not, I don't give second chances like that. I've never been that guy. And the funny thing about being a girl dad is that you say all of that and the time comes. We'll see. And maybe sometimes you break. We'll see. <laughs> you know? And yeah. I don't want to encourage it because maybe she's watching. And she's we'll like, see. I knew it. <laughs> you know what? We'll see. It's kind of funny though, because it's one of those things. I, but I've heard, I've heard that my whole life. Like yeah. people, people have often said that to me in other scenarios. They said, mm. when you meet a woman you truly love, mm. you'll change. I don't need to change because I'm not wrong. Mm. If I have a woman I truly love with all my heart, and I take care of her absolutely completely. And I adore her. And she's my number one. And she's my partner. And I think about her all the time. But she oversteps. She's gone. I am as stubborn as they come. Mm. And I have firm lines for the reason we said earlier. If you give an inch, yeah. take a mile. I'm a very fair man. I'm firm, but I'm fair. I'm harsh, but I am fair. I will warn you in advance. I'm that guy who says, please don't talk to me that way. I will smash your face. in. Mm. Please stop walk back and they won't do it. And then I'll hurt them. I, I'm very fair all of the time. And I've been told the same thing in relationships and I've never yet crumbled. And we'll see with my daughter, perhaps God will teach me a lesson. We will see, but I'm not concerned about my daughters. Truthfully. Yeah. I think my daughters will be looking for a, fa- a man like their father. And if they do that, then they'll be okay. Because I know the kind of man I am. I'm worried about my sons, not because it's going to be, not because it's particularly difficult. I just feel like I have a very vested interest because they're going to be the kings of an empire. Mm. So they're going to be inheriting hundreds of millions of dollars. They're going to be known as my son. I'm not having some average son. Like, no, he has to be a warlord. I expect for everyone watching this, the UFC roster in the f- in, in 20 years from now, Tate, 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 Tate. That's what it's going to be because they don't need to make money. I have money. So they're just going to be killers. They're going to be warriors. So I, I feel like I have a huge responsibility for my boys more than my girls. Maybe that's misogynistic, but I just, that's how I feel. Yeah, I think it's different with guys and girls. It's, uh, it's tough, you know, because guys, if you set these huge expectations for them and if they feel like they're not going to meet it, then it's not easy. Sometimes they crumble yeah. and they go further down than you want them to because they feel like they couldn't live up to the expectation and it crushes them internally. Yeah. And it's good because if they step out of it and they're able to fight through it, they become greater than you. Yep, yep, yep. If they don't become greater than you, then forever they're like, I'm not my dad. Well, you know, that's true, but I'm not going to lie. I have massive expectations (laughs) for all of my kids. They better be better than me at everything. I refuse to accept the expectations too high. I don't care. Don't care if the pressure's too large. Yes, you have massive shoes to fill. Get to work. I am refusing to allow... Bro... If my father was still alive and I tried to say, oh, dad, you know, the last name Tate is hard to live up to and I don't know if I can do it. He would, bro, I don't think I would have, I wouldn't be alive. Be like, what, what's wrong with you, son? Like I, I was raised, it's kind of interesting because I was raised in that environment mm. where I had massive expectations on my name, put on me because of my last name. And it encouraged me to thrive. All it did was make me paranoid. I'm not working hard enough. All it did was make me concerned that I don't try hard enough. And even if I'm trying my best, I still feel like I'm not trying hard enough. But that's propelled me to the massive success I currently enjoy. I'm the highest possible echelons of finance and masculine capability. I'm happy I had that expectation on me. I would change nothing about my childhood. And I want massive expectation on my children. And if they fail, that's fine. But what did we say earlier about indoctrinating our children? That's what I expect. And if they fail, it's not going to be because of the ideas I put in their mind. It's going to be because of the ideas the Matrix has put in their mind which means I've, I guess, to a degree failed as a parent and they failed as a human to listen to them. I'm going to sit and say to my kid, no, you are the son of Andrew Tate. You have every gift God could give you genetically. I know how good I am. I know how good you can be if you tried like I tried. You even have more advantages because I grew up with no money. You're rich now. You haven't even got to worry about eating. I didn't have food. You have food. You could do anything. If he starts to sit there and doubt himself, it's because the matrix got to him, which to a degree is my failing. And also it's his failing for listening. He should believe in himself absolutely and completely. And there should be a podcast in 20 years from now where a man sits down who's slicker talking Mm. than I am, who's more knowledgeable than I am, wiser, smarter, all of it. I expect the next agents of the Matrix to be furious at my offspring and putting them in jail. I expect absolutely nothing less. So do you want 
your sons to follow in your footsteps of being the guy that challenges authority, goes against the establishment. Do you want that for them? Or do you want them? Or do you have this desire? Like, I kind of wish they were a little bit compliant because they'd live easier, simpler lives. Nope. They're born for war. <laughs> they are born for war. All of my sons will be born for war. All 30 Andrew Tates will exist purely to be a thorn in the side of authority for the rest of human time and pay homage to me. And when people ask them on future podcasts, why are you such a pain in the ass to the Matrix? Why don't you have your AI QR code tattooed on your head? They're going to say, because my father wouldn't allow it. And I will live into eternity in the memories of society because all of my 30 sons are continually resisting the enslavement of humanity. John Connor will be replaced by the future Andrew Tate against Skynet. That's why they exist. I'm not paying for their lives or dealing with their mothers for anything other than their resistance to enslavement. And you wonder why they want to cancel you. <laughs> Take me to jail. Put me in jail. It's fine. I, I don't live in fear. I want to create a generation of me to go against the Matrix, but I don't understand why they hate me. No, I understand. <laughs> yeah. I understand yeah. very well. Yeah, I'm, I'm obviously. <laughs> I'm, I'm surprised I'm still breathing, to be honest with you. Do you what do you think they're actually going to do? Do you think they're really going to come after you? Like, How deep of an attack do you honestly think this is? I think this was a warning shot. Yeah. Because it's serious, but... And it, I don't want to belittle or degrade kind of the charges that you're going against and what you're going up against. But it could be worse. For sure. They have tried to financially decimate me and they've attempted to damage my reputation, but people no longer believe the lies of the Matrix. This was a warning shot. I have lost probably in excess of 60 or $70 million. They've tried to financially cripple me and they thought I'd be scared and I would shut up. I have a feeling if I wasn't so vocal about the fact I'll never sell my soul, they would have come along with another sponsorship deal. Mm. I think they would have actually tried to give me a lifeboat and said, ah, now you're broke. Do you want to sign it now? Mm. And now we'll make the media shut up about you. But they know I'll never sign it. So we'll see if that comes. I feel like this case is absolute garbage. It was a warning shot. It'll be dropped soon. But I have a feeling if I'm not quiet within the next three to four years, I'll end up in a cell for a very long time. Five, probably a four or five year stretch. And then unless the culture of the world changes significantly after that, we'll have to see what happens. However, if Trump wins and the culture changes and people continue to not believe, it's going to be a lot harder for them to lock me up. We're going to have to see. Do you think, um, because right now you're, you're online, they let you be on a line of it, depending on the platform. Yeah. I put up a video the other day and I said, I'm going to Romania and I'm going to go meet with the brothers. I never said your name, yep. nothing, but TikTok. They deleted it before it got one view. Because usually if I put up a video on TikTok and they don't like the idea, they'll let it get like maybe 500,000 views and then they'll delete it, yep. right? They won't let it go, but they'll delete it and they'll say misinformation or hateful speech or hateful ideology. I get it all the time. I put up a video, didn't mention your name, showed a picture real quickly and it got deleted before it got one view. Yep. They are using AI facial recognition to go through the videos and identify, um, you know, who's in there and what the topics are. They're not even listening to words anymore. They're right. using AI, yep. which is really scary. Yep. If they wanted to cancel you, wouldn't they just put you into the algorithm and say he can't amplify his voice any longer? Do they even have to do all this charade of trial? Yeah. So TikTok has the most advanced AI in regards to deleting me. Meta are trying to do the same thing, but they're not as effective. Mm. Cause it's actually very advanced technology. TikTok is quite impressive with how heavily they've suppressed me. And that shows how heavily they're going to suppress dissenting voices in future. I'll be honest right now and tell everyone. TikTok started banning me. So then my team would invert the videos mm. because my face would be inverted. And that would escape the ban for two weeks. It's like the Borg. Mm. You ever watch Star Trek? Mm -hmm. The Borg adapts. Yeah. And then they'd get rid of the inversion. And then we'd put a voice muffler on it. Then they'd get rid of the voice muffler. And then we'd use a cartoon version of me. And they'd identify the cartoon somehow. Then static pictures of me, like you just named, mm. they get rid of. Then my voice. That TikTok are sitting there at the very cutting edge of AI specifically to get rid of me. <laughs> they hate me. TikTok do. And I think the reason for that is because they were dragged into the Senate and they were attacked for hateful ideologies and mm. dangerous ideologies. And they saw the future of their platform was contingent on getting me off of it because yeah. I'm seen as dangerous to the Democrats and the Democrats were hammering them. And they thought we had to get rid of Andrew or TikTok's going to get banned because I was everywhere. So they've literally invented brand new technology to get rid of me, which means the future for anybody else with the dissenting voice is dangerous because it starts with me 
And soon it's all of you who don't agree that your son should chop his dick off. It's coming for all of you. Because <laughs> people meta, can- meta are trying the same. YouTube tried the same. But the problem with Meta and YouTube is they're failing and they're losing to TikTok right yeah. now. And they need views. And yeah. I have views. So they kind of let it slide. And then we have Rumble and X, which are as close as you can get to free speech on the yeah. world today. And they're doing a fantastic job. It's keeping the light alive. Yeah. But um, I, yeah. I think Rumble and X are doing a fantastic job. They're just not... YouTube, they're not TikTok, they're not Instagram yet. They're not yet. But the the one thing about power, the only mm. guarantee of power is that one day you're going to lose it. Yeah. The only guarantee the universe gives you when you have power is that one day you are going to lose it. Please listen to this at home and remember it. So if you're a man right now and your woman does everything you say and she adores you because you have power over her because she she respects you, the only guarantee of that power is that one day it's going to wane and you have to be prepared for that. And I think that these social media platforms that currently have all the power are abusing it, thinking that they're going to have it forever. And the harder you abuse your power, the harder you use your power, the quicker it runs out. It's, a, it's like a glass of water. If you keep pouring it out, the faster you pour, the harder you pour, the quicker it runs out. It's actually a very interesting year because we have the election year. There's going to be a lot of uh, information coming out, which normally they would say is disinformation, mm. misinformation, dangerous information. But people want to hear it. And they can't ban everybody. So depending how much power they utilize, the more they utilize, the quicker it's going to be exhausted. And that's going to amplify platforms like Rumble and X. If I was an investor, if I wasn't completely broke because Decot took all my money, I would invest very heavily in Rumble stock mm. because I believe that it's going to, I believe that as the matrix continues to attempt censorship, the free platform, the free speech platforms are going to explode. I think that, Although you're right, they're not currently YouTube. I think they will be soon. I truly believe that people have had enough of this garbage. I said it when I was first canceled in August of 2022. When I was first canceled, I said it on the Patrick Beth David podcast. I said, everyone's tired of this crap. Mm. There's a lot of pressure behind the dam. Everyone's sad about it. But all it takes for the dam to break is a crack. And the crack in the dam is going to be somebody who is canceled and ends up larger than they were before their cancellation. Because until I was canceled, when you got canceled, you vanished. I was the first one who got canceled and got bigger. Mm. Then they put me in jail and I got bigger. They're going to put me back and I'm going to get bigger. Then they're going to kill me. That's what's going to happen. And I think now we've reached a critical stage where the harder they try to censor, the bigger they're going to make the other platforms. That's all they're going to do. And that wasn't that way before. I love Rumble and they've been fantastic to me. Mm. But I ask people, who heard of Rumble before I moved to Rumble? When did you see Rumble on Twitter before I moved to Rumble? Honestly. Mm. And now we, and there's other big names on there. And who've done a fantastic job also, who I want to give credit to. Dan is a fantastic name. Russell Brand's a fantastic name. Mm. And you're on Rumble. Mm. But I feel like it's getting difficult for the social media platforms now. Because before it was just, ah, cancel him, get rid of him. And he'll disappear. Yeah. But now it's cancel him, get rid of him. He exists somewhere else. So they're funding their competitor. They're providing content to their competitors now. I feel like the YouTube boardroom now is a lot more complicated when they sit around and go, this person's saying this, but he gets a lot of views. Do we, do we cancel it? Yeah. Uh, he's going to move to Rumble. He's still going to be heard. We're losing the ad rev. Ah, and they fall apart. So I don't know. I, I, think, I think we'll be okay. I think the biggest difference between like a Rumble and a YouTube, and I think why, it's tough because we live in a clicks and views economy. Yeah. And on YouTube, anyone can post any random video and somehow hits the algorithm and it can go 100 million views. Yeah. Like for, and in, on any given day. Yeah. It happens to people all the time. They get addicted and they never leave. On Rumble, it's peop- you have to be known and build your brand elsewhere to bring them with you to Rumble. For it's now, yes. really hard for discovery. Yes. And that's maybe what people chase, right? People want to get discovered. Yeah. And it's easier to get discovered on one of the bigger platforms because they promote discovery a little bit more versus the ability for free speech. Good. So it sounds like an, on- an onboarding platform. So you mm. start getting discovered on YouTube. You make sure you back up all your videos on Rumble, which you can do instantly. There's an algorithm which allows you to upload to YouTube and it automatically backs up your plat- your content on Rumble. And then when you eventually get canceled for having an opinion, you'll have a Rumble platform ready for you. <laughs> Buy, <laughs> Rumble like a solution. Buy Rumble stock. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I love it. I I enjoy it. I enjoy it over there. I feel like the engagement is better. Yeah. Um, I really like that they really heavily try to push the live stream part, yep. which I think is fantastic. I think streaming is more fun than posting a video yeah. because you get the live chat interaction. Of course. And just seeing the comments, it's like, all right, whatever I'm talking about, it's stupid. No one cares. Yeah. But you say something that hits and everyone goes wild. You're yeah. like, all right, I get it. Yeah, yeah. I like this point. I'm going to push into this. Yeah. You get that real-time feedback, which yeah. I think is amazing. Absolutely. Um, and YouTube live stream just isn't as much fun. 
I go, I get, I get five times the viewers on rumble live stream than I ever go on YouTube. Really? Yep. Yeah. YouTube was suppressing me heavily. Mm. So that's another thing. If you have dissenting ideas, I'll say this to anyone at home. If you have any kind of opinion at all, and you think that YouTube's better for discovery, perhaps it is. But if you get any kind of fan base, it's better to be on rumble because YouTube will suppress you. They, they're they're. What did we say earlier about algorithms and how they're trying to make you as profitable as possible mm. by learning your behaviors and then trying to alter your behaviors. So you spend money. They'll do the same thing to alter your behaviors. So you're suppressed or so you don't speak as much. If you speak about a certain subject, you get less views, which will make you less inclined to speak about that subject because they yeah. want to control the populace. We're living in an information war. It's all an information war. And these huge platforms are the weapons of war they're using against us. I saw a really interesting video on Twitter the other day about Alicia Keys during the Super Bowl performance. Mm. And it was someone recording the TV screen with their phone. And the first note she hit, or one of the first notes, was a sour note. Mm -hmm. She messed up the note. And then when they watched the video back on YouTube, the note was perfect. Really? They altered history. Wow. And they're saying that that's how scary it is, that if I hadn't seen this in real time uh -huh. with my own eyes, I wouldn't believe she'd missed that note. Yeah. And if I look it up on the internet, she hasn't missed a note. So as far as history is concerned, after I'm dead and this video is gone and everyone forgets in a few weeks from now, as far as history is concerned, her note was perfect. They have altered history. They alter history by controlling the information. That's only a singing note. It doesn't matter. Yeah. But wait till that applies to everything else. And it already has. Mm. Every single war you look up, the good guys, the bad guys, who did what, why, who won what war, it's all a lie. Everything's a lie. If 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 the news we get now is a lie, imagine how big of a lie history is. <sighs> Bro, you want to go down a rabbit hole. Yeah. Every single thing you think you know about the good guys and the bad guys and history, and it's all a lie. So it's scary. So, yeah, I mean... How how do we even find a solution to these things? It's it's extremely difficult. But that Alicia Keys video, for some reason, really concerned me. It made me think, if they can alter history over something as as, as unimportant as a singing note. Well, the crazy part is, eventually, someone's going to be like, remember when Alicia Keys missed that note? No, she didn't. And they're like, yeah, no, she didn't. Oh, cancel this guy. This guy's spreading misinformation. misinformation. Why are you lying about Alicia Keys? Then yeah. he'll get a lawsuit, a defamation lawsuit, yep. and he'll end up paying a bunch of money. And he'll say... But I know she sung it wrong. And they say, well, we've looked up the note. It's perfect. Yeah. They will gaslight you. I'll take you an example. I guarantee if you look up the COVID pandemic on Wikipedia, it sounds mm. terrifying. Mm. This amount of people died. This many people locked in their house. You had to get the vaccine. You needed eight of them or you were susceptible to a, illness, a winter of severe illness and death. This many people in this country died. You mm. couldn't travel. You couldn't fly. Borders were locked. People couldn't go to funerals. You couldn't see your grandma. You were stuck in your house. We had to do like you'd look it up in 100 years from now and go, whoa, mm -hmm. that was scary. And what was the reality? The reality was I was walking around with no mask on telling everyone to get fucked and it was fine. Mm. They've altered history they've literally altered history the version of history you're going to read it was nothing like the actual event so the, we live in a post-truth world yeah like it's besides your own eyes what can you trust and that's what's even scary because there's a huge contingent of the population who don't believe their own eyes yeah they'll sit there and look at a man and go that's a girl because they're told to. So they, if you can't believe anything the matrix tells you, you can't believe anything the history books tell you. You can't believe any study because the study says the vaccine was effective. So you can't believe any study. All you can believe is your own eyes. And there's a huge bunch of the population who don't even believe their own eyes. This is why going back to the very earlier point we said when I said, I don't let women drive me. And someone comes, well, insurance statistics say, vaccine statistics said. Mm. So I don't give a fuck what insurance statistics say. Let me tell you what I've seen. Every single time I see a car hit a tree for basically no reason, it was a chick driving. So I don't get in a car with women. That's what I've seen with my eyes and I'm stubborn and I believe them. But most people don't even believe their own eyes anymore. There are people who will be in a car crash with a woman 10 times and then read those insurance statistics and go, I must be wrong because the matrix told me they drive better than me. And then go and just get back in the car. And that's concerning because newspapers like the New York Times, they are the record keepers of history. Yep. And in 50 years or 100 years, or we look back 50 years, like what happened 50 years ago, you look at the New York Times and that's what happened. Yep. Regardless of what really happened, yep. the New York Times decides what's truth. Yep. And they are so biased yep. in their opinion and how they present facts now. You're a misogynist. I'm a misogynist. You're a misogynist. And even if we, all we did was support women, if it's in the New York Times right. in 50 years, that's how history will remember us. That's right. And I think that's a scary thing. People don't realize how manipulated our realities are. Yep. And it doesn't matter if what you believe now, because later they will convince you you believed otherwise. That's right. So the, according, if you look up the BBC archives, I'm the worst man in the world. 
I'm the most dangerous person on the planet. The fact that, I mean, the UK hates me the most, but the fact that UK has a stabbing epidemic, an acid attack epidemic, mm. random people turning up on the borders without passports, homeless crisis, energy crisis, old people freeze to death because they can't afford their electricity bills. Foods is crazy. Inflation. It's just entered a recession. The entire country is failing in real time by every metric you can measure a society by. And what do the politicians talk about when they go to parliament? Andrew Tate said women can't drive. <laughs> Andrew Tate said women can't drive. We need to stop this man. Insane. What they're actually doing, and I don't think many people realize, is what politicians and the elites have come up with this great idea is that they don't want to fix any of the problems of society. What they want to do is attack the people who highlight the problems of society. So we have all these problems and we don't want to fix them. So let's get anyone who tells people about the problems in trouble so that nobody talks about them so they can continue rampantly. So they don't want to fix the crime in the inner cities. But if you talk about it, you get in trouble. That's what they're doing now. They're shutting up the people who point out the obvious as opposed to fixing the things that need to be fixed. Thinking about crime, as you, over the last three or four years, your growth has been from like known to like kind of known to like astronomically known. At what point during your rise did you realize I need security? Yeah. So here in Romania, I'm actually very safe. Mm. And, um, I, I'm on bail now, so I can't carry a weapon anymore, but I, I was, and there's no guns here. So mm. I was, it's very rare for someone to be able to carry a weapon here. So that put me in a unique position. The main reason I had security initially was so that I didn't have to reject people taking photos and stuff and trying to be polite mm. because when someone goes, Hey, can you take a photo? It looks bad when you say no, but they don't understand that it happens 300 times a day and you can't function. You can't go anywhere. You can't do anything. You can't eat a meal. You can't do anything without photo, photo, photo. Mm. And it ruins your day. So that's kind of where it started. And then um, deflect to them to have them say no. Yeah. So you don't have to do it. That's right. That's why it started domestically. Internationally, mm. I've always known I need security. In London, I'm extremely security conscious. I, have a, I think I have six guys in London for mm. me. So it depends where I was, where I, where I needed it. But we're getting to a point now. It depends on the place you go, right? In the Western world, it's kind of crazy that you need security so heavily. Here in Romania, I can not bring my guards and I can drive a $5 million Bugatti and wear a half a million dollar watch and I have no problems, but I would never do that in Chicago or mm -hmm. New York or Miami or London or Paris. It's kind of scary. The world's getting there. And uh, as soon as you start getting well-known, you're a target. As soon as people start recognizing you, you now become a target in the West. It's actually quite interesting in the division of mentalities because I think the reason you're not a target here in Romania, although it's a poor country, is that wealth here is still respected and to a degree it's semi-feared. Mm. So if they see somebody with a lot of money, they're like, who does he know? How does he have all that money? I don't want to mess with him. They're like, um, but, like they're but, scared of money. Whereas but, in the West, if you have money, you're a target, you know? But doesn't that make you in a, the elite of Romania? Well, yeah. I mean, <laughs> you know what I mean? I, kind of like what we're fighting against in the West. You're like one of them here. But it also goes you against- you feel that way at all? But it also goes against you, right? Because uh -huh. I'm also going to be very understanding- Let's look at my situation, why I was in jail for three months on preventative detention before mm. trial. I am very logical, like I said, about removing, emo removing emotionality. If I was a Romanian judge, mm. from I'm 72 years old, I'm a woman, I'm from communism, whatever, and I get the paperwork, and there's papers like this, and I'm not reading them all because I'm busy, and I see me. I look at me, and I go, okay, Bugatti, Ferrari, private jet, girls, girls, mansion, girls, human trafficking, money laundering, probably. Makes sense. It, it makes sense. Yeah. I mean, what, how many cars? 62 supercars? Yeah. All right. Jail, sir. Like, yeah. I, it makes sense. So there's pros and cons, right? Perception is reality mm. to a degree. And I guess maybe not me because I'm a very nice man. Mm. But many of the guys in Romania with a whole bunch of money, you wouldn't want to mess with. Yeah. So, so the criminal will look at a Lamborghini and go, I don't want to break into a Lambo. Mm. I want to break into a Honda. Yeah. Because the Lambo, if that guy finds out, I'm toast. Whereas in the West, it's not like that. In the West, they want the Lambo. Mm. So wealth makes you a target in the West, whereas it makes you the opposite here in the East. But I've known, I, I, I knew I needed security. In fact, I can tell you an exact story, actually. Let me tell you an exact story mm. of when I knew. This is about three years ago when I first started really blowing up. And I started, the word brokies, I made super popular. Yeah. And I was in London and I had a uh, appointment. I can't remember why I needed a blood test or something. I can't remember what it was. And I was, I told the, tech, uh, the Uber to drop me at this doctor's and it dropped me off and I couldn't find the door, the entrance to the doctor's place. And I'm walking up and down this street in London about three and a half years ago. And like these six dudes across the street go, yo, that's the dude that called us broke. <laughs> and I remember laughing going, hi guys like this. Yeah. And they kind of laughed. And then I thought that might've gone wrong. That could have gone the <laughs> other way. 
And from there, I decided to only have security. I said, okay, if I go to London, I need security. Mm. And from there, I expanded out and I got a domestic team and, da, 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 and we, we went. You kind of get used to having them around too. Well, bro, it's uh, now I now I can't imagine living without it. Mm. Like right now, we have a guy outside the door and I have three guys downstairs yeah. and I've got a car and they're, everyone's strapped and everyone has guns. And da, da, if they didn't, I, I'm nervous as it is. I couldn't imagine living without that now. When you coin terms like brokey, which I think anyone who's watching, they know the term brokey because you coined it. Is that a conscious decision, do you think, for something like Brokey? Or did that just come out and then you're like, this hit hard because you get the reaction of the people? Well, I think if you're going to try and teach complex ideas, mm. the best thing you can do first is simplify them. So if you if you have a complex idea, not many people are interested in learning all the nuances and understanding all the details of a complex ideal off the bat. So you have to simplify it first. And then once they understand the simple version of it, if they're interested, they'll learn the more difficult and the more advanced version. And I can I said brokey a lot in my life. So I thought it was funny, yeah. but it was a very simple way. Yeah. Now we talk about how you need money. Mm. Money is the invest is the vested time and interest of other people. Money is the source of all evil. It's the source of all good. You're going to need money. If you want to protect yourself, you're going to need money inside of your fraternity. Da, 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 da. Complicated brokey. Mm. It starts with brokey. And then people go, I don't want to be a brokey. Then they want to make money. Why do they want to make money? How can they use their money to benefit themselves and the people around them? How does that resist the matrix if they can make money geographically free? Why do we need the people who believe in us to have money? Why don't we want broke people on our team? Because that, et cetera. But it starts with simple ideas. And yeah, brokey. Brokey is a great way to start with a very simple idea. What color is your Bugatti? Yeah. What color is it? Was that planned? Is that something that you preconceived? Like, I'm going to run this line. Like, you don't know if it's going to hit and it's going to go viral. Like, even if you think it will, like, it could hit, could not hit. Yeah. Was that planned, that line? It wasn't planned, no. Uh -huh. I'm just a quick thinker, and you never know that what's going to go viral. Out. It just comes out, yeah. And it, it <laughs> you never know what people are going to adopt and pick up. I mean, I, I gave myself a lot of nicknames. It was yeah. Top G that stuck. Yeah. You don't know. You just have to, you just talk and have fun, and people people adapt to the ideas. How it goes. What's one kind of phrase or kind of something that you thought would hit that just never picked up? I thought my slogan would be more popular than it is. A lot of people know it. Mm. My unmatched perspicacity coupled with sheer indefatigability makes me a feared opponent in the realm of human endeavor, but it's too complicated. It's too hard for people. Yeah, it's hard. It's hard, but that's my that's my favorite. Yeah. That's yeah. what I would love everyone to repeat because yes. it truly is all it takes to win in this world. Yeah. Unmatched perspicacity. Pay attention to everything. Perspicacity, the ability mm. to be perceptive. Pay attention all of the time. Don't wear the headphones. Listen for the enemy coming. And sheer indefatigability. Never get tired. Never give up. Never give in. Never become lazy. If you pay a lot of attention and you work all of the time, you're going to make a bunch of money. You're going to be successful. You just told the story of your podcast. You paid attention mm. and you didn't give up. You didn't even know what you were doing. You just tried it. Raw action solves everything. And I've been the same with all of my businesses. If I decide to launch a business, I'll just go and do it. I launched a school. I launched a university. I own university.com. Crazy. Yeah. Uh, the, <laughs> the large educational platforms of earth mm. can't stand me. They're trying to convince people to spend 50 grand for a degree for a useless piece of paper. And for $50, I'll teach you AI and allow you to make money in the same day. You can sign up for $50 and start making thousands of dollars in the same day with artificial intelligence. I own university.com. I started a whole school and I now have the largest ed online educational platform on the planet. How did I do that? Well, I knew I knew I knew I knew things. And I just started a school, just like you started a podcast. It's like, all right, we're launching a university. And the people on my team believed in me, and a lot of people around me call me crazy, and here we are. We're the largest. I would argue we're more profitable than Harvard or any of these other crazy ones. And they have to psyop you into getting a loan, mm. which is a huge psyop, this whole student loan guard. Well, I think that's the business, to get you to loan. Well, the, well, if their loan, if their loan existed in a, in a free and fair market, they wouldn't have a business anymore. Mm. If they said you can get a 50 grand loan and you can decide to start a business, buy a car, invest in crypto, or get a degree, who would choose a degree? Mm. Nobody. So they have to operate in a vacuum because only by operating in a vacuum can they attract any finance at all, which is why it's the biggest scam ever. My university doesn't operate in a vacuum. You can spend $49 on learning how to use artificial intelligence and becoming rich for the rest of your life or two pizzas. It's up to you. But if you're a dumbass and you choose the pizza, then you deserve your forever slavery. It's, it's, your, it's your call. But we don't operate in a vacuum, which shows that it actually has value because we have students who are voluntarily students. Whereas in the typical education educational system, are they even voluntarily students? Not really. They just don't know what to do and they get this money and they can only spend it on one thing. It's forced. And they end up going there and getting their useless degree and then crying on TikTok they can't pay their bills. And that's what happens. Well, I got two questions. One, how much did university.com cost? Can I ask? Can you answer that? Guess. You get two guesses and if you get it right, I'll tell you. I'm going to say 12 million. 
A little bit less. Literally less. Give or take eight to ten million. About that. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. I mean it I'm sure it's made back as dividends on the name alone. That's a great name. You know I what? can't believe you had it. Yeah, it's a good name. And I'll be honest with you, I haven't even yet really run the statistics on mm. whether I got my money back on my investment. I just knew it pissed the educational system. Yeah. And that's also another reason. I'll be honest with you. When I was in jail, I was trying to analyze who my enemies were. And I understood my enemies were MSM. I understood mm -hmm. I've pissed them off because I've countered their narratives. And I understand that the government are trying to sigh up the young males of earth to go and build the roads and pay 50% taxes and perhaps join the army and die in a ditch for no reason besides globalist profits. And I've upset them. And then I'm thinking of all the other power structures I've upset. Have I upset the medical establishment? Well, of course, because I was anti-vaccine and anti-COVID back during COVID. Before I was even big, people are finding all my old videos when I was one of the most vocal anti-COVID people at the very beginning of it when nobody else was. Before it was popular. Before it was so. popular, I was doing it. And then I thought, okay, so I've upset the medical system. I've upset the judicial system. I've upset MSM. I've upset the government. I've also pissed off the educational system. Hmm. And they're, they've got a lot of power and a lot of money and a lot of influence. And I was like, is there any is there any organizational structure on earth I haven't annoyed? But I bought university.com to annoy the universities. Mm. That's why I did it. I didn't even care about the investment, the return on investment. If I'm going to spend, I'll spend $10 million on a couple of cars. I may as well spend it on being a thorn in the sides of authority. So that's why I did it. Because I feel like that's one of the reasons, that's one of the first Trump lawsuits that ever happened for having Trump University. And it was a two-day course where you learn real estate concepts and people sued him because they said, we paid for Trump University, which is a two-day course. And I didn't get a university degree. And I think he got convicted for that wow. or whatever it was. And he got fined for it because he called it Trump University and people sued him for not being a real actual university. It's really interesting. And they and called I, it a scam and, and et cetera. I didn't, and I didn't know that. And that's uh -huh. really interesting. So it's a good thing I don't own university.com. Mm. Some trust fund somewhere owns university.com. Yeah. And it's a good thing I don't own the university that it leads to that's mm. owned by God knows who. And I'm just some idiot and everything I say is a lie. And I'm just some guy on the comedian. internet who just talks stuff and I'm a comedian and I'm, a, and I'm garbage. But uh. if you want to learn how to use AI and become rich <laughs> and stop being an idiot for $49, you can go to university.com and sign up. Check out my friend's website. <laughs> <laughs> this crazy guy, whoever it is from the Cook Islands who owns this trust fund, he, he knows what he's doing. I want to ask you about a couple of the more popular trending of creators of today now. Sure. We have guys like Joe Rogan. Yep who have just absolutely crushed the podcast game. Yep. And he used to be only on Spotify. Now they just gave him the biggest contract ever. He can go wherever he wants. Wow. Um, I think he, he he was only allowed on podcast. And now he's able to put his podcast on YouTube, Apple, whatever else. He got like free reign. Nice. Um, you have guys like Tucker Carlson, who went off of Fox News and now I mean, bigger than ever before. Yeah. There, there's this new um, acronym that I've saw recently. They call it MAM. Have you heard that yet? No. MAM. No. Mainstream alternative media. It's a new term they're trying to coin. Okay. So instead of mainstream media, now it's mainstream alternative, alternative media. media. Got it. And these guys are creating this new narrative, right? Okay. So the Joe Rogans, the Tucker Carlsons, the Andrew Tates, I saw you on the list. Oh, nice. Of the, the MAMs. Cool. Um, I am transgender after all. <laughs> <laughs> but there's a new movement and this alternative media movement is growing bigger than ever. Yeah. And I love what Joe's doing. I love what Tucker's doing. I love what you're doing. And then there's people that are considered kind of conservative alternative media. I don't know how much I love what they're doing. Yeah. You have a Ben Shapiro and Daily Wire and Jordan Pearson who you've somewhat been vocal about at times. Um, but they seem to be, they almost want to sound like they're anti-establishment, anti-matrix, anti-this. And a part of me is like, but I feel like they're just playing the other side of the matrix. Oh yeah, completely. They're, they're, uh, I, have to be, I want to be careful which specific names I say, but let's put it this way. We talked earlier about what the popular thing to say is and how mm. people will do it purely for the views. I think that if you're truly anti-matrix, you're not calling for people to go die in wars all of the time. I actually think, that, and, and and this is a bit of a segue toward from the question you asked, but it's true. I think one of the most heinous things people can do is to sit and, and wish for the deaths of other humans and yeah. wish for other people's sons to go die in a ditch where they don't send their own sons to do it. And a lot of these people who consider themselves conservative are just calling for ev forever war and these neocons. It's truly disgusting. And I, I agree with you. If you're truly alternative to the matrix, you also hold... If you have any, if, if your worldview is 100% aligned 
with any particular side, I would argue that you're disingenuous mm. because I hold liberal opinions. It's very liberal to support Palestine. That's what the left does, not the right. I'm considered right wing and conservative. Why am I so advent in my support for Palestine, which is a liberal ideal, right? So I hold different ideas on both sides of the fence because that's how I view the world. Some of these guys, which instantly sign up with like the Daily Wire team. I love Candace. She's amazing and she's mm. true. But some of these other people on the Daily Wire, every single thing is exactly what they were told to say and what they believe. Well, then you have to ask your que- you have to ask a question: Have they just sold their soul to the other side? Mm. Because they've got their sponsorship contract from the Daily Wire, and they say what they're supposed to say, and they repeat what they're supposed to repeat. Otherwise, they lose their money, and then you start to sit. Well, who's behind them? And, and that's where controlled opposition comes from. Controlled opposition is just going to be. I mean, if I had a whole bunch of money and I was sponsoring liberal ideals. The people who are combating those liberal ideals, if I could pay them enough money to only semi-combat the the non-important ones and allow me to get away with the really important stuff, all for a little bit of money, which I have plenty of and I don't value anyway, well, then I'd do that, wouldn't I? It'd be a fool to think there's not control with opposition in the world. I mean, when I think, you know, they've offered me a little bit of money, they've offered you a lot of money, and then we see a lot of these quote-unquote influencers that kind of all seem to be on the same page. And it makes you wonder, like, how many of these people actually took the money? And the reality is probably like most of them. Of course. Of course. I mean, I don't want to say any particular names, but there's... Yeah, it's not our business to call out other people. But but I don't want to say any names, but Ben Shapiro. (laughs) Go to war, go to war, go to war. Get the vaccine, get the vaccine, get the vaccine. Go kill people for Israel, go to war. Yeah, we need to go to war all the time. Bro, you go to war. You go to fucking war. Why are you telling everyone else to go to war? You go fight. No, you don't want to fight. You want to sit in your little desk. God's full of shit. And he's being paid to say things and he's, he's full of shit. And then he had to release a rap song to try and distract everyone for the fact he was calling for the genocide of children. And he's like, Oh, maybe if I make a fool of myself, people will forget. I don't forget. You're a dumbass. And one day I'll meet you probably because we're in the same ish spheres. And I'll look down there and call you a little nerd because you are. So get fucked. None of these people are in jail, bro. That's another thing that's, that's about politics. You talk about fraternity and we talk about Mm. the matrix and all these things. You need to be true to yourself. You have to believe your own eyes and you have to come to your own conclusions. But a lot of these people who are 100% ideologically aligned, they're just as sour as the people who are 100% ideologically aligned the other way. I, I agree. I mean, most people are somewhere in the middle. You believe some of the things on the right. You believe some of the things on the left. And that's how normal people are. That's 100%, fine. 100%. We don't have to agree on everything. It's kind of funny because I've always, I mean, the conservative movement, a lot of them kind of don't like me now. And that's mm. because I've eclipsed their relevance massively you could add them all together nobody cares but a lot of the reason they attack me is they they try and attack my morality right they Mm. say oh he did he had something to do with the webcam girls a long time ago and he swears and he did this or whatever they're complaining about and it's kind of interesting that they don't understand my affinity with people is the fact that i'm absolutely real and i'm coming from a bad area and i've had to do certain things to survive and when people from a white picket fence household who grew up in a rich enough family home where everyone had food to eat and everything was perfect, they're going to sit there and try and preach morality. Nobody listens because you had an advantage start in life. I come from a very disadvantaged point in my life and I did what I had to do to escape the poverty I was in. The people around me were killing each other. I grew up around stabbings and drug dealing and the old lady next to me got robbed and beaten to death and and they're complaining about the things I did. It's like that the the real world's a harsh world and that's where you learn the real lessons of it. So some of the conservatives who have attacked me for my morality often don't understand how they ostracize themselves amongst the general populace because if you just sit there with a very Christian upbringing, white picket fence, rich household, mom and father together and love each other, happy families, of course you're going to sit there and preach morality. Well, you, you were born in the most advantaged scenario ever i grew up in gary indiana then loot in england in a single mother household it's it's a completely different reality but virtue another, signaling on both sides yeah of course there's virtue signaling on both sides completely yeah. and i often think as well like a lot of the conservative movement a lot of them don't realize why they lose the culture war because before certain people came along and it's not only me there's others as well but i'm definitely going to take a degree of credit conservatives were so boring for so long like we've now made yeah. being conservative cool yeah. via strength, via money, via success, success. But before me, a lot of these conservatives were basically saying, don't have fun. Don't do drugs. Don't go to parties. Don't dance. Don't talk to girls. Don't like this boring. Yeah. Bro. What is it called? Um, CPAC. Yeah. 
I went to CPAC maybe five years ago. I think that's ago. going on right now, this weekend, next weekend, anyway. Okay, yeah. yeah. So I went to CPAC like five or six years ago. I can't mm -hmm. remember when I went, but I was with Paul Joseph Watson. He said, let's go to CPAC. Anyway, I went to CPAC for the first time in forever. I was just getting big online mm -hmm. and I stood around. And I remember looking around going, well, this is why we lose. Yeah. This is so fucking boring. boring. Yeah. Everyone's a dork. Everyone's a nerd. Where I mean, liberals are having fun. Mm. They're partying. They're having orgies. They're doing drugs. <laughs> I don't even do those things, yeah. but I can see why they're attractive to people. Mm. What do we have here? Nerd convention, bro. Mm. And you look at these conservatives and they're sitting there going, don't do this. Don't do this. You should live this way. It's boring. At least I'm, I've come along. And the reason I'm seen as a cultural phenomenon is I'm saying, yeah, you can be masculine and it's cool to protect what you care about, but get rich and live a good life and don't be apologetic and be a hero. They didn't preach any of that stuff. Most of the conservative movement are a bunch of boring dorks, nerds. And that's why they forever lose. And I, bro, I, I remember sitting at CPAC. I looked at Tristan and said, never again, bro. Mm. Never again. It sucked. And the conservatives have this bad habit of always celebrating too early. Yeah. They're, they're, they feel like there's a little bit of movement behind them. And I can feel it now. People are like, oh, Biden is so unpopular. Trump's going to win for sure. I'm like, bro, yeah. there's no such thing as for sure. Honestly. It's February. Yeah. We got a long way to go. Yeah. But you nerds are always celebrating too soon. Yeah. You got to live your life like it's your last day every single day. 100%. It ain't done till it's done. And like you said, we're February. A lot could happen between now and November. And they've already geared up the machine. So it's going to be very interesting to see what happens. And then I think ultimately it comes down to culture anyway. Mm. I mean, it doesn't matter who the politicians are. It matters about the culture of the country. And you can argue that in a lot of different ways. Switzerland and Iceland have massive gun ownership without mm. shootings. Why? And people will talk about the gun laws. It's not about the laws. It's about the culture. And the culture is broken. And if you want to win a cultural war as conservatives, then you have to have a cool and fun culture. Conservatives should be celebrating me. Andrew's come along and made our movement cool. But they're jealous and they're bitter and they're butthurt that I'm more relevant than them. So instead, they cry their eyes out that I have a Bugatti and they said that I shouldn't brag. <laughs> Don't brag, Andrew. Don't say you have money. Well, then how else are you going to get young teenagers interested? Mm. You dummy. I'm going to sit around saying, just don't have any fun ever. Join the conservative movement. Fucking make your bed. 12 rules to life. It's boring. Mm. It's fucking boring. I'm cool and fun. Get over it. And that's good for us as a whole because it's a culture war. And men want to be men and we want to enjoy ourselves and we want to. But you can make masculinity cool without be just completely cucking the idea of having any kind of originality or fun. That's why liberals have won for a very long time. They win. They own culture because their culture is fun. Mm. You know? The Super Bowl's fun, and that's not liberal thing. Let me take another example. Concerts. Mm. You know, I, I'm going to rant just for the sake of it. I've always found concerts amazing. Mm. When I look at them from the outside, even worse are festivals. Mm. When I observe a festival, when I am unlucky enough to have my eyes dirtied by the heinous, disgusting, the videos I see on Twitter of these humans on ketamine in the mud jumping up and down to songs they've heard 3,000 times before bumping into other sweaty bodies of the unknown peasants around them it's just so it's peasantry i i can't explain i feel elitist quite rarely because i'm a man of the people but when i see a festival i just feel disgusted people pay money to go there and then they 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 <laughs> bro just talk about slave mind talk about matrix minded fools and they're going to sit there screaming for somebody who doesn't even know they exist you could get a cancer diagnosis and you could need one dollar to pay the medical bill and live and you could write to the person who you just worshipped and jumped up and down for for hours and say please give me one dollar my life depends on it and they wouldn't even reply and you're going to go there and take drugs and jump up and down and listen to the song you can listen to on YouTube for free. And instead of sitting with your family at home and enjoying the song, because music's fine, I like the song, I'm with my people, people who I love, people I care about, I'm going to smoke my cigar and chill at home and I'm going to listen to the song. No, you're going to go to this garbage. I, I don't know. Something about festivals irk me. They really deeply upset me. And one of the great things about being rich is I don't have to talk to anyone unless I mm. want to. So if I meet somebody who's like, oh, I was at a festival last week, I will instantly end the conversation. <laughs> if I don't care if we're in the middle of a business meeting, mm. I don't care if I'm on a date, whatever. As soon as they say festival, I will never speak to them again. Because to me, that's just the height of sheep matrix mind garbage. I hate that crap.
I feel like there is a um, same with like sporting events where everyone's rooting for a side. And sometimes when I see it, I'm like, it seems so sheepish. But every once in a while, when you gather a huge amount of people and they're all rooting for the same thing, regardless of what it is, yeah. this electric energy, energy that's energy. in the air, then I'm like, all right, I kind of get it. Completely. The energy, because people want to feel like they're a part of something bigger. I get sports more than I get festivals. Mm. Because there's a competition element. The mm. festival hasn't even got a competition element, so that's worse. Well, it's who can, you know, jump higher. Oh, I guess. <laughs> Sports I can kind of get. I mean, it's certainly not my yeah. cup of tea, but I, I can kind of get it. I think there's more important issues in the world that should be addressed and focused on, but I can kind of get it. But, I mean, if you have that instinct to fight a war and feel like you're on a team, then why not fight the war for civilization like I am and like we are? Because, why join a sports team? Because that's actual the, risk. Yeah, because yeah, they don't want the real risk, <laughs> yeah. right? But wh- if you really want to do it, then do something that matters. Why do something so un- unimportant? It's kind of like somebody said to me before, they lack energy and they lack motivation. And I said, nobody lacks energy and motivation. Mm. You just focus it in the wrong directions. I would guarantee if you find a person who lacks energy and motivation, he's trying to get girls all day. He's messaging girls on Instagram all day who ignore him. I guarantee he gets road rage when somebody cuts him up. No, you get angry Mm. and you have energy and you have motivation when somebody pulls in front of you in traffic or when you see some tits on Instagram, but you don't have motivation to do anything else. You don't lack energy and motivation. It's pointing in the wrong direction. And it's the same with these sports teams. If everybody cared about their country, like they care about these stupid fucking sports teams, mm-hmm. then or cared about their family, then they then the world would be fixed. But they're distracted. We all have an innate energy inside of us. We all have a life force. And most people are just directing it in the wrong direction completely. And that's why we're getting decimated in real time. The Matrix has come along and it's distracted us all with bread and circuses. And I refuse to do it. I refuse to sign up to things that don't directly benefit my life or benefit the future for my children. I don't think if a sports team wins, it's going to benefit the future for my children. And I don't think if I jump up and down like a fucking ketamine-taking peasant in a f- concert, it's going to benefit my children. But I do think if I allow the world to 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 see truth, if I, if I try and speak up against the enslavement of humanity, that it's going to benefit my children in the future. So why would I waste my life force on anything else? I think people are just permanently distracted. I mean, isn't it funny that if you are a fanatic of your sports team, then you are embracing the culture yeah. and it's fun and you're good. If you are a fanatic for your country, your race or your people or whatever it is, yeah, you're, you're dangerous. an ism. Yeah, you're an ism <laughs> and you're dangerous and you should go to jail. Yeah, right. it's like you can comply and you can be as radical as you want. Paint your face, you know, hate the other state, hate another country if you're doing world yeah. sports. You're allowed to hate then. But if it's for any other reason, you're an ism. Interesting. Someone very smart said about three and a half hours ago or three hours ago, you have the freedom to do stupid things, mm. but you're not allowed to do anything important. Mm. Interesting. That is very <laughs> interesting. Let me see, dude, how do you have so much energy? <laughs> We've been going, I, I don't know. We may even have to cut this up into multiple parts. We've been going like three, three and a half hours and you are just as strong and as you know, animated as you were in the beginning. I mean, as at the end, as you were in the beginning. How? Because I don't waste my life force. <laughs> I haven't been to any stupid concerts. I don't take any stupid drugs. I'm not smoking weed like an idiot. I'm not cheering for a sports team. All of my life force is inside of me so I can master the seven styles of Aikido and tell the conservatives they're fucking dorks. Nerds. That's why. They're all nerds. <laughs> they're nerds. I'm full of life force. I'm the man who will struggle to the end. Uh-huh. I'm that guy. If an alligator were to get hold of me, not only would I snap its neck, but let's imagine 20 alligators got hold of me and they got lucky and somehow managed to decimate me until the, exact, until the last second where I lost consciousness, I would be snapping necks of alligators to the last second i refuse to die i'm that guy i don't waste a ounce of my life force on anything that's unimportant ever so i refuse to be distracted the matrix wants to distract me they've identified me they're like andrew tate is a threat he's full of power and he believes in god and he's a slick talker and he motivates people and he has a bunch of money and He's big and strong and tall and handsome and charming and interesting. He's got a long Johnson. We have to distract this man. (laughs) We have to give him something he's interested in outside of fighting the Matrix. And they're trying to come at me with all these beauty queens and these sponsorship contracts. And I'm resisting it all. No, I have a mission and I'm on the mission. And we're talking to the people. We must be animated. We have a job to do. We must let the people at home know that enslavement's coming for their entire life and their bloodline unless they resist. Stop watching the fucking Super Bowl. Stop going to stupid concerts. And instead, 
be motivated about your family's future. That's, I don't know how you do it all the time. That's crazy. Well, because like, obviously you have the ability to just turn that on anytime you want. Right. And that in itself is, is that a skill? Is that a learned skill? I do have some chemical enhancements. Mm. So I will be all honest and open about this. I do believe that caffeine and nicotine are super drugs. Yes. I truly believe that if you drink a bunch of coffee and smoke a bunch of cigars or cigarettes, that you're going to have fire blood. Mm. I've noticed that if I have a bunch of caffeine and a bunch of nicotine, I become very irritable. Mm. But I find being irritable is the perfect state of mind to get things done. Often people complain about being irritable or anxious or stressed, and they worry about those things. But I only feel comfortable in those scenarios. I would feel lazy if I didn't feel anxious, stressed, and irritable. I guess maybe it's different if you have a boss because you have to make sure you don't snap at your boss. Or if you have a wife, you have to be tiptoeing around or she'll leave you or something. But when you're the king of your world, like I am, and I don't have to be careful what I say to anybody. and I can shout anytime I want. I want to be as irritable as possible because it gives me the energy and the fire I need to get things done. So I drink a lot of coffee. I smoke a lot of cigars. I only eat once a day. I like to be hungry all of the time because once again, that adds to my irritability. I think irritability is a superpower. Why not? I feel like after all this is done, I'm going to like sit back, reflect, think, okay, what was, what do I think Andrew Tate would be like? And what is he now after sitting here for three hours talking about you? And I'm going to be, I feel like that reflection may be the most honest thing about everything. Well, that'd be interesting. <laughs> Make a video on it. I'll watch I, it. I will. I'll watch it. Because uh, I, I think it's fascinating because people think, um, is Andrew Tate real? People think that all the time, right? Yeah. And sitting here for hours, I'm like, bro, he is so real, right? Yeah, I, I, and it's a nuance and it's a combination of having original, well-thought-out ideas with a little bit of showmanship, yeah. with a little bit of, I really believe what it is, and I also understand how to use certain words to get my message across. It's this combination that if you don't really experience it and think about it, maybe you'll miss it. Yeah, and, and I feel like, I'll be honest. I mean, I can say here, there mm. are times where I'll be deliberately abrasive with some of my ideas. Mm. And there's ways to say things as well, which deliberately upset people. And it has impact. It makes sense. I mean, I get it. That's right. I can say men should protect women. Mm. Or I can say females are weak. Mm -hmm. And one of them is going to ignite the feminists and one of them is not. So it depends what my end objective is and my goal is. I don't think a lot of people think about what their end objective and goal is. Sometimes it's good to get people upset. Sometimes it's not. Sometimes I want people to agree with me via affinity. Sometimes I want them to argue a point. If I was to sit with a feminist, I wouldn't say, I would start by saying men should protect women mm. and see what they say. And then at some point I would say females are weak to upset her, to make her deliberately start trying to use an exception to disprove the rule because I know she will lose that argument. So I'll put her in a losing fight. What does, she, what does the art of war say? Mm. Enter a battle after you know you have won. So I put her in a losing fight because women are not as strong as men. So I'll say it in a way where she feels like she has to defend the idea even though she knows and everyone knows innately that she is incorrect. So I'm quite particular with my language depending what I'm trying to achieve. But that's the goal of it all, right? And I actually find it amazing that so many people go through the world without the ability to correctly translate their thoughts into speech. I think mm. that's one of the greatest superpowers on earth. Yeah. And a lot of people think things and they can't explain it in a way that makes other people at least understand why they think the way they think. And I'm not going to lie, going back to a point we made earlier, one of my biggest worries about AI is that people will become as smart as me. That's going to piss me off. Mm. I don't want that to happen. I, I want to be the last. I want to be the last slick talker on earth. I don't want them all to have these neuro chips and be as good as I am. But we'll see. Maybe that's going to change in the future. Also, there, there was this one take that you had early on that I really loved, and it was depression isn't real. Yeah, you say that, and over time you've kind of stepped back on that a little bit because people have gotten so crazy, and you and you changed it to I don't think depression isn't real. I'll double down. Yeah, right now, I'll, I'll explain it again. <laughs> I don't, I'm going to try and explain it to people at home so they can understand mm. it. So I'm going to talk. I liked it in the more abrasive fashion. Yeah. I thought it was more impactful. No, depression isn't real. Depression isn't real. And I'm going to explain to you why I say that. And when I say that people at home try and argue against it because they don't understand the premise behind the idea. If I don't believe in depression, I cannot become depressed. As I've said on many podcasts before, if you have two people inside of a haunted house and there's a noise in the night. The one who doesn't believe in ghosts will assume it is wind and go back to sleep. The one who believes in ghosts will assume it's a ghost. He will then wake up and panic and he will be afraid and he'll call an exorcist. It is the belief in the ghost that gives it power, not the noise itself. The reason I say depression isn't real is because now I can no longer become depressed because I don't believe it's real. So if I get sent to a Romanian jail cell and I have no idea how long I'm going to be in there for, 
and I'm suffering in there. I can't become a depressed person because I don't believe in the ideal or the mental model of depression. Believing in it gives it power. And I refuse to believe in things that take away power from me. And anybody who sits at home and argues with me that depression is real, why would I adopt your thinking if it makes me less powerful? Why would I adopt your thinking if it le- makes me less capable of dealing with difficult scenarios? This isn't even about being correct anymore. This is about adopting a mental model which makes me as competitive as possible. If me believing depression is real will put me in a position where I believe I'm a depressed person and I might want to kill myself, why would I believe in it? That sounds terrible. It sounds like setting myself on fire. I refuse. Depression is not real, so I cannot become depressed. That is what I believe, and you cannot change my mind because changing my mind will make me weaker. And why would I adopt the thinking or the mental model of somebody weaker than me? I don't believe in depression. That's the bottom line of it. So it's not real. People argue with me, and they come at me with these matrix statistics. And there's a study here. It there's a study. In this this and- study <laughs> says, but I don't believe in studies. Mm. It's, it's hard. To, I don't believe in studies. You can come at me with a million studies about depression. I don't believe that depression is an illness you catch from the sky and your brain is chemically imbalanced. Mental illness is real. PTSD is real. Mm. But that's based on an event. Something has happened. I believe in general, most of these depressed people is massively overdiagnosed. They need to take some agency and responsibility for their own lives. And I believe if they stop believing in this cure-all excuse of depression and instead start believing in working hard and becoming the kind of person they know they could be, they'll feel a lot better. The number of people who have said the gym has cured my depression. Yeah. Then how is it a mental illness? If the gym cured your depression, how is it an imbalance of chemicals in your brain if going to the gym and dedicating yourself and working hard cured it? Explain that to me. It doesn't even make sense. It's, you know what it is? What did we say earlier about the matrix trying to push all ideas that promote selfishness? What is depression besides ultimate selfishness? Depression isn't real. And if you're depressed and you want to argue with me and prove to me that it is real, you're going to start sending me long emails about how sad you are. Mm. And I would never adopt the thinking of somebody who is sad. So all you're doing is convincing me even further to ignore every word you say. And you can sit in your room crying your eyes out like a depressed little girl. And I will continue to live a fantastic life. Because I'll tell you something. Most depressed people don't understand. Nobody gives a fuck. We all have our own problems. We all have our own issues. Nobody cares. You think being depressed and you can walk around and tell everyone, I'm depressed, I'm sad, and people are going to care. Nobody cares. They might pretend to care for a few seconds if they're a particularly nice person. But in general, nobody cares about you or your life besides you. And if you're not going to get up and work hard and go and try and get a Ferrari yourself, nobody's getting up every day and going to work every day to try and buy a Ferrari to give it to you. Nobody. So you either get up and do it or you sit there and perpetually fail and stay a loser. And if you want to send me long emails convincing me why it's okay for you to be a loser because you have something called depression, I will ignore you and continue to be fantastic. So you can stay there and fail. I don't care. I don't care. The most you can hope for sending me a long email trying to convince me depression is real is that my brother and I laugh at you. That is the (laughs) best that can happen. Look at this idiot. Look how hard they're trying to convince me that it's okay to be a sad failure. That's the best you can hope for. I'm going to stay fantastically happy and fantastically (laughs) successful irregardless. Depression isn't real. Take me to jail. I don't care. It's not real. I refuse to adopt it. Put me back in the dungeon. I will never be depressed. I will sit there happier than these people on the outside. I refuse absolutely. Classic Andrew Tate rant. Thank you. Feel like this is what the world is missing. Feel like you're doing a little bit more now than you were when Wait, you first got out. When I got out, I do was... you feel like there's a little shift there? Because I feel like you were a lot like when you were with Tucker or Candace, you were a lot more reserved, statesmanlike. But over the last maybe month, you've been kind of reverting back to your older self. Yeah. Do you feel like there's a shift? Is that intentional or? I was told to shut up Mm. and I said, I'll never shut up. Yeah. And they said, well, at least be careful. And I said, well, no, I'm not going to be that careful. Mm. And they said, but every word will be used against you in the court of law. Yeah. And I'm not going to lie to you. There was a little while where I kind of cared. And now I'm just like, take me to jail. Yeah. Just take me to jail, bro. If you want to, if you really want to put me in jail, just do it. Like, Mm. what what am I going to do? Live scared forever. If you really want to lock me up, then just lock me up. I know I've done nothing wrong. I'll be fine. I'll eat the rice. I'll do my push-ups. Just put me in jail. I, 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 I tried my best, and I did Tucker, and I did a few interviews, and mm. I can be statesmanlike. I know yeah. there's time and there's a time and a place, of course. And I'm never gonna I'm never gonna shut up. It's mm. not who I am. But there's a time and a place to be more reserved. But I think now, as everyone realized that this is garbage and it's a matrix attack, and also as time's gone on, and I've realized that 
if every word you get desensitized, mm. once you understand that everything you ever say will be used against you, you care for a while. And then one day you wake up and go, oh, whatever. Girls can't park, whatever. <laughs> Take me to jail. Put me in jail then. Like, what can I do? I, I'm not going to sit here. I, I can't defeat the matrix. Mm. What I can do is inspire people at home to wake up and resist for the benefit of themselves and their families. And perhaps we can damage the matrix, but they're always going to chop off the head of the snake. Even if we win, I'm going to jail. I'm done. Because I, I was too big and too loud and I was too much at the forefront. They'll kill the general at the front, even if the army wins. That's how it is. My future set it is what it is. I believe in God. I refuse to shut up. I've made my decisions. I'm the man I am. I've made my bed and I'm going to lie in it. So it is what it is. Take me to fucking jail. Put me in the jail cell then. I'm not or scared. don't. Yeah, but I'm not, <laughs> not going to live in fear. Yeah. I know I've done no, nothing wrong. I'm not going to sit here and be afraid of any of this. Yeah. Because fear feeds it. Fear is what they want. Their objective. They don't want me in jail. Matt, they don't want me in jail. What they want me to do is come out, shut up, not talk, or talk and cry my eyes out like Jordan did, mm. crying my eyes out on antidepressants because I can't take the stress and the pressure while also writing books about mental rigidity and then sitting there crying, oh, I'm on antidepressants. That's what they wanted me to do. They wanted all the people to believe in me to realize that I was a false prophet. That's what they wanted. And I refuse. So you can martyr me and put me in jail and make me more influential than ever before and I'll do my push-ups, Or you can let me go because I'm innocent. I'm ready for either one or put a bullet in my head. I mean, it's one of those things where even if you're thinking it, like, don't say it out loud. Words matter. Uh, it is what it is at this point. I know I'm innocent. Everyone yeah. at home knows I'm innocent. So what can I do anymore? I just don't. Depression like isn't real. <laughs> Kill me. Don't say that. Kill me. Depression <laughs> isn't real. What, can, what more can I do? You know, it's one of those things where even if you want to say it, I don't know. I feel like words matter in, in life. And even if it's a thought that you're putting out there to prove a point, certain words, if you say it, you're almost like asking for it or you're, you're right. And you're actually, manifesting it. I agree. You're and that's that, the manifestation of words always concern me. You're actually right. Mm. And I agree. And here's the scary thing. Mm. What if part of me wants to go? Oh, bro. What if, what if I'm so crazy mm. and I've been so desperate for an exceptional life my entire existence? And I understand that I would make a bigger dent in the matrix if I go than if I don't go. And if I understand that if I'm going to fly on private jets and drive around in Bugattis and be the most famous man on the planet, there's no light without dark. And the dark is a Romanian dungeon filled with cockroaches. And maybe I understand that when I'm 72, if I manage to live that long, I'll look back on those 10 years I spent in that dungeon and be happy they happened because of the lessons I learned. Maybe part of me wants to go. Maybe I'm crazy. Maybe I'm not afraid at the point where I actually completely am ready for it at a level where I'll be excited by the opportunity. Maybe. When you want to explore all the levels on the map of life, you don't just want all the levels at the top. See, this is the mistake most people make. They sit there in a normal life and they dream of being rich and going on nice vacations and dreaming of all the nice things. They don't dream of all the bad things. They think you can have all the light with none of the dark. That's not how it works. The only reason you appreciate being rich is because you were poor. If you were born rich, you don't appreciate it. The only reason you appreciate being in good health is because you were once sick. When you're sick, you'll do anything to be healthy. If you've never experienced sickness, you don't know what health is. There is no light without dark. Perhaps I'll be a happier person and live a more fulfilled life and enjoy my fantastic benefits that come with wealth if I do go. Perhaps I can have a more positive message and more people will know my name if I do go, Matt. Perhaps I'm ready to martyr myself. Perhaps I am ready to charge at the gunfire. Perhaps I don't care. You are a bad man. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like just the idea of that. And I like, I kind of believe you. Do it. Oh, I'm at the point now where my enemies can do nothing but immortalize me. Mm. Win or lose. Anything they do at this point will just prove their prove your case more. They can immortalize me. Now, I can suffer in one way I'm immortalized, and there's another way I cannot suffer in the way I'm immortalized. Because if I walk, I'm immortalized. Mm. And if I go to jail, I'm immortalized. There, I, there's no way they can win this. I'm not scared of suffering. So that even if they choose the suffering path, depression isn't real. It's fine. On that note, I think that's it. Thank you. Dude, man. this is amazing. Top G is, I, I believe you. And, and, and I and, want, and, and, and that's really what I think my conclusion is, is that I think you're genuine. I think you're honest. Um, although some people may not agree with everything. Again, we don't think anyone should agree with everything anyone says anyway. But I believe that you believe what you're saying and that some of it is just nuance. And but, I respect that. That means a lot to me. But dude, like, 
the intensity and the where it comes from, it's like undeniable. And it's so impressive. And I get why you're so famous. I get why you're so viral. It it's the energy that you bring to a conversation that unless you're here, you don't feel it. You know, it's hard to relay. And you have this ability to relay this personal energy from a room in the corner of Romania to like the world and the masses via screen, which it's really hard to do these days. It, it is. And I hope at least some of it translates. And I guess the final point I want to make about what we just said, I guess, if you lead by example, mm. it's the best way to lead, right? That's what we're lacking in the world today. If our leaders had to lead by example, a lot of the problems would be fixed. If they had to go to war themselves, we wouldn't be at war. If they had to pay for their own groceries and they weren't scamming the government and creating endless money with this inflation stock market garbage cycle money laundering scheme, things would change. And I feel like if I can suffer the way I'm suffering, all I have to do is inspire people at home to suffer 5% of what I go through. And then a lot of problems will be fixed. We didn't even talk about war. I feel like we've been, how long have we been going? There's always part two, friend. I think we got in the end of part two. Thank you, everybody. Andrew Tate, Cobra Tate. What do you like the best? Can I ask you that last? Sure. What's your favorite thing to be called of everything? Because you've had a, a evolution of kind of nicknames, catch phrases, et cetera. What's your favorite one? That's a good question. Yeah, I'm, I'm not entirely sure. I've never thought about that. I'm going to have to think about it. I guess it depends who's calling me what at what time. Mm. There's times I like to be called, you know, bad names. It's funny. Yeah. You know, when the feminist gets angry and starts screaming misogynist, <laughs> I'm not going to lie. I feel pretty happy. Uh -huh. It's empowering. Of course. Andrew Tate, thank you. Appreciate you, my friend. Thanks, bro. And uh, we'll see you guys next time. Thank you, everybody. Thank you guys for watching this conversation. If you want to learn more, if you want to be a part of our free thinker army, definitely go check out Discord. It's free. It's involved. Get to meet and connect with some like-minded individuals. I'll see you in there. Till next time.